It's 8 o'clock on today. Coming up, high stakes showdown. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken sitting down with the Chinese president in a surprise meeting overnight. Will it help ease soaring tensions between the two nations? We're live with the latest. Then, on alert, millions of Americans at risk this morning for another round of severe weather, hailstorms, severe flooding, and extreme heat on the horizon. Dylan's got your full forecast. Plus, honoring Juneteenth, our exclusive first look at the new International African American Museum, decades in the making. The Living History Museum, this is a living, vibrant, breathing uh, culture, this culture that represents the African diaspora. Right? Shining a spotlight on stories we've never heard before, including my own families. And Dad's got this. We're taking a look at how some of our favorite fathers spent the big day, from pop stars to NFL icons to us. You don't want to miss the special celebrations today, Monday, June 19th, 2023. Sending love to friends and family. Back in Arlington, Virginia. From, From the Quad Cities, Iowa, I'm turning 60. Celebrating our high school graduations from St. Louis and Lantana, Florida. Hello, Bridgeport, Texas. Girl Prince Trip from San Diego and Seattle to New York City. We watch today every day from Darien, Connecticut. How do our grandparents? Watching in Kearney, Nebraska. Love you, Grandma, Grandpa. The Oak Park, Illinois. It's Hannah's 10th birthday. Here from Newburyport, Massachusetts. On our special day, marry 30 years ago today. Welcome back. Today is Juneteenth, the national holiday to commemorate the end of slavery in the United States. That's right. And in just a few days, the new International African American Museum will open its doors in Charleston, South Carolina. And Craig, you got an exclusive first look. This is really incredible. Yeah. More than 7 million people, by the way, Kristen, uh, visit Charleston every year. And this new museum explores the historic city's painful past. But it also celebrates the contributions of the African American community, not just in Charleston but the nation as a whole. It is also going to help visitors like myself learn how to uncover their family histories. The new International African American Museum sits along a beautiful section of Charleston Seaport, ground that is also tied to some of the most tragic events in American history. Where are we? So we are at the former site of Gadsden's Wharf. Somewhere between 40 and 46, 47% of all Africans who were brought into what is now America would have come through the Gadsden's Wharf complex. Dr. Tanya Matthews is the museum's president and CEO. Why was it so important to have this museum here? It's incredible for a museum to have what we call power of place, to actually be rooted in the space that is, is the source of a lot of our stories. Those stories are on display here in this new $100 million museum. The single story structure hovers on 13 pillars. The grounds are full of history. An artist's interpretation of the Brooks diagram portrays brutal conditions aboard 18th century slave ships. But where we're standing, a couple hundred years ago. This is where they would be taken off uh, the ships. Inside the State of the Art Museum, you can see how the journey continued with the port of departure, featuring the names that individuals had when they left Africa. Across the gallery, the port of arrival shows the names they were given on American soil. One name was striking. Hard times. Hard times. The hard times of slavery are documented in this museum. But so are the fight for freedom, from Reconstruction to the Great Migration and the Civil Rights Movement. Contributions in the arts, sciences, and every other field of American life. This is a living, vibrant, breathing uh, culture. A powerful component of this new museum will be the Center for Family History. The center will offer a team of genealogists to help visitors of any background learn how to uncover their family histories. Dr. Shelley Murphy heads up the center. What's the hardest part of sort of finding out where you're from and who your people are and how you got here? Well, if we're talking specifically African-American, there's a lot of challenges. Number one challenge is, could be a first name only. 
Number two, the records we might not have access to them because they could be with the plantation owner's family. Dr. Murphy says it can be difficult to find the branches of a family tree that date back to the slave era, but not impossible. She helped me using census records and documents from a slave-owning family. John H. Livingston is white, okay? And this will is dated November the 7th, 1849. Okay. So a lot of times if it's a slave owner, he's going to hand out or divvy out the enslaved people. Mm. What's interesting with John H. Livingston is that he handed out family groupings to his children. So families of enslaved people. That is your line and who owned them and in his will where he's divvying them up. So my great, great, great. It's three. Were, were, were enslaved. Yes. And this wasn't that long ago. I mean, no. in terms of. No. But, but this was the man who would have owned my great, 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 Absolutely. great. Absolutely. Thank yeah. you for this. This is Thank great. Yeah. These are details I always hope to learn. The story of my family and that of more than 40 million people like me has a home here. And many of those American stories started here in Charleston and they're still being written. When folks come and experience this museum, what do you hope that they, they take away from it? African Americans simultaneously hold trauma and joy. Not trauma on Tuesday and joy on Thursday. It is woven in there together. And so I'm hoping that folks get that. Yeah, there's, there's real sadness here, but there's also real triumph. It, it really is a complete museum in, in that regard. It's not just a look at the history of slavery in this country. Craig, what was that moment like when you saw the name of the family that uh, owned your ancestors? There, you know, I, it, it was, uh, yes, it was, it was moving to say the least. Yeah. And, you know, we had suspected in, 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 through oral history in my family, we had suspected that we came in around Charleston, mm -hmm. um, but to actually, you know, see the name, yeah. Uh, it's, it stays with you. Yeah. What's interesting is that genealogists there and my mother, they've become besties. Wow. Because mom, that sounds about right. Mom really wants to find out a little bit more That's about great. our uh, family history. I but uh, it really is just an impressive Incredible museum. Piece. It, um, Incredible piece. Incredible. Thank you. It, yeah. it uh, took 20 years to bring that museum mm. to life. 20 years. And that genealogy component, is it really is huge. Dr. Makes Murphy. personal for she, um, And by the way, they track down not just black people, white people, Asian. Yeah. They, if, they, if, if you have some history, yeah. they can track you Dr. down. Dr. Murphy is Dr. amazing. Murphy is, yeah. She's yeah. the point woman there. Um, she also managed to track down an entire branch of my family from mm. North Carolina. Really? She also found that 19 of my ancestors served in World Wars One or Two, mm. oh, and uh, yeah, so we were proud of. We were really lot. proud of that. Yeah. Uh, the dedication celebration, by the way, it's going to take place on Saturday. Doors opening to the public there in Charleston on Tuesday, June 27th. Oh, great story. Thanks for sharing great that. Great story, Thank you. Craig. Thanks Thank so you much. Both. Really powerful. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, it worth coming in this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you 
feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Anal stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. And this has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on Today. a very fired up Monday here out on the plaza with a story of a young couple who set out to rebuild Detroit in their own special way. And so, Bo, you caught up with them. Yeah. I love these guys. I am so impressed with these two entrepreneurs. They met a decade ago and they've discovered a really amazing ways to repurpose materials that other people literally throw in the trash. On any given day, you can hear the buzz of woodwork. So this is the wood shop where all the magic happens. Art created from salvaged material found in wrecked Detroit buildings at this 24,000 square foot warehouse, once an old car dealership. So in here is the place to paint all the cars. Now a showroom and wood shop owned by Bo Shepard and her partner in life and business, Kyle Dubay. These are our Ella tables. It's made out of salvaged barn flooring. Um, from like local Metro Detroit barns that are fallen. Well, this is like the first coat. The like, two are excited about their next big project nearby, which they call the Chateau Beaufay. Beaufay from the name of the street it sits on. This is the future home sweet home, huh? That's it. Yeah, yeah. this is the dream home. <laughs> Chateau for what they see beyond the boarded up windows and falling bricks. Structurally, a little compromise, um, but if you look past that, it's beautiful. Bo Shepard and Kyle Dubay are the owners of Woodward Throwbacks, a passion turned business built on salvaged materials from the streets of Detroit. The two met each other 10 years ago at an abandoned park cleanup, both on bikes. Where did the passion for restoration come from? That kind of is something that happened organically for myself and I think Bo as well. Me and Kyle love biking and exploring the city. And back then we noticed that there was just so much discarded material, construction debris, um, just vintage antiques. And so we we're like, hey, like we should build something for ourselves using the materials. When they started, the Motor City was going through hard times. After declaring bankruptcy in 2013, over 80,000 homes were abandoned what other people might call trash, you look at it and think what? Possibilities. Possibilities. <laughs> yeah, or it's like, yeah, something that we can completely transform. Kyle's an artist who took woodshop in school. Bo, a designer, who went to school in Detroit for car interior design and worked with her father, a building contractor. They started out selling pieces they made at fairs, then the big box stores came knocking at their door. When did this go from a passion to a business? Um, probably like within like the year of starting. What we were doing a lot then is little home decor, like wall signs and bottle openers. And we started going to the local farmer's market and we did really well and kept just kind of like, hey, like there might be something here. There's plenty of resources mm -hmm. for materials. There was a lot of texture and honest wear in what we were making. Um, and we've always told the Detroit story. They showed me some of their reclaimed finds. Even this is reclaimed? Yeah. So this is salvage chalkboard that we got out of a DPS high school. This came from a Detroit public school. Yeah. Yes. So this literally would have been in a, in a landfill yes. had you guys not grabbed it. Yeah. yeah. With bigger goals in mind, they bought this Detroit house for $6,500. Yep, $6,500. It was an eyesore in the neighborhood, and yeah. we're just like, well, we never fully deconstructed an entire house, like saving all the materials. After rehabbing it themselves, they sold it for $410,000. It really is a transformation, huh? Yeah, it's kind of hard to remember what it looked like when we bought it. Yes, the when transformation is... It's pretty great. But in a city where gentrification and flipping can be dirty words. What you do is anything but flipping. And we're doing like the complete opposite. It <laughs> took us like three years and we spent like three times our budget on it. It's like, we're buying this house, so one save it, restore it. And we also wanted to show people like, this is how you can renovate a house in the city and still give it so much character, so much soul. All right, so check this out. Bo and Kyle just recently closed on another dilapidated Detroit property, and they're again planning to renovate it using recycled materials. They're coming out with a book. You knew this was coming <laughs> next year that features a collection of their sustainable designs, and it's going to show people how to turn salvaged or reclaimed material into home decor and furniture. Wow. I, I, mean, I feel like we all have that stuff. Yes. That we yes. want to repurpose. It's going to inspire a lot of people. I'm going to turn this into something, and instead right. it just sits there and takes up 
space. Now you will. Call now you're guys. inspired. Yeah. 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 Maybe. Sure. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, All guys. right, great stuff. Well, coming up next, from baseball to bowling, camping to community pools, Vicky is sharing new ways to save wherever you're headed this summer. But first, this is today on NBC. series today's summer savings yeah it seems like everything is more expensive these days but enjoying the season doesn't have to be stressful or expensive vicky Wynn is here she's going to help us have fun without breaking the bank yes so i'm super so pumped so let's, let's start it. with camping and yeah. you know a lot of folks want to get outside this time of year enjoy mother nature the thing about camping is it can get pretty expensive pretty quickly totally exploring the great outdoor outdoors is the best way to have fun with your family and get out across this beautiful land of ours but you don't want to spend a fortune on tents and gear right. so either buy it secondhand from facebook marketplace or craigslist borrow from neighbors. They are happy to lend this stuff to you. And stores like REI also sell this stuff secondhand, or you can rent it. I love this tip about visiting state parks. Mm. If you can't get into the national parks, they're going to be crowded this year. Your state parks, for example, oh. here in New York, for 80 bucks, $72 actually, you can get the Empire Pass, and you get admission to all the state parks for uh -huh. the whole season. Make sure when you get there, you're renting the paddleboard, the canoes, the kayaks, because yeah. it's much cheaper than investing in them. Uh -huh. Where are you going to store that stuff anyway? Right. And then finally, freecampsites.net is a great website. It's based on maps, and it'll tell you what are free campsites in your area for not just camping with a tent, but also for your RVs and campers. Fantastic. Great now, tips. obviously, we're headed for some hot days, yes. so if you want to cool off, how can you do that in a way that doesn't break Maximize your beach weekend, Kristen. So that means getting there early on okay. the Saturday. If you can't get early check-in at the hotel, that's okay. Just give them your bags, take out your tote with your bathing suit and your sunscreen, your umbrella, and spend a full day at the beach. You go back, you sleep there. Next day, check out early. Again, you can leave your bags at the hotel. You don't have to bring your luggage to the beach. Yeah. Spend that whole day there, then get your stuff and leave. State parks with lake beaches mm. as well. Look, maybe you're not going to get out to the ocean, but there are a lot of big lakes that still have sandy shores and still give you that sort of wave-like experience as well. And then think about your community and city pools. Those public pools are free to the public. 
public, and there are many of them, and they're open all summer long. The rec center, this is something you can buy a season pass for for your whole family. You get the amenities too, like the gym, the ping pong room, yeah, all of all the other things that your kids like. And then finally, let's say you're traveling in June and July and you want to just hang out in August. You can usually get a discounted pass to enjoy the rec center at the huh. end of the summer, too. OK, right? yeah. so Vic, you've got, you know, several kids. I've got a few kids. <laughs> you start traveling with all your kids. It gets oh pretty expensive God. pretty fast. I did not know this, but Major League Baseball, Craig, a great place. It is America's pastime for a reason, right? The Chicago White Sox. Yeah. For $19 a ticket, this is the upper deck, sure. but you, that includes a hot dog, chips, and a drink. You would just go there just for lunch and That's you don't true. even have That's to watch great. the game. That's, That's yeah. such a great deal, yeah. right? The Pittsburgh Pirates have a deal, two tickets for $44, $12 you can use towards concession. So that's fantastic. Fruit picking. It's cheaper than buying your fruit at the farmer's market. You're getting your kids so tired. There's it's, nothing more fun right? than fruit picking. Yeah, it's not just great. apples in the fall. You've got yeah. strawberries, blueberries, raspberries. Those are all in season right now. Get home, you make that cobbler. That's right. And the kids are more likely to eat something that they put their hard work into. I love this tip about aquatic gardens. These are part of the National Park System. And if you're in the military, free pass. If you are a senior, discounted pass. If you're a regular person, 80 bucks. But if you are a fourth grader, if you have a fourth grader in your family, yeah. they get that free as well. Because wow. I think they're studying national parks in fourth grade or something. Oh, wow. But it's incredible. And you get to go in, don't have to pay the parking fee, and up to three other people get to go in with you for free. Off-season trips. In New York City, you know it empties out in August. This is a good time yeah. to visit the city. So look at the cities you want to go to and consider visiting in the off-season. And then finally, there's these two websites. A lot of people have heard of Groupon. Heard of Groupon. Right, of What's course. The famous story about Groupon. You know Tiffany Haddish took Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith on a swamp tour that she bought off of a Groupon. Oh, that's and they right. went with her and that. didn't realize they were going to just be on a little bus. I feel like, like that's the whole a rest separate of the story in and of itself. So you know about Groupon. <laughs> Groupon. Certificate is another similar site. You can search by activity or geography and get lots of discounts. And finally, for those rainy days, Vicki, what yes, can we do? Yes, we've got to hit these. Okay, so the first thing that you want to do on a rainy day, museums and uh, your monuments, obviously there are free museum days, free yeah. days to visit monuments as well. Movie theater deals, Tuesdays. Yeah. Regal and AMC always give you Lots discounts good on the tickets there. and the popcorn. Yeah. This one, factorytoursusa.com. Check it out. There's a Jelly Belly factory out in California. Oh, Turkey Hill ooh. ice cream. I think that one's in Pennsylvania. Lots of factories around. It's so fun to see how things are made. Yeah. Really wholesome activity for the whole family. And then kidsbowlfree.com. You get the bowling games for free. You have to rent the shoes. But still, that's a so, fun indoor yeah, activity. For sure. We love bowling. Yeah. yeah. So fun. Love bowling. Great Vicky, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Great tips. Vicky. Save folks always. a lot of money. Uh, we're going to visit some businesses serving up amazing food and a side of history as well with one of the founders of Black Restaurant Week. Blaine Alexander drew that tasty assignment. We'll have that for you right after this. But first, this is Today on NBC.
love showing our plaza pics here in the morning. Here's Lottie and her parents visiting from St. Louis. They're celebrating Lottie's 10th birthday. Aww. Terry and Jan are uh, here on a sister's trip from Chapmanville, West Virginia. How about Grace? She stopped by with her mom and her grandma as well. They're from Brookfield, Wisconsin. They got the perfect poster to begin the weekend. Grateful, the week I should say, grateful and happy today. Yeah, the weather was so great. It's oh a great gosh, day to be out weather. on the plaza. They all got lucky. <laughs> uh, now to a, a special today food as the nation marks Juneteenth. And you really can't celebrate the day without shining a light on the food and culture that surrounds it. NBC's Blaine Alexander joins us from Atlanta with this incredible story. Blaine, good morning. Tell us about it. Well, guys, good morning to you. This was certainly a lot of fun. You know, Juneteenth celebrations can certainly take on many different forms, but food is often right at the heart. And it's not just so people can brag about who has the best mac and cheese recipe, but there's a deep meaning behind the cuisine with a history that's as rich as the holiday itself. At Nouveau Bar and Grill in Jonesboro, Georgia, there's something special in the air. Fried asparagus. You've never had nothing like it before. And if the smell doesn't entice you, oh this is insane. just take one bite. Mm. Well, I feel the love in you this. The love. I feel the love in this. At 42, founder and owner Ebony Austin is relatively new to the restaurant business, but her food is generations in the making. So when people come into your restaurant and try your food, they're tasting your mom's recipes, your grandma's recipes. Oh, absolutely. Oh my God, my great recipe comes from my grandmother. The way I fry chicken, it comes from my mother. We would be in there doing chicken on Sundays after church. It's that special blend of taste and tradition that makes soul food a staple in American cuisine. Almost any American food that you taste, depending on how it's prepared, it's got a little bit of soul in it, it right? It does, it does. And so some of these uh, uh, cooking experiences and some of the different dishes, they go back to some of the slave times. When you look at some of the first well-known notable chefs in this country, they were black chefs. Yet black chefs often face a steeper climb in the restaurant industry. That's why Warren Lockett helped found Black Restaurant Week, a way to showcase black cuisine and its rich history. When you look at someone like Hercules, who was George Washington's chef. He was one of the first traditional chefs in this country. When you look at something like barbecue, it's a combination of African cooking techniques, indigenous cooking techniques, as well as European cooking techniques. In the late 1700s, slaves were some of the best pit cooks in the South. There are so many foods that are delicacies today but they came about because slaves really had no other options. We had no other options, and that's really where soul food came from. It came from taking the scraps, whatever was given, and making something out of it. Something like oxtails that is so expensive now used to be, be known as a scrap, but it has become just a world favorite. It's why when we celebrate that unflinching spirit on Juneteenth, food is often right at the center. Traditionally, foods that are red in color have always signified Juneteenth. The red has always represented the joy and the resilience of uh, the people, of the slaves' freedom. So watermelons, strawberries, fruit punch. It's so stunning that you say watermelon because so often that has a negative connotation when you think about minstrel shows and how black people are portrayed. Yeah, when you understand watermelon has a history of over 5,000 years, that it comes from Africa, Africa. Watermelon seeds were often brought over in the hair of slaves. And that's why here at Nouveau, now let's get to these greens. Ebony is taking her carefully curated Juneteenth spread out into the community. Free meals with some extra meaning on the side. So when people come into your restaurant and they take a bite of your food, what do you want them to taste? the love that's put into it. That behind the people that's inside of those kitchens that are working super hard is that every dish is made with love. It comes from the heart. And there was certainly a lot of love in that food. I tasted it in every single bite. And mind you, I took a lot of bites. So if you're interested, Black Restaurant Week kicks off today in the New York area. It's lasting until July 2nd, but it's expanded to more than 15 cities around the country. You can go online to find out when it hits your city. But guys, the bottom line today on Juneteenth, go out, celebrate, yeah. and eat well. Yes. I love it, Blaine. The main ingredient is love. Yeah, <laughs> love. You made us all hungry, by the way, and <laughs> no filled up with it. a lot of history. So that's the most important thing. Great stuff, Blaine. I wish we had some Nouveau right here. Thanks, yeah, Blaine. exactly. Thank you, thank all you. those dishes looked good. Uh, thank you so much for starting your day off with us. We're going to be back with the third and fourth hours of today. But first, check your local news, some weather, and these messages.
Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. This morning on the third hour of today, celebrating Juneteenth, the Texas park that's become a symbol of freedom thanks to one man whose legacy has carried on for generations. Plus, a life-changing lesson in our series, The Upside. So you just woke up one morning and you're like, you know what? The guy was like, you need to be a teacher. One man's mission, empowering teachers and bringing diversity to the front of the class. Then meet a trailblazer who's helping artists by putting her own spin on the music industry. And it's She Made It, the fashion brand where less is more. I realized that there was a better way to sell to customers. How they went from seeking investors on Pinterest to building a major celebrity following. Today, Monday, June 19th, 2023. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third hour of today. I'm Al, along with Craig and Chanel. Dylan is off. We thank you for joining us this Monday morning. Mm -hmm. Happens to be June 10th. Yeah. Yeah. Right. We are observing it today, which dates back to more than 150 years ago in our country's history. President Lincoln, of course, signing the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863. But a lot of African Americans remained enslaved in Confederate States years after. You know, I will say, I was talking, we were talking to our kids about it, and these days, if something happens, you know, in one state, you can hear about it immediately, oh, right? Your cell yeah, phones and technology, and I was explaining to them, it took a while back then for word to get there. That's right. And so on June 19th in 1865, enslaved Americans in Galveston, Texas, were informed of their freedom. And Juneteenth has been celebrated since then, officially becoming a federal holiday two years ago under mm -hmm. President Biden, who said that the day should also be one of reflection and action when it comes to race and equity in the co in the country. Yes. So there so, you go. So happy Juneteenth. Uh, we hope that you were. I'm actually off. Yes. You, you are As is Chanel. Off. She's not here either. I am here. So, well, sort of. I'm, kind of. Yeah. It's a long story. <laughs> the, mu the, the beauty and magic of television. <laughs> yeah, um, while, we, while we have you here, held captive on this Monday morning, this guy. Yeah. Guess what? What? Another honor. Yet another? How many honors? The June, There's nothing July left. issue of guideposts. He was the oh, he that. was named the publication's positive thinker. And you covered a bunch of topics in the article. Actually, I actually thumbed through it. I saw it in my notes, <laughs> uh, including a surprising detail about. And I, I know this about you. I don't think a lot of folks realize this. You're extremely shy. I am. I don't. I. I, I don't. I'm not that gregarious. He's I, not. When I, I when I get, I'm off. I go home. I kind of chill out. I, I'm. So when I'm, people meet you too, I feel like they expect to see you. <laughs> Exactly. Right. It's you know. And the reality is, I'm a little more low key. He's actually, he cleaned it up for guideposts. The reality yeah. is, he doesn't really like people. No, I like. <laughs> he doesn't like really people. like strangers. I just don't like you. <laughs> but you also you also talk about you know what you're grateful for. He writes right? it down every day. I do. I, I journal. You know the funny thing about this is this just steams Deborah because she goes, how is it that you're in guideposts? You know, I go to she goes, I go to church. I do all this stuff. You're in guideposts. That's so. Yeah. Funny. There are no guideposts. You know, tell her when she glows, you shine. There you go. Uh, and then also, <laughs> I got that from a raisin box. Oh. And you also talked about Willard Scott. <laughs> oh, well, the best. <laughs> The best advice? A raisin box you're taking you in know, raisin sun -made, box. Sun-made raisins when you open up the box? Oh, yeah. I never I had done that. Anyway, Willard, the best bit of advice Willard gave me was always Aww. be yourself. Uh, because nobody can take that away from you. You also yeah. said never give up your day job. So if, like the Today Show is my day job. And they're going to drag me out of here. I love that. We want what's, you to say what's your the best program. advice you ever got? Ask for what you want, take what you get, use what you get to get what you want. Ooh, ooh. Well, that's good. Where did that come you? from? I was a raisin uh, box. <laughs> <laughs> wherever I get, I see a quote. I'll, you know. If it's the best good. advice I'd ever gotten yeah. was yeah. from a, a, a local news anchor in Columbus, South Carolina, Steve Crocker. I, okay. I ended up taking his place down there. He always said to me, "You'll always be to something." 
Mm. and make peace with that. Mm. You'll be too young, you'll be too old, you'll huh. be too black, you'll be too white, you'll be too gay, you'll, do, well, you'll be too, too something. Too, you'll always be too something. Make peace with that. Make peace with that's it. it. Well, that's it for our show today. <laughs> <laughs> no, just kidding. Let the church say amen. Uh, exactly. Uh, okay, so this is an, an interesting article. Okay. This was in the New York Times. They had an article about friendships mm -hmm. between siblings. Uh. So here's the deal. The article notes that more than 80% of Americans grow up with at least one sibling. Right. And here's what we all know, that those relationships at their best uh, can offer benefits like boosting well-being oh, and what have you. Um, and here's the thing. A lot of people have challenges with their siblings, or maybe they didn't get along. True. But they're, they're talking about this article because therapists told the New York Times that it is possible, if you're listening this morning and you've had a challenge, you can bolster an adult sibling connection. Okay. So here are some ways that can help. First of all, you have to give each other permission to change. Sure. For example, an older sibling might continue to see their younger sibling as a baby, sure. yes. and the younger sibling is tired of having that role. Mm -hmm. You have to allow them to see, first have that conversation, but right. recognize that. Another one, you have to make time to enjoy each other's company. Yes. Yes. You can't just rely on the old memories yep. from back mm -hmm. in the day. Right. You have Pretty to have close. some new memories. Um, and I also think it's important because for example, I come from a blended family, so yes, I didn't grow up with all of my siblings. I would come, I would go to Philly from Wichita every summer, oh. and I would visit my Philly siblings. These oh. are my Philly siblings. So okay. every summer, nice you know, obviously I was there, um, but the twins were little. My sister Keisha was older, and so we have developed our relationship. It's getting stronger mm -hmm. as we get older. I grew up with my little brother. Yeah. I say my little brother. This is my brother in Kansas. So I have a blended family, and yep. so as adults, we try to have sibling weekends, mm -hmm. or we try to get together cool. because as a parent, you want your kids to, to see that, sure. right? And to sure. have each other. For me. Yeah, no, that makes You've sense. got a good relationship with all your siblings. You know, you know listen, I think part of it is uh, I was the oldest, yeah. so I think it was a little difficult because I was away at college as they're growing up. Mm -hmm. So I think we've gotten actually closer. We unfortunately lost one of my siblings, uh, Patricia, there in the blue. But uh, uh, I think as we've gotten older, we've actually gotten closer. Yes. I think, you know, you have that to your I point. Agree. You know, there's that kid thing. And then yep. when you become adults and you see your sibling as a full grown adult, it makes it a little easier. I and mean, I know you're close. Oh, you? yeah. My younger brother's my best friend. But as, as we get older, um, what really, and there's my late brother there yeah. in, in the middle, and we had a wonderful relationship as well. Um, but my younger brother and I, we find now, that's us at the ESPYs from a few years ago, um, we spend a fair amount of our time talking about our parents mm -hmm. and how crazy they are. Yeah. <laughs> and, it's a cotton bonding oh, yeah. connection. And, and, like, he'll call me, he'll be like, can you believe what mom said? And I'll, I'll call him like, see, you talked to Pops yesterday? You need to go over and see him. He's clearly out of his mind. Yeah, well, it's interesting because, like, my parents were different parents than my my brother baby brother Chris's parents because by the time they got oh. to Chris they were letting him do everything of course <laughs> and so the rest of us would get together who are these people right like, why right. let him go that? out he's driving the car I love that. Yeah. anyway I love that's what that. binds you as you get older you know one of the things you how you stay in touch with your siblings could be a group tech we have a oh. do you have a thread oh it is not suitable for work <laughs> okay oh, we have a thread but yes well. we have a thread well <laughs> if you are on a group text thread uh, Reader's Digest has some etiquette rules oh. for uh, that kind of communication for example mm -hmm. do not start a conversation at night, oh yes. Uh, late afternoon or evening, yes, is better. Also, you don't only want to talk to one person in the text, which yeah. to me that is that's just, true. Like, Common sense is, is rude. To text and, them directly. That's right, and let everybody get a chance to talk, and they've all contributed uh, before moving on to another topic. To another topic. I sometimes will pick up my phone, and they're on twelve conversations later because I can't keep. You up. Can't, it's hard to keep up. It's I'm the same way. Mm -hmm. but I think it's partly it's partly because the hours we keep. Yeah. Right. We're in bed a little earlier than uh, than a lot of folks, um, but sometimes I'll get on the thread and I'll weigh in on something, and they'll be like, Craig, we we've moved on. We've, yeah, I was we've Oh, so two days ago. They also say don't uh, be the person who stays silent uh, 90% of the time. That's me. Yeah. Are you on a group thread with, with your siblings? Sometimes. You know, my, my sister, uh, Elisa, likes to send, uh, in, the, in the middle of the night, uh, scripture readings. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, which is great. I think it's very positive. Middle of the night. Yeah, they'll come up, because she's a nurse. She works weird shifts. Yeah. And so you'll get this thing. And it's like, okay. Well, you know, I just was up reading the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's like 3.30 well, a.m. You know, like, what, what do you say? Because I have a, a friend, a family friend that sends the scriptures. And I told Uchi, I'm like, at least heart it. Right. Like, acknowledge that it was sent. Do you no. heart hers? No. Oh. No, I say thanks. 
Oh, but like you, you were should engage a little bit more. Well, uh, I don't know. You should respond with a scripture of your own. Exactly. Well, that's, that's a problem. <laughs> Ask Deborah. Deborah will give you one. There you go. All right. <laughs> Coming up, it is Juneteenth. Well, guess what? We want to introduce you to the Texas Park, where Juneteenth celebrations have taken place for 140 years, thanks to one formerly enslaved man whose legacy carries on today. Then later, the life-changing program that's empowering black men to enter the classroom. Third hour of today, we'll be right back. are back on this Juneteenth in collaboration with Voices of the Civil Rights Movement, a platform from our parent company Comcast, NBC Universal. We're sharing the story of a man named Jack Yates. He was a formerly enslaved man who transformed his Houston community and the way that Juneteenth is actually celebrated. And on this holiday, his great granddaughter is sharing his lasting impact that started with a plot of land. He wanted this track of land because he thought it was large enough that people could come and enjoy themselves. They could come, they could do educational projects, different things together as a people, and it was theirs. Emancipation Park in Houston, Texas, holds a special meaning for Jacqueline Whiting Bostick. It was actually the first park in Houston, period. And it was the first park in Texas at that time, period. Her great-grandfather, Jack Yates, then a community leader and minister, bought the 10-acre lot with other freed slaves in 1872, nearly a decade after slavery was abolished in the United States. They wanted a place to call their own and to celebrate Emancipation Day, or Juneteenth. From the time that they purchased the park, in uh, 1872. Every year, that was a Juneteenth celebration in the park. Yates was born into slavery in Virginia in 1828. The slave owner's wife was also having a child, and the child was born, but the mother died. So the uh, slave owner brought uh, Jack Yates's mother and him into the house to take care of his child. He and the uh, slave owner's son played together. And in playing together and being boys out in the, away from the house and doing things together, whatever he learned in school that day, he taught to Jack. Unlike other slaves at the time, he had access to education, a skill that helped secure his freedom. He was freed as a slave when the Emancipation Proclamation came about. But his wife and their children were on a different plantation in Virginia. And that slave owner was determined not to stop having slaves. His family was moved to Texas and Yates followed. He wanted to continue to take care of his family and be with his family. So in order to do that, he had to go back into slavery. Enslaved people in Texas weren't freed until June 19, 1865, two years after slavery was abolished. My great-grandfather, Reverend Jack Yates, brought his family from Matagora County, which is not far from the Houston area, into the Houston area where they began living as a family. 
Jacqueline remembers her great grandfather as a visionary that created a community in Houston with a lasting impact. In helping people to buy land, build homes, uh, to start a community, to have different kinds of businesses, that was quite a feat for someone that had been enslaved and then coming out of slavery, being able to lead a community. Today, Juneteenth celebrations continue in Emancipation Park and across the country. And in 2021, June 19th became a federal holiday. To me, the recognition of Juneteenth as a holiday was long overdue because many Americans did not understand what Juneteenth was all about. Emancipation Park still stands as a symbol of freedom today and continues to host a Juneteenth celebration every year. And if you would like to hear more stories like this one, you can visit Voices of the Civil Rights Movement. Dot com. There are a lot of stories that we're still learning about today yes, that perhaps weren't taught. Absolutely. Um, so it's a, a very good site. And, and thankful, so thankful for that oral history. Mm -hmm. yes. The fact that she knew, she had all of exactly. that information and was able. Valuable. Uh, coming up in our series, The Upside, we are going to celebrate teachers and share one man's important mission to get more diversity into the classroom. And then a little bit later, a trendsetter trying to help musicians achieve their dreams, how she's pressing the issue by going back to vinyl. Third hour of today, right back after this. We're taking our series, The Upside, to the Big Easy. Last month, we shined the light on a program in New Orleans that's trying to bring more diversity and perspective to the classroom by empowering a new generation of educators. To stand at the head of the class. To shape young minds. Which ways African Americans use World War II crisis in order to protest against racial discrimination in America. Teaching more than a career, it's a calling, especially for Jerome Perkins. So you just woke up one morning and you're like, you know what? Guy was like, you need to be a teacher. He called you to it. Yes, sir. Jerome teaches African American history at Sophie B. Wright High School in New Orleans. When you finally got into the classroom, do you remember what those what those few days and those first few weeks were like? I was scared. <laughs> Just like anything, it's new to me, so I didn't really know what they expect. And I, I just didn't want to be bad at it. I just didn't want to be a bad teacher. Jerome and dozens of educators like him got their start with the help of a fellowship called Brothers Empowered to Teach. The goal is to get more black teachers, specifically male black teachers, in the classroom. The most recent survey shows that black males only account for 1.3% of all public school teachers. Larry Irvin is trying to change that. He co-founded Brothers Empower to Teach in 2014. It's a community-based education program for undergraduate college students. Fellows get funding and support. More importantly, they get real classroom experience. Larry's late mother was a teacher. He spent a lot of time in school with her growing up. But as a young man, Larry says his life went down a troubled path with two arrests leading to charges of drug possession and evading police. 
Larry pled guilty both times and received probation. He turned things around, and after getting the blessing of the school superintendent, he started coaching at his old high school. It just took off. That was a spark. Um, my connection with the, with, with, the, with the young guys, the head coach was like, Larry, have you ever thought about education? Like, Because you would be an incredible uh, teacher. Then he started teaching, but he also began studying. He wanted to understand why there are so few black men who become teachers. Why is it so important to have men that look like me and you in the front of a classroom? Kids are what they see. I don't have to go far to see somebody uh, that looks like me playing football. I have to go far to see a rapper. I can go right out my door and see a drug dealer. Education, being a teacher, leading from the classroom and from an intellectual standpoint, that's a different conversation. Since launching, the program has placed 174 fellows. Right now, they're in New Orleans and Baton Rouge with hopes for expansion. Part of the program is nurturing a network. Larry hosts a series of conversations among the fellows called The Cypher. We think, we think from it from a collective black male standpoint, how we're viewed as a group. It's a chance for these young educators to exchange ideas, support one another, and grow. It's working for new teachers like Jerome. It's what you perceive and what you see every day. If I see this every day, that's what I'm stuck to. And for Larry, becoming the change you want to see is a lesson he was taught long ago by his first teacher, his mom. What, what do you think your mother would say about all of this? You got me with that one. She would be quite proud, I would imagine. She was my biggest cheerleader, you know, so. It was like he did it, he turned it around. To say the least. You did. To say the least. And Larry says that about 75% of fellows stay in teaching <laughs> three years or more after they graduate. So important. Yeah. Very Kids important. to see people like this. Yes. Absolutely. If you can see it, you can be it. That's right. it. Just ahead, what's old is new again. Meet the woman who is trying to shake up the future of the music business by turning back the clock to the vinyl days. We're going to meet a teacher in her second act as a bona fide track star as well, giving a whole new meaning to the golden years. We'll be right back. with a music trailblazer who is helping artists achieve their dreams. Dylan recently found out how she's shaking up the future of the business by throwing it back to the days of vinyl. Vinyl records is so special because to make the choice to own a record, to spend money on it, to pass it down from generation to generation signals that you have some kind of emotional connection with it in a way that you don't with streaming. Karen Kelleher has always had an ear for music. My mom loved Broadway musicals. My dad would take me on long car rides and play his favorite classic rock albums. And my sister's a trained opera singer. Karen also brought a fresh eye to the music industry. After an internship at Paste Magazine, Karen got her MBA at Harvard Business School and was eventually recruited to launch Google Music, now known as Google Play. I was giving a big corporate presentation about the state of the music industry 
and I shared that for the average American band to make minimum wage each month, they can either sell 100 vinyl records, have over a quarter million digital streams, or 2.2 million video views. And I know a lot of artists that can sell 100 vinyl records to fans at shows, but very few that can achieve 2.2 million YouTube views on a monthly basis. And that's when I thought, wow, vinyl really is a critical part of this new music economy. The thought struck a chord with Karen, so she quit her job to figure it out. The dream I kept coming back to was this vinyl record pressing plant. I started learning about the vinyl process. I learned just how much can go wrong, but also how little innovation had been in the industry since the 1970s. There's a lot of science and engineering goes into it. Karen set her sights on making the process more accessible and affordable for independent or up-and-coming artists. And with a small business loan, she decided to call her new venture Gold Rush Vinyl. I was living in San Francisco at the time and was really inspired by the pioneering spirit of that town all the way back to the 1800s. Like that's musicians today. They are pioneers going across the country in tour bands, chasing gold, so to speak. Gold Rush Vinyl opened its doors in Austin, Texas in 2018, completely disrupting the record pressing process. Their turnaround is three times faster than the industry standard. Plus, there are no minimum order quantities, making it easier for smaller musicians to afford records to sell to fans. When you think about how vinyl immediately being sold to a fan at a show puts money in the pocket of the artist so that they can get a hotel, get gasoline to drive to the next city. It feels very real in a way that when I worked in digital, I couldn't see how that all connected. On top of that, Karen and her team found a solution to one of vinyl's biggest problems, sustainability, creating floral bouquets made of scraps that couldn't be recycled. Today, Gold Rush Vinyl is not only facing the music, but meeting the moment. My fascination with why people have turned back to vinyl keeps coming around to the commemorative nature of a vinyl record. And that led us in a series of crazy COVID serendipitous things to have a machine now that can make 24 karat gold and platinum records. About five to 10% of all project requests we get are from people that want to make a wedding vinyl or a mixtape for their loved ones. And those are the creative things I get really excited about and that my team luckily come with me on when I have these big ideas, but celebrating those musical moments in your life. In the five days after our story first aired, Gold Rush Vinyl had the highest single day website traffic in the company's history. The power of the third hour I of love today. That. Uh. And they had 115 requests from artists, which is about what they would normally receive in about a month. Okay. Yes, so I like that. There you go. All right. Close to that story. Well, still to come, we're going to meet the family behind an iconic New York City restaurant with a rich history. And then later, and she made it, the business that's making it fashionable to buy less. Third hour of the day, I'll be right back.
this morning in our series Family Style, we are paying a visit to an iconic Harlem restaurant with ties to the civil rights movement. Yes, the legendary Sylvia's brought Southern soul food to New York more than 60 years ago. That's right, and I got to recently catch up with the latest generation that's still serving the community today. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Originally from South Carolina, Sylvia moved to New York during the Great Migration to escape the atrocities of the Jim Crow South. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner, which she eventually purchased from the owner. Her restaurant becoming a prominent place in the community as the civil rights movement took hold in New York City. My grandmother, she played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's. Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. Sylvia's strong commitment to social justice continues to this day. The restaurant welcoming congressmen, mayors, even presidents. One of the reasons why politicians flock to Sylvia's is because this is where the community is. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And it's this food that keeps locals and tourists alike coming back for decades. Trinessa's little brother, Marcus Woods, has been the executive chef for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's in. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that dining room, everybody's there. Yes, Sylvia used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken the most beloved menu item. So, did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. So I helped Marcus whip up the next batch. Now, is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. After the chicken is coated, into the deep fryer. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Uh -huh. yeah. Wow. I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. You better <laughs> pick, up your, pick up the pace. And oh yes, time for a taste. That's perfect. Perfect? Yeah, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm gonna take this piece to go. Oh, I'm gonna pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I've known the Woods family for years, so it was such a treat to see the grandkids honoring their historic legacy. And you can see much more about Sylvia's and learn the story behind some other legendary businesses in the full episode of Family Style, airing today at 10.30 a.m. and again tonight at 9.30 on today.com slash all day or on Peacock. It feels like Sylvia's part of the, the DNA of Harlem. Oh, oh my no gosh. question yeah. about it. Yeah, yep. and they, they've expanded, and it's yeah. just, it really is amazing. And those grandkids are just so terrific. And those desserts, desserts are delightful oh, as well. Yes. <laughs> to Tacoma, Washington now, uh, a woman there who's made her mark on the fashion world before becoming an award-winning teacher. Well, now she's in her second act, and as she approaches 70 years old, she's still picking up the pace. I went into fashion because it was in my blood when I was born. Madonna Hanna is a fashionista at heart. As a five-year-old, I would go into my parents' closet and I would reorganize their garments by color. They'd <laughs> come home and like, why are my why are our shoes reorganized by color? <laughs> she turned her childhood passion into a career in fashion marketing and retail. I came in as one of the few African American ex executives in downtown Boston, and Jordan Marsh was one of the largest department stores in New England. 
my dream at that time was to be a buyer. At that time, African Americans were not going to be promoted to be buyers, just assistant buyers. It was the 70s and it was just one of those things. She then took her skills from the showroom to the classroom, teaching marketing in her industry for over 30 years. I wanted to give the industry that I love, people who on day one, when they walked in, they would be able to contribute. It was her classroom projects that earned Madonna and her students national attention, like their Dare Not to Swear campaign. 500 students signed up to pledge not to swear. We were like flabbergasted, like what? Vanna White sent us a nice photograph that says no swearing, and even the first lady, Laura Bush, reached out to us. In 2011, at the age of 57, Madonna had a new classroom, this time on the track. Go. As a student. It just came to me that I should run 100 meters. It was such an overwhelming feeling like, where is this coming from? She had no sports experience, but she had speed. Her husband, Steven, a former sprinter and track coach, stepped up to train her, even entering her in the Washington State Senior Games. I won. I won the 50 and I won the 100. 13 state medals, one national medal, and one ruptured Achilles later, Madonna was hooked. It's my life. Just like the seed for fashion, that seed for speed in my DNA. It didn't quit. In 2018, Stephen passed away from vocal cord cancer. He wrote that he wanted me to continue racing, build up my thighs, and to wear red, white, and blue at the National Senior Games. Madonna honored his request and continues to compete. Now with a new coach, Go. a beefed up workout regimen, and adding six more medals. I'm getting older and faster. Oh my gosh. And I'm, you know, beating my times before my ruptured Achilles. This 69 year old is in it for the long run and going for gold. This journey of running was not, it was not my plan. It has taught me that absolutely anything can happen in life. She's impressive. Yeah. Since we first met Madonna, she qualified for the National Senior Games taking place this summer in Philadelphia. She should be an ambassador for, for Start Today. I was, Absolutely. Oh, you know what, you're right. There you go. Maybe we'll work on that. <laughs> okay, well coming up next, it's She Made It. Two classmates building their own fashion business and the secret to their success is buying less. We'll have more when the third hour of today continues. back now as she made it and you could say that this business is based on the idea that less is more today lifestyle and commerce contributor Joe Martin Brooks recently found out about a fashion brand that actually wants you to buy fewer things 
We really do believe that the love is in that product. We want women to feel like their best selves. Carla Gallardo and Shilpa Shah are on a mission to change how people consume fashion by buying less. <laughs> we have a little Quiana love for you. Yeah. <laughs> their philosophy of fewer better sparked the idea for their fashion and lifestyle brand, Kuyana. The mantra for your company is what I've preached. I'd rather you have 20 amazing items in your closet than 200 items. When we feel confident, we are unstoppable. When we are wearing the right pieces, we feel elegant, sophisticated. So that's what Kuyana is about. It's providing those products to women like us so that we can win in our day today. In 2009, a serendipitous meeting in business school brought the two of them together, where they both realized they had similar upbringings and shared values. I look back at my home, and it was a fewer better home from Ecuador. And we were very uh, selective in what we purchased. It was really because we didn't have a lot of options. And when I came to America for college, I realized I changed really fast. I had actually started to buy uh, in a more frugalist way than I had ever purchased before. But I really felt actually my closet was empty. And so even though there was more, there was actually less. And I realized that there was a better way to sell to customers. Carla and Shilpa aim to fix that problem by working on a sustainable fashion brand focused on premium quality and traditional craftsmanship. We've created Jill, a supply chain of the best materials of the world. Toquilla straw hats in Ecuador, baby alpaca in Peru, leather travel cases in Argentina. We really believe that if you put the investment in, you're gonna get that value out. And for us, at the very beginning, it was about making products that women could wear every, every single day. And Carla and I didn't find that in the market, so we set out to make a brand that could deliver that. So in 2011, with the help from both families, they launched Kuyana by selling hats, then scarves, and seeing the same customers coming back for more. What we are building with our customer is a connection that is so strong that she is buying fewer, but she is buying more of Kuyana. Shortly after launching, the pair ran into challenges raising money from investors until they turned to social media. You actually found your first investor through Pinterest. I mean, at the time, nobody was talking about how few female partners there were in venture capital firms. It was the early days of Pinterest. Someone had pinned every um, female investor partner in the U.S. I think there was, was nine or ten um, total at the time. And so Carla and I were like, you know what? We're going to pitch all ten of these women. It worked. Since pinning down their first investor in 2012, Kuyana has raised more than 30 million in capital. Today, Kuyana can be found in six retail locations across the country, expanding their collection to clothing and bags and quickly growing into a celebrity favorite. Is it still a pinch me moment? A hundred percent. The first time we saw a celebrity uh, wearing our bags, I mean, pinch me moment. The first time I saw a person that I didn't know right. on the street was a pinch me moment. Carla would call me every time. <laughs> In the early days, she'd be like, somebody we didn't know bought from yes. us. And then <laughs> I'd be like, and then I would have to be like, oh, that's my friend. I'm yeah. sorry, you know? So what would your advice be for female entrepreneurs who have a unique idea? For us, it's really about if you have those fundamental, that fundamental passion as to why you're building something, hold that sacred and don't compromise. All right, Jill, thank you. Uh, recently, Carla and Shilpa brought together Latina change makers in Los Angeles to celebrate the renaming of their Panama hat collection to the Ecuador hat. They've been on a mission to raise awareness around the true heritage of the product and highlight the incredible Ecuadorian artisans who actually make them. Yeah, actually, I've got a couple of what they're considered Panama hats. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And look inside, they're you say, made in Ecuador. Oh, really? Yeah. That's great. We're going to start calling those Ecuadorian. All right. There you Ecuadorian go. hats. Uh, third hour of today. Right.
Well, that just about does it for us now. But tomorrow in the third hour of today, we're going to catch up with NBA superstar Chris Paul. Can't wait. That's nice. Dell's favorite player. Oh, yeah. Nice. Dell's favorite player, Chris Paul. Hoda and Jenna up next. We will see you tomorrow. We hope you have a fantastic day. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names only on today. See, it worth coming to this early, right? Everybody, but it's today. today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We just get started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. <laughs> this has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about. Only on today. celebrating Juneteenth with Chef Scotty Scott. He's got a delicious dish you can make for your friends and your family. Plus the hottest hair trends of summer with celebrity stylist Adam Reed. And dating expert Devin Simone is here with advice for your relationship dilemmas. So it's today with Hoda and Jenna. It all starts right now. Hey guys, welcome. It is Monday, June 19th. And by the way, today is Juneteenth. It is a national holiday. It commemorates when the last enslaved people in the United States received word of their freedom and it yeah. was first celebrated in Texas. Yeah, June 19th, 1866. Yeah. And it just became in 2021 uh, recognized finally as a national holiday. We yes. hope you guys are celebrating yes. today yes. with yes. people you love and yes. at home with yes. kiddos. Summer is here. <sighs> Summer is here. One of Summer my is here. Favorite days of the year. What? Is the summer solstice. Why? Because it's a long, long, beautiful day filled moment. with hours of light, which allows you to do a million well, outdoor why activities. Are you cramming so much stuff, and I thought we were going to linger. We're going to linger, but I like linger. to do outdoor activities, like I hike know. and you do, run. And you get an you do get an itch for it because we've been cooped up, and summer's here, and we just want to. And how like, fun is it to go to dinner on the summer yeah. solstice yeah. when it's still light outside, even at 9 p.m.? Oh my God! The way, there's a great that? Thomas Rhett song that's called "Slow Down Summer." Slow down summer. Slow down summer. Is it new? Uh, I don't think so, but it's really <laughs> good, and it does get you in that vibe. So here's a good question, because although the kids are off from school, we're still going to work. So is it okay to wear shorts to work? Hmm. It's caused a debate. What do you think? Yay or nay? Well, we've worn some shorts with tights. Oh. Oh. oh, that was again. Oh, jeez. Okay. Well, we also wore, I mean, that's to a, y'all, that's, that's to a, to a jazz festival. Fest. We were at a festival. Oh. oh, Jenna wore, yeah, see, you wore, are those shorts or a skirt? That's shorts, but I wish I had tights underneath it. Okay. Plus, oh, uh, yeah, thirst trap. Yeah. Okay. Here's the thing. Yes, let's just, this shows you it's possible. And you wear it very well. I think I tights are, are a good way to do it, although not in the summer. I think it depends on the material, right? Yes. Like if the shorts are kind of fancier shorts. It doesn't depend on the length or just the material? The length and the material. The length and the material. Okay, Vanessa Friedman, she's a fashion director for New York Times. She says, yes, you can wear shorts in the workplace, but not without some consideration that you might be exposing <laughs> more than just your knees. Oh. Okay. All right. I don't so understand. keep it keep it at a proper length. You don't want it to be where you. It's a booty short. That's called a booty short, Vanessa. It, and we and you don't want to wear a booty short to work. It's all about where you work. I mean, some places you just wouldn't, and some places you might be able to. I have a birthmark right here. Yeah, I believe I've you've seen, seen it, it mm -hmm. when you've exposed me a couple of times. Um, that's my length test. If it covers my oh. birthmark, it's appropriate to wear around. Out and about. Out and about. Not yes. just at the pool or with my kids yeah, or whatever. Yeah, yeah. 
Um, oh, I have some way. jean shorts yeah. that um, my husband thought were Mila's. <laughs> Those I would not wear to work. <gasps> there, he's like, why does Mila have mother's denim with a yeah. little heart yeah. on the booty? I'm like, those are mine. Yes. He was like, why? why? Anyway, All right. flip flops to the office. I don't think so. I don't think so. Do you? I think sandals are okay, but I think flip flops. Flip are just flops a, are probably yeah, on stage. Right. Did you ever wear flip flops? I, I in college I wore flip flops everywhere, including when I had to go to court for a misdemeanor. <laughs> I wore um, what? I wore sort of like pants <laughs> with what looked like a tank top, but it was actually made of sweater material. Okay. And then some flip, flip flops. flops. What were you? Some reefs and a toe ring. A I didn't toe know. Ring. I didn't know. Nobody told me. So but guilty I got, right away. I got Is that what trouble. happened? Yeah. Yes. I Somebody should write a book for teens who have to go to court. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody advised wear. me. Nobody and, advised me. All right. Let's talk about some work outfits. There is some debate online on the best way to get dressed when you go out for the evening. So everyone's got their own method of how you do it. Okay. Well, this is one uh, viral post about the right way. So let's check out this version. So do you do makeup, outfit, hair, outfit, makeup, hair, hair, makeup, outfit, makeup, hair, Whoa, outfit, there's too many outfit, choices. Hair. It looks like some of them are the same. Wait, they have outfit, to be, hair, right? Because there's only three choices. But, no, but then you mix them up in different orders. Oh, three Six. times okay. three equals <laughs> nine. I'm confused. <laughs> okay, okay. But how do you do it? I think you should start because I'm okay. very confused. I do think, you have a method you always do? I think so. I think you do always hair first because, number one, you're going to be sweating if you're doing your makeup or you're getting dressed first. Okay. So hair, here's my hair, here's hair. My, you pop out of the shower. Yes. Here you are. Yes. Towel around your waist. Yes. yes. And do you get, just blow dry naked? Well, I have. Because you have no, you've just told me that you have no, nothing yeah. on. Well, I think you can put a T-shirt on, just something to throw on. But in you case don't your put on your. So really, I don't that should outfit. say, hair, shower, hair, hair. T-shirt, hair. Yes, and then after that, uh, it's outfit. No, no, no. It's makeup then outfit. But you have to be careful when you put your shirt I on. Know. After me. I don't want to. I don't want to put makeup on with my whole outfit on because then you might get makeup on it. I'm going to say something very controversial. Go crazy. What? Outfit, no girl. Wow. Outfit, hair, Whoa. makeup. Whoa. Wait, but you're blow drying your hair well, when I you have a sweaty outfit. I don't blow dry my hair because well, I don't know how. To. So I just put it up in a nice bun and or oh spruce it. I don't okay. ever. So you don't have the heat part. Okay, that would make sense. Or maybe a curling a iron. A curling iron. Um, the other thing is, I don't do it the same way every time. Who says we have to? Did right. you say that? No, I didn't <laughs> say that. Okay, but I do think you do it's the same time. Every yes, I do shower, makeup, outfit. No, you said shower, hair, hair <laughs> makeup, outfit. It doesn't matter. We never go out. We don't go do anything. Yo, at we night. just <laughs> never put on makeup or hair. We on just weekend, get dressed real into, rare. I'll have I a know. new one. I know. Put on your pajamas. <laughs> go to get bed. into the sack. <laughs> Open your book. <laughs> Get some ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> done, done, and done. All right, so there's some confusion over emojis. You know, sometimes someone will shoot you an emoji and you're Can like, you what is that? Can you just show everybody your phone <laughs> screen? What? Oh, Haley did it. I saw Hoda's phone screen, which she now she, oh, there you go. And it's just filled with emojis. And this is what my child loves to do. Mine too. does that too. She just has By the smiley way, they faces. They know how to and, take your phone and smiley do that. faces and poops. <laughs> Imagine walking into an event and putting this down on the table and everybody's like, wow. Well, by the way, you turn around for one second. No, and I they know. Do that. I, I only say you it because that. you know my child does it. All right. So what, these are some of the emojis that people don't know what they mean. Here they are. Okay. First up, that looks like sighing to me. I think that is <sighs> sort of like wrap it up, land the plane, talking too much. No. The, okay. The what popular responses are out of breath or tooting. No, I think it's. Yo, you don't toot no, out of your mouth. No, I think it's <laughs> sighing. I think it's like I'm exhausted. <laughs> Next up, this one, upside down face. It's just like, oh I'm man, crazy. things are gosh, it's Kooky. summer solstice and I'm exhausted. Kooky. Kids okay, have what had. What do people think it means? Sarcasm. Sarcasm, passive aggressiveness, smiling through pain. People really get deep on these. All right, <laughs> next up, the flying money. Oh, I've never even seen I the fly. Is that. that a new one? The flying money? Maybe it's like spent 
unfortunately. Way too much. You overdid out the it. Window. You overdid casino. it. Casino. Bye. Casino. <laughs> casino. What does it mean? Okay. What does it mean? Some people think it means losing money or fla oh, flaunting money. Oh. I think it means like saying goodbye to it. Yeah, me too. All right. Uh, Here's the most confusing of all. The woman with her no, hand No, yo, out. that's like, I'm looking fab. It's like, look at my hair. Is that what it is? I got my hair done. <laughs> really? Okay. I, what do you think? I'm like, know. here I am. Let's here. go. Girl, but she has that look. <laughs> what does it okay. mean? Okay. Feeling sassy. Exactly. Or feeling sarcastic. Everyone's into sarcasm. No, I'm not. No. I, I mean, think it means you way, feel I don't great. Even, I don't, you know what I decided? I don't love sarcasm Me anymore. Me neither. Is that terrible? You know, people are like, I, as I, if. <laughs> it's not funny. As I tell my kid, if everyone's not laughing, it's not funny. I know. Right? Why do we I have to want, be cynic, Everybody's so sarcastic. cynical. Let's just be Stop. enthusiastic. Yes, it's enough already. All okay. right, what about this one? Here's the last one. Oh, no, 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 no. Nobody I love knows. this one. I don't know what it means. I know what it means, jolly little fella. <laughs> jolly little fella. It kind of does look like that. A jolly you're little right. fella. I think you're right. It's like if you're feeling jolly, it yes. also means, yes. can I hug you? Happy, yes. Or jazz hands. It jazz hands, yeah. All right. Do Come, we know? Oh, wait, no, no, we don't know. Okay, All right, sure. what do we have up Coming next? up next, yeah. need a little help choosing the right dating app? Oh, we've called in a pro to solve your relationship dilemmas. Coming up after this. I like that. Don't you like that? Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Ain't no stop with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. The miracle. The miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. It is time for Hoda and Jenna's Relationship Dilemmas. And here to answer your questions, one of our favorites, dating expert, Devin Simone. All right, Devin, are you ready? I'm ready. You always got good answers. Here's our first question. We have Adrian in North Carolina. Take a look. I haven't been in the dating game for a long time. Actually, the last person that I dated came and found me. So if I see somebody that I'm interested in, how do I take the Band-Aid off and approach them? Or should I? Or should or she, should Devin? She. What do you? Yes, think? she absolutely should. It's totally normal to be apprehensive, but you gotta just go for it, girl. Because studies show that if we wait longer than five seconds, we will talk ourselves out of it. Five seconds. Five seconds. We'll talk ourselves out of it because we go for what feels good now, not necessarily what's good for us in the long term. So if you want a partner, approaching someone's good in the long term, but it may feel weird now, so you'll talk yourself out. So act quickly and then make it a game. Like if I talk to two new people today, I get to go to my favorite store and buy myself a little. Oh, that's such a good idea. That is good. And it must be hard for her because she said the last person approached her. So you're out of practice. So totally. I'm sure rejection, I'm, all those things are probably know, part of it. Maybe it's like you practice with yeah. little things at work. Absolutely. You know, yeah. like going up to somebody and talking as a so friend high. to yeah. try to yeah. figure it out. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. okay, the next up we have Sydney from Ontario. Let's take a look at her question. So I love my boyfriend's sense of humor, but I hate being the butt of his jokes. Uh, I know he's not being malicious or anything, but I want him to stop. What should I do? Okay, okay this is yeah. a tough, this is a toughie. 
It's a toughie. I mean, look, she loves him, and communication is key. So the nice sandwich is always helpful. We've talked about it here before, which is, hey, babe, you're one of the funniest people I know. Yes. But I really love laughing with you, but not when it's at my expense. It's yeah. not, it's not, doesn't feel so good. So could we switch it up a bit? I really love that joke you told about da da da. So you're kind of steering into an example of the jokes that you like. You're asking clearly, hey, please don't do this, especially because she says she knows he's not malicious, so you don't want him to feel attacked. Yeah. But at this point, he should listen now that she's put it on the table. Yeah. I think, think it's so smart, though, to just tell say it. how you yeah. feel. Because I think after a while, because I've we've seen that often with couples who go out. It's like, oh, yeah. blah, 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 blah. And the yeah. person kind of laughs along. Yes. yes. And they get the big laugh, yes. so it continues and continues mm -hmm. and continues. You're right, and it can hurt someone's feelings, too. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's good to just go ahead and say, say it how say you it. feel. Yeah. Say right, it. Let's, it early. Let's go to Paula in North Carolina. I have been single for a couple of years now, and I noticed that there are tons of dating apps out there, and so I just need help to, A, understand which one to select in terms of criteria maybe, and also help with understanding how to fill out a correct profile so that I'm not ghosted and that it can eventually lead to an actual date. Thank you. By the way, she's lovely. Yes, yes she's she is. lovely. And I think she's asking a question a lot of people yeah. are wondering. How do you even yes. start? Is, yeah. Where do we start? And so she right? asked like four questions in one. So one, it was how do I decide, you know, a good dating app? There are a lot of great ones. It does vary per city and demographic. It changes a little bit. I'd say join two. I will say that uh, Tinder has started a new thing called their relationship goals, which is cool. More than 50% of their users reportedly opt into that. So you can say I'm looking for what a long-term long relationship, long relationship on your profile. And you can also see or, other people that want exactly. that. Exactly, and you yeah. could say, I'm looking for a short-term relationship. I don't know what I'm looking for. So that way you can filter out pretty quickly if you guys are on the same page. And then you're gonna wanna have at least four to five photos on your profile, that's important. So you always want a good headshot, social shot, active shot, and activity, um, activity shot, which is the active shot, and a full body shot. Please don't do photos that are 23 years old. Styles yeah. change, look change, eyebrows change. Like, make sure they're re recent and relevant. And then avoid being ghosted by avoiding ghosted profiles. So if someone hasn't written anything on their profile, that is the first red flag that you should swipe left on them. I feel like a lot of people are concerned about, like, what are they going to think of me? What are they going to think of me? Are they going to like me? When really, as we talked to Tracy Ellis Ross, yeah. you're the chooser. Yeah. Like, you get to Absolutely. decide. And I feel like everyone's like, oh, I hope somebody and the likes right me. And will like, like you. Yes. But you just want to show different sides of you because we're all multifaceted. Yes. So if you post one photo, you're missing out on so much. If you post one line about yourself, there's so much I, that they're missing. I, there are so many um, online dating apps. Yeah. I, I mean, I haven't ever been on them, but, <laughs> but it feels like some are really niche. Is that a good yeah. way to go to? Like, if you're, um, you know, of certain religion or all of those things, have you found that that works out? It can work too. And I know people that have been engaged for almost every of the, like, major apps. I would say if you're going to do a niche one, also do one that's a little bit of a wider Water. net also and alternate the time. Don't spend more than 20 minutes or so each day on an app so you, you know, don't get burnout. Yeah, okay. that's right. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, you. Devin. All right, and if you have a relationship dilemma, tell us about it at hodaandjenna.com. All you have to do is hit that connect button. Just ahead, Chef Scotty. Scott has the perfect dish for your Juneteenth get together. Pickled shrimp oh boys. We'll be back right after yeah. this.
On this Juneteenth, we want to shine a spotlight on an organization that is creating positive change. Yeah, it's called OMG Outstanding Mature Girls. And Donna went down to Louisiana oh, for a yeah. visit. I went down to Baton Rouge. And what began there as a program to uplift young girls has grown into a statewide nonprofit that provides mentorships and teaches life skills. And as you're all about to see, it's all thanks to one woman whose inspiring vision will make you feel good today. This is Sashika Bonchamp. Born in Trinidad, she's now a Baton Rouge, Louisiana inspiration. Miss Sashika is amazing. She's so hardworking. She's always running. She's doing something. Miss Sashika is like another mother to me. Yes, in these neck of the woods, she's kind of a big deal. She has really like shown me how to have confidence in myself. She extends beyond extension. Anything for the kids, and I just love her. The former radio show host, known for her affectionate smile and loving personality, is the founder and president of the youth mentoring organization, OMG, which stands for Outstanding Mature Girls. Whether you are a scholar or whether you're struggling in school, like OMG is the place for you because we teach those girls who are scholars to be able to help pull their sister up. Ten years ago, Sashika created the nonprofit, which serves girls ages 9 to 19, offering leadership training, mentoring, and community service. OMG has given me a continuous sisterhood, but it also has helped me to break out of my shyness. It really helps me feel better about myself. Mm -hmm. They all are there for each other, and they just all want to just do right and, and be leaders. Shakita Maiden credits OMG for helping her daughter, Anaya. She wasn't smiling, and I was wondering why. So I used to get in trouble a lot, get suspended and stuff like that. When I came to OMG, it was like a sister. It helped her to get in a safe space where she was able to talk and vent and cry and be consulted and not be judged. And it helped her to develop a self-confidence. How has OMG changed your relationship with Anaya? We are closer and so it's okay, it's okay. I just thank God that it saved her. Sashika often reflects on her own childhood struggles using her story to uplift others. I felt like I had to put a mask on. When I went to school, I had to be somebody else. What made you feel like you had to be somebody else at school? Being bullied and picked on for how I spoke, my hair, so I went home and I wanted to cut all my hair off because it was something that drew attention at school. For the wife and mother of three, launching OMG was a lifelong passion. Today, OMG has eight chapters across the state of Louisiana with about 200 members. Everything was funded out of my pocket, or should I say my husband's pocket, <laughs> and just small donations. And that's how we have survived. People think that we get so much money and we don't. We just, it's just the, the community coming together and just helping and to make it great and to make sure that these girls have the best experience ever in what we do. What do you think your teenage self would think of you now? I knew you can do it, Sash, like, good job. And continue just like leading and lighting the path for others. And that's what I wanna do, just light that path. And now it was our turn to brighten up everyone's day. And Miss Sashika, where are you? I interrupted a round of games for a special surprise for Sashika. Today, it's time that we recognize you and all you do for the community. First, the mayor of Baton Rouge, Sharon Weston Broom, gave a proclamation. I just want to commend you and celebrate you for all the work that you do. Thank you so much. Thank you. Then, four of OMG's smallest members helped us deliver one big surprise. Wells Fargo was so impressed to learn all the work Outstanding Mature Girls is doing to set up young women for success. They will be donating $10,000 so OMG can continue I'm so thankful, I'm so grateful because I don't get this quite often, so I'm very grateful for it. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. OMG! 
Okay, isn't Sashka yeah. amazing? Wow, love her. And it's it's so cool because it really takes one person mm -hmm. to create this ripple effect of change and community. Yes. And it's something that's so necessary for, for everyone. Well, people right. are always like, what could I possibly yes. do? Well, Sasha just yeah. showed us. Wow. It's so true. Very so cool. thanks to her. And to find out more about outstanding mature girls, head to HodaAndJenna.com. What an awesome thank organization. You. Thank you, thank you. All right, coming up next, Chef Scotty Scott's in the kitchen. He's putting his twist on a classic New Orleans dish coming up right after this. and family coming over to celebrate the holiday today. We've got just the dish to serve. We are talking about shrimp po'boys. Yeah, we're actually talking about pickled oh. shrimp po'boys, courtesy of Chef Scotty Scott. And this dish is straight off the menu at Scotty's Abe Formage food truck in Fort Worth, Texas. That's right, that's right. Hi, okay. Scotty, Hi. how are you? Hello. A po'boy is perfect, And man. it's kind of light, you know? Yeah, I mean, yeah. well, Ish. not always. <laughs> But this one isn't fried, which we like. Right, it's got a lot of flavor to it. It's nice, crisp, and fresh, and cool, and just what you want in the summertime when it's hot. Mm -hmm. Totally. All right, let's get cooking. What should, how do we make it? So I'm gonna start off with a little onion here and just slice it up. And mm -hmm. I love about this dish, it's gonna be made ahead of time, yeah. which is mm -hmm. awesome. So if you're entertaining or something like that, just pop it in the fridge, it's ready to go. You got so it. When do you make it, When so you'd make it like a day before or something? Because yes. you can't make shrimp that. Right. Yeah. You're, you're going to boil the shrimp quickly, but then after that, you're going to let it sit in the marinade for about uh, 24 hours. Yeah. Okay, so you so leave... that's what pickles it. Basically. Yes, exactly. So wait, you're leaving all those seeds in there? Normally I wouldn't, but... Today you are. Today you know what? Lazy. TV. All right. Okay, so now so we, we got, got that pepper, in there. We've got onion, we've okay. got capers, capers in here. I love capers Me with too. shrimp. What's what's going on here? So that's what's habanero. This? Don't touch your face. Oh. I mean, you touch it now, but... <laughs> Okay, good to know. Uh, so it's going to be hot, real spicy? or Not anything? that spicy. Just a little hint in the, at the back end. Um, okay. Got fresh lemon. Okay. Ooh, What's this? We've got dill, fresh yeah, dill. Don't go crazy with it when you do it, when you use it because it'll get overpowering. Okay. Then we've got celery seed, salt, okay. a touch of sugar. Sugar. A little bit of sweetness. Okay. And then some bay leaves. Bay leaves. Okay. To All that, right. we're going to add our apple cider vinegar. Mm-hmm. And our oil. olive oil. All right, so this is our marinade we're making right yes. now. Yes. Okay. Did you just pop this after you boiled the shrimp? Do you just pop this all in the refrigerator? Yep, all in the bag. Now shake it. Now Talk wait, I got a question. Yes. The shrimp are all. You took the tails off. Tails you, off. You know, tails on shrimp is a big you know thing right now. Mm -hmm. Tails on, tails off. But we're making a sandwich, so we definitely want them off. Yeah. Put okay. them in there. Give them a massage. Like I just had a hard day's and work. How, can you ask? Uh, how did you cook those? Uh, just a quick boil. Boil. You just for, just for how to make long? sure. Uh, only like three minutes three ish minutes. when they start quick, trying to turn quick, opaque. Quick. All right. Yep. So now that's in the fridge and you're pulling it out of the fridge. Ooh, out of the that fridge. Beautiful it's salad. beautiful. Look. I feel Smells like you great. could even serve this on like lettuce. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I've served it on tostadas, on mm -hmm. avocado mm -hmm. toast, mm -hmm. avocado anything like that. Toast. So All right, but this, we got a baguette. We got a nice French baguette here. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna start with a little bit of mayo. Mm -hmm. Give it a quick slather. 
Yeah, that, this is what we call dressed. Exactly, right? exactly. From that, we're gonna start just adding it. So just pile on the shrimp nice and, that's and mm -hmm. delicious. tall there. Mm -hmm. All righty. This is a little, little, mm -hmm. little bit of lettuce there for okay. us. Okay. Now you put mayo on both sides of that bread or I'm just put, the bottom? I'm gonna put mayo on both Please. sides. Please. Both sides. Come on. Hoda you know, loves some mayo. We like I mayo. think you're skimping like on the mayo a little. I'm not sure. <laughs> Come on, Scotty. Hoda wants to. What are you doing there? We got plenty. Hoda, okay. you take a spoon and, then, and have a bite. And then, and then tomato, you put, just put some tomatoes on And then, nice. of course, tomatoes on <laughs> that there. That makes it. Gotta have, a, have tomatoes on your po' boy. Mm -hmm. A nice little sprinkle of salt just to bring it all together. What is that sauce? Lemon juice? What's this for? That is a little bit of the extra marinade because you want to make oh, sure you got plenty of that flavor make in there. It, oh yeah, yeah, right? yeah. This is the marinade sauce. Finish it off with that. Mm. So with that marinade sauce, do you save it or you just pour it out of this bag? Yeah. So when you get the bag, I like to put it in a colander and have something beneath it, and then put all the juice. Oh, in. that's all right. So well, come smart. on down, Miss Hager. Okay, I'm gonna come eat. Let's try it. You, you uh -huh. get in there too, please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm Got that tang. Mm hmm I love that. I've got some heat. Mm hmm mm. You put hot sauce on yours? I will. Yep. Mm hmm Yep. It's got him. Delicious. Mm. Sorry. Yum. I like that we're just dropping shrimp <laughs> everywhere. Uh -huh. This was so delicious. Mm. Y'all visit heat. Scotty's food truck if you ever get to Fort Worth. To get this recipe, go to today.com slash food, and you can check out Scotty's cookbook, Fix Me a Plate, at today.com slash books. Coming up next, you guys, celebrity hairstylist Adam Reed. He's going to show us how to get summer's hottest looks. Coming up right after this. That is fresh. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I like it, I like it. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back. Here we go. Boom. Sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. <laughs> happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. OK, summer is almost here, so why not change things up a little with a new do for a new season? And here to show us three of the hottest looks is celebrity hairstylist and our pal, Adam <laughs> Reed. He's the founder of Archive Head Care. Adam, we love you. We're just I letting you know you. that from the jump. Um, people always see a celebrity's haircut and they're like, I want that, yeah. I want that, I want that. Haley Bieber's got a uh, hot look right now that everybody's after. What is lob. it? Yeah. So it's a lob. And do you know what's so wonderful about it is it's what? slightly uneven. So a, a bob is a classic haircut. Uh -huh. But she's done it slightly different. And what I've done today to show you, oh. it's a much more shattered edge. So what you can see by that, I mean, it doesn't sit blunt and heavy. Right. Although it's look at Helen. blunt and heavy. Look at her. I see. Also, do you know what we did here what? is we let this naturally dry, oh, wow. and then I've just polished it. Wait, this so, is her hair naturally dry? Naturally, you have so beautiful lucky. hair. She, I cut it all off this morning, so she came in with oh, hair to here. Wait, really? And Ellie, I very you much know? wanted Amazing. her. <laughs> she has smile on her face when Don't we cut it. it. Okay. But then what I did is I used very a cute. pressing Let's iron uh -huh. just to put a little bit of polish in it. So I just uh -huh. go forward, oh, kick backwards. that in backwards and forwards. That's how you make it wavy. I want to yes. do that. Adam. There you go. There you go. And then 
then what I've done is I've used a pomade. So pomade again, old school product. Yeah, Love a pomade. Bit of an old, older sort of men's product that oh. we yeah, have I was modernized. Say, I feel like Henry uses that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but pomade is a softer product, so you can see here I work that into my hands. What Haley does so well is just that natural beauty. Yes. Yeah, definitely. She really does. Uh, so does Ellie. Uh, oh, so does Ellie. It. So we squeeze, squeeze gently, it. scrunch oh. this in. Make sure I've not got any pieces. And look what that does. That uh, gives you that PC film, volume, it and modern. too. All right. Thank you. I designed that fragrance. You did. Yeah. Yeah. We're into yeah. it. We most certainly okay. did. So Vanessa Hutchins had a cool updo. We're going to try to copy okay, this Okay, that looks complex. Sorry, Adam. <laughs> so this isn't complex. This is, okay. again, that looks complex. Yeah. Number one, so. you can buy it as an accessory. So buy a hair bow made out of Oh, just bow. stick it on. Stick it on. Okay. But... Honestly, we have the most beautiful model they in do. every sense here. Yeah, okay. She's brought me so much joy, as much joy as you two bring me. Wow. Okay. But this is two ponytails, so I'm going to turn All right, Kai, what we got? On the top. Kai, what are we so doing? So two here. Yeah. I've then placed the ribbon in between the two ponies and wrapped them together. I then literally fold the hair over. So fold this is it. way easier than it like looks. Like, we can do this on ourselves. You can absolutely do it on yourselves. I've got a long bobby oh, yeah, pin here. Oh, yeah, you can do that. That's, that's like... Excuse opening it with my teeth. Well, that's, that's the okay. only that's way. At beauty school, I was told never to do that, and I... Oh. Well, the beauty school teacher see oh. you now? But I know. I know. <laughs> yeah. Then you take the ribbon. Now, I call this hair badashery. So it's... Hair badashery. I'm good, aren't Don't I? Don't let anyone steal that. I'm you good, need aren't that I? Yes. On your oh, okay. Commercials. So, hair badashery is all about buying things that aren't expensive. Yeah. Things that you a find ribbon. around your house. A yeah. ribbon, buttons. By the way, you know, ribbons are so chic. Look how beautiful look, she looks. Yes. At that. Kai, beautiful. Kai, you've got to wear Stop that it. all day and go to a prom. She's <laughs> not taking it out. I'm not going to allow her to take it Just out. Just a corsage. That's then all we need. Then what we do oh, wet, to the more. edges. This is natural hair. We prepped the hair by pressing that down. Mm -hmm. Now, liquid hairspray onto my fingers so Ooh. don't spread directly onto no, the hair never do. Would you ever do and that? then just work that Look through clean that, up Kai. all your edges see the fluffy bits I here love it. Kind of Hides beautiful. it. Gorgeous. Kai, you look great. Of all of do you, that. Could you feel like you could do that yourself? I do. A okay. really okay. great tip as well, toothbrush. <laughs> and edges. get the edges. Just get wow. one of your edges. Of course. All right, okay. let's so get our wavy look. Um, yeah. Margot Robbie. Yeah, she's a beauty. Crush Isn't look at that she? kind of 1920s But do you know who else is crushing it in this look? Lori. Lori yes, is a beauty is. too. Isn't Gorgeous. she just? No, the hair is insane. <laughs> so again, we wound fair. this okay, with a curling iron. What's key here? Uh -huh. is how you wind it. So it's a flat oh, wind I every direction. I want to see. Let's see. So you take your section of hair. Can you see I'm Curl. twisting as I wrap? Twist it. The twist creates the wave, the crest of the wave. Crest. So but that is a Marcel wave. But you didn't clamp it. No, I didn't. But if okay. you're doing it at home, you can. You can. But sometimes no problem when you at clamp all. it, you get that kind of crease. Yes. But you wouldn't, though. So here... Clamp Look. and pull. Pull. Cramp and pull. So Look keep pulling. Look. See here? See what, you, see what he out did? Out the end, and there that see. goes into that end there. Okay, I feel uh, like so I just that, learned how to use a curling iron. That uh -huh. then okay. doesn't get the crease. Now, spray your brush again. With what? Hairspray. <laughs> Come on. This is a liquid hairspray. The reason that you spray the brushes, as that goes in, look, look how that forms that. Look, you're brushing it to be this beautiful oh 1920s. It's a 19. It's like, like a Pantene Veronica commercial. Lake. What's happening? You should be a hair model. <laughs> well, do you know what? As well, I don't, I, can't, I don't even know what time it is at the moment. But we did this at about six o'clock this morning, so we haven't brushed it. It's, we prepped oh it with mousse. Four mousses. hours. Four hours. Doesn't feel good. Mousse to have your is hair one of the oh. biggest trend products. Yeah. It's sort of old school, do you like but a they've mousse? modernized a mousse. So now, what do you do? So now. Yeah. Gently loosen Gently. it out. So use your fingers and see fingers. how this opens that up. Oh, wow. So Lori. what this does, you think the Margot Robbie, it was based on classic. All of these are quite classic, but modernize it. So I've got the spray on my fingers. Gently open that up. Open. Look how Gently. sassy that looks over the face a Gently. bit. Gently. Yeah, see. Very. Oh, that beautiful movement, but the volume that and you get in And it doesn't look here. stiff. Like doesn't often stiff. hair your, looks like Your, your um, hairspray is not like crazy. Uh, no, yeah. so I designed this myself. And yeah, actually, I use a liquid hairspray. And the reason that liquid is good is because it dries quick. Yeah. Uh, you can see here, it's an ultra fine mist. Mist is the, the key yes, to it being great. Key. Because you can always go through after and finish it. But you saw I put it onto the brush we into saw, my fingers. We oh my gosh. Adam, Adam, Adam we'll come back 
We Adam, love you. When I come love. back, you yes. know I'd be here every day if okay. I could. You can be our we hair We can arrange dude. for it. All right. I stalk you guys every day for the joy that you bring me. Oh. So I, you, I, I Adam. will be here all of the time. We love you, we love you. Adam. You're love with me in London every and morning. And we apologize to your husband that you started watching us. <laughs> no, he like, loves he it. He likes it too. He loves you the fact sure? that you two make me smile so much. So honestly, meeting oh. you last time was one of... Highlights of oh, my career. Thank Gosh, you, Adam. Adam. We love you. You're invited back whenever. <laughs> Anytime you want. Coming up next, you guys, the grand finale of our spring fling. Yeah, one of our Plaza Peeps plays for an epic beach getaway. Coming up. There you go, guys. Y'all look so good. Your It is time for the grand finale of our Spring Fling Getaway Series. That's when we bring a lucky Plaza fan inside to play for an epic vacation. Okay, Hoda, today we are joined by Judy Keparel from Big Bend, Wisconsin. She's here with her hubby, Bernie. Are you all having fun in New York? Yes. Oh, my gosh, Come on, yes. Judy, Bernie. Okay. Central Park, 9-11, Today's Show. We're, You've we're done loving it. All. it. Okay, loving well, we it. are so happy. Are you ready to play? I am ready. Let's go. Okay, awesome. here's how it works. You're going to have 30 seconds to toss okay. as many of these colorful tubes onto these poles, but okay. here's the catch. The floor is going to be spinning. Oh, my okay? God. Okay, I got so this. Judy, you can do it. Judy, after 30 seconds, we're going to count the number of tubes that you've gotten on there. And if you get one on, you get one. Your suitcase, one, two, three. Woo! The prizes get better the further you Let's go. go Let's go, girl. Okay. Woo! Judy, are you ready? I'm ready. Okay, I'm 30 ready. seconds on the oh, clock, fine. please. Oh, sorry, sorry. Okay, go ahead. Let's go. Oh, All right, go, Judy. 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 Take your time, Judy. Take you your time. Got it. Come on. She's going. Yes, she got please. Two. Oh, she got two. Oh. Oh, come on, Judy. You got it. Oh, Judy's going far. Okay, go for the green. Oh, come on, Judy. You got it, Judy. Two. Ah. Come on, Judy. You got it. Take your time. Yes, yes, it's three. Wow. Nobody. Wow. Here, yellow, yellow. Oh yeah. Come on, Judy. Take your time. Oh. It's amazing. Oh, it's No one's ever gotten six. No. Whoa. We didn't even know the most possible. Okay. Come around, come around. Judy, come around. did you play basketball? Come no, on, Bernie. We played frisbee. Frisbee. <laughs> okay, so you didn't get that suitcase works. one because you oh, got five. Okay. Not two. All right. Not three. Keep going. Not four. Keep going. Girl, if there was a six, you would have gotten it, but you get lucky number five. Are you ready to see where you're going? Drum roll, please. Judy, you are going to. Thanks to Apple Vacations, you're getting a three-night stay at the all-inclusive Ryu Palace, Jamaica. Oh there, you and a guest can take in breathtaking views, relax in one of three infinity pools, or head over to the spa for a treatment. Airfare is included with this trip, so pack your bags and enjoy. I'm packing up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, this That's is your awesome. week. Oh Everything's gosh. happening. Thank you Thank so, you so much. much. Congratulations. Yes, We're so you. happy. We, we love you. Enjoy you. Bernie, your trip. Will you send us a couple of pics? Absolutely. Are we you want to see, see Bernie? <laughs> yeah. Okay, good. Okay, good. All right. Well, thank you guys, and oh, we'll be back so right much. after oh. this. Good. Jamaica. Good. Good. Oh, my God. Oh, my
going to do it for us. We hope you had a good time today. Tomorrow we've got another great show for you. We will see you on Tuesday. Today's Monday. Tomorrow's Tuesday. NBC's Morgan Radford is here with us. Good to have you live in 1A Morgan. Thank Good you. to see I'm you. I'm so excited to be back and to see you all. So Juneteenth has always honored freedom, unity, and history. And part of that is celebrated through tradition, storytelling, and food. That's why one chef from Wisconsin decided that this Juneteenth, she was going to do something special and fulfill a promise made more than a century ago. <laughs> bye. 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 A big idea finally come to light. How does this feel? I mean, just a year ago, this was all just a dream. Yeah, it's very surreal that, you know, th this is mine. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, this, this is, is your corn. Yeah. Here on 39 acres of land in St. Helena, South Carolina, Chef Adrian Lipscomb is creating a sanctuary for black farmers. The welcoming center. Yeah. It's over there. Right. Where they can grow okay. their own produce and learn about the history of an industry that currently is less than 2% black. We were cooking as slaves, as the cooks in these kitchens. We want to recreate those kitchens. We want to celebrate, but also explain to others and to the public. We want the community to come to this land. We want them to be able to come celebrate on this land. Opening up a new world of possibility that all started with a mystery check in the mail for $100. So you did not know personally no. the person who put this check in the mail to you? No, no. Didn't know this person. Her project is called 40 Acres and a Mule, a reference to the short-lived attempt at reparations that gave former slaves land after the Civil War, only to be rescinded after Lincoln's assassination. It started with the special field order number 15 by General Sherman to give 40 acres and a mule to the slaves that were released from the Civil War that were following him. And the question he asked is, what do you want? And one of them stood up and said, land. How does Juneteenth and the significance of Juneteenth for you connect to this project? Juneteenth has always been celebrated with me and my family. 1865 is just a, a significant year. You already have freed slaves in January of 1865, but you still don't have the free slaves of Texas, not until June 18th of 1865. By the next day, they're celebrating, and they're saying, we are free, we can celebrate. And what is so interesting is that slaves weren't allowed to be in big groups. So a lot of those leaders came together and they bought land where they would go and celebrate Juneteenth. And food was a huge portion of this. The celebration of freedom. The celebration of freedom, you're right. Which is why Lipscomb, a mother of four who owns Uptown Cafe and Bakery in La Crosse, Wisconsin, decided to start her project here in South Carolina. A lot of history right there. A land. Uh, slaves were here. Slaves were here. With deep roots and African ancestry. Land is huge. Land brings identity, land brings community, land brings freedom. It allows us to navigate in this world, to create our history, to respect our history, but also bring forth our future. Lipscomb was able to raise more than $150,000 in less than a year through a GoFundMe page and with the support of celebrity chefs like Mashama Bailey and David Thomas. As an African-American chef, I am really interested in reclaiming the narrative where, where the food of this country started. Together, they're fixing up something special ahead of this Juneteenth, celebrating on their land in the best way they know how. Some of the best chefs in America yeah. are around this table. Helping one entrepreneur fulfill a promise from generations ago. Left the hands and made this food <laughs> for generations to come. Amen. I see. Amen.
And this is just the beginning. Adrian hopes that by next year, the land will actually host an archive of black farming traditions, three kitchens that represent the African ancestral contributions to cooking, and produce farms for black farmers. So her hope is really to create a safe space for them to grow, to cook, and sustain their own produce, while also learning about its history and where those food and food ways yeah. come from. The craft beer industry has exploded in recent years, becoming a nearly $30 billion industry. And now, emerging from the pandemic, many specialty breweries are flourishing, with Black-owned establishments in particular gaining a lot of momentum. While they make up less than 1% of the more than 8,000 in the United States, more Black brewers are now starting to open sites. In fact, I recently stopped by the only one here in New York that brews on-site for some beer and the side of... South Carolina home cooking and some conversation. If somebody's putting their true passion and their true love into it, that's a good beer. By that definition, Chris Gansey has been making good beer for a yes, decade. Gansey is the owner of Daleview Biscuits and Beer, the only black-owned brewery that brews on site in all of New York State. And that happens in these tanks below a kitchen that's very busy serving up biscuits and fried chicken by way of somewhere very special to both of us our mutual hometown of Columbia, South Carolina. Where'd you go to middle school? Um, Gibbs. Oh yeah, we used to play you guys in basketball. We used to beat Gibbs all the time. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> Gansey says he didn't even drink beer until his wife gave him a small home brewing kit 10 years ago for Father's Day. Being from Columbia, South Carolina as well, I know, especially in the summertime, cookouts are big. Yes. You mean to tell me back then you weren't like drinking tall boy beers? No. <laughs> no, I was not drinking beer at all. But three years ago, that hobby evolved into a business. How did you get from those home brewing kits to the owner of quite the establishment? People that believed in me, I had my wife and some close friends who believed in the, in the vision and kind of pushed me forward. It's like, you, you can do this. Why not spread the joy? Now he's turning out craft beer and Carolina biscuits in the heart of Lefferts Garden, Brooklyn intentionally choosing a historically black neighborhood to help integrate an industry with little diversity. I wanted a place where I could be part of the community and also do a place to educate people around craft beer. Like, I feel a cold beer is something that can bring people together. Out of the roughly 8,500 breweries in America, just about 60 are black owned. My hope is we can help change mindsets in the neighborhood because the neighborhood is changing. and in trading and unity and, and um, equity. So that's my goal, to help create equity in this community. Gansey is striving for more than exposure and equity, but for a few teaching moments as well. Dale View's beers are named after lesser known civil rights leaders like Jamaican activist Paul Bogle and freedom rider Diane Nash. These are the last three in existence. We sold out of the- We sold out of the yes. Diane Nash. It's a beautiful label. And I love that on the back, you actually explain for folks who might be unfamiliar. Even better than the label is what's inside them. I'm not used to learning and drinking at the same time. <laughs> this is a novel concept. Oh, it's not just beer? No, it's also biscuits. Wow. And let me tell you, a lot of folks won't recognize this, but that's pimento cheese. What, what you know about pimento cheese? That's, yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. I grew up. I had pimento cheese three times a day. My grandma would say, y'all put your foot in that. That is fantastic. Chicken thigh. Of course. Yeah. Now I said, oh boy, <laughs> Al Roker's gonna love this. A taste of South Carolina, now educating Brooklyn beer drinkers, all thanks to a thoughtful present. Had your wife decided to give you a tie for Father's Day. That'd probably be a tie maker. <laughs> <laughs>
Greg, you met a chef here in New York who's breaking barriers in the restaurant world. Yeah, his name's Charlie Mitchell. He became the first black chef in this city's history to earn a prestigious Michelin star. And he's only the second black chef nationwide to earn the accolade. I stopped by Clover Hill, his restaurant in Brooklyn, to talk about that achievement and also, of course, to try some of that gourmet food that's made him a groundbreaker. The chef behind this popular Brooklyn restaurant is now being celebrated for more than fine dining. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City to be awarded a Michelin star and just the second black executive chef in the country to achieve that honor. I wanted to always you know, plant my feet here and be a serious New York City chef, so that was always a goal of mine. And look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> Dreams come true. Yeah. Mitchell was born and raised in Detroit and developed a passion for food and cooking from his grandmother. I think the thing that stuck with me the most is like she used to like this like whole fry fish, like whole fry bass all the time when I was younger, and I think that stood out the most. Head on? Always. Oh. <laughs> He attended culinary school for a few months, but preferred on-the-job training instead. I ended up like Googling restaurants in the metro area, got my first real job, and in that kitchen is where I was like, wow, like I love the way they work. I love how professional it is. Like I'm using ingredients I've never had, never learned about. Years of experience in world-class restaurants like 11 Madison Park eventually led him to this quiet street in Brooklyn Heights. When Clover Hill opened one year ago, he became its executive chef in charge of creating the menu. Mitchell's team pleats an eight-course tasting menu that regularly changes with the best seasonal foods available. I guess it's challenging, but we're always changing something, or we're always trying to make the dish the best version of itself, right? So we may tweak it every day for two weeks straight if we have to, to get it to be like a perfect dish. That quest for perfection did not go unnoticed. When Michelin announced it starred restaurants in October, not only did Clover Hill earn a star in its first year, but Chef Mitchell picked up the award for best young chef. That was a complete surprise when they announced that, and I was just humbled, you know? Were you aware at the time of the historic implications? I was not, not at the time. You always think so many people have come before you, you just assume that someone has already done this, you know? You just, this doesn't cross your mind that you may be the first or second to do really anything. Especially here in New York City. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there aren't more people who look like us as executive chefs in fine dining restaurants like this? You don't make a lot of money as a young cook, you know? So I think a lot of times we're like chasing a very different American dream than to kind of put up with these aggressive environments that are often led by people who don't look like us. I tasted some of the iconic dishes that earned this unique place in the food world. I'm gonna come around and try this here, although it's almost too pretty, pretty to touch. <laughs> Including a shark fin flounder and a spicy tapioca. But this is nice, and it's subtle. And a Japanese mackerel. We dry age it, we hang it a little bit, and then we finish it in a little bit of beeswax so that it retains moisture. When people leave your restaurant, what, what do you want them to, to take away? I want them to kind of be, you know, excited or inspired about food, you know? Like, that's something that is very important to us. Her name is Opal Lee. She is the grandmother of Juneteenth. Opal, she's an activist and community leader, and at 95 years old, it's proof it's never too late to create change. I refer to myself as a little lady in tennis shoes who gets in everybody else's business and has a damn good time doing it. That's Opal Lee, better known around Fort Worth, Texas, as Miss Opal. I'll see you. Okay. But around the nation, she's recognized as a Nobel Peace Prize nominated activist and leader. If you want something, you just have to go after it. Born in 1926 in Marshall, Texas, some of Ms. Opal's fondest early memories are celebrating Juneteenth, the emancipation of enslaved people in the United States. I had beautiful Juneteenth experiences when I was small. We'd go to the fairground and we'd have music and speeches and food and ball games and food and food and food. 
Juneteenth combines the words June and 19th and marks the anniversary of the 1865 date, the last of the enslaved received the word they were free. Freedom is for everybody. And we're not free until we are all free. At age 89, Ms. Opal took on freedom as her cause, fighting for Juneteenth to become a federal holiday. She began Opal's walk to D.C., culminating in a 1,400-mile trek to the nation's capital. Do you know we took a million 500,000 signatures to Congress when we got the call to go to the White House? We could turn this country around. And on June 16th of 2021, Ms. Opal stood next to President Biden as he signed a bill establishing a federal holiday for Juneteenth. I still pinch myself. It was fabulous. I wanted to do a holy dance, but my kids say when I do that, I'm twerking. So. While that legislation is what Ms. Opal is most widely known for, she's been quietly creating change in Texas for years starting with her time as a teacher. It was my responsibility to see that kids were in school. So if he needed some shoes, I bought shoes, or clothes, or food. And when I retired, that followed me. People still needed a place to live. They still needed food. And so I joined a, a food bank what started in Ms. Opal's kitchen grew into a community food bank, which now resides in a 39,000 square foot warehouse. Each day, it provides 600 members of the community with access to fresh food, household products, and pet supplies. We get chicken, ground beef, a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits that's much needed. This have impacted the community for many, many years, and without it, I just don't know what we would do. Ms. Opal's impact goes beyond the food bank. Opal's farm is a five-acre urban farm in Fort Worth, Texas. We expect to feed about 25,000 people this season. Ms. Opal's work on behalf of her community and her nation continues to inspire those around her, including her own family. Well, I'll put it to you this way. I am the granddaughter of the grandmother of Juneteenth. I would even venture to say that she's the grandmother to the nation. When you think about having lived 95 and seen the depression and seen um, the civil rights movement and, and then to, to see the Black Lives Matter movement now, to see the first African American president, when you've got that kind of span, you develop some perspective that's unique and I think that She's really good at expressing it. Creating a legacy of activism, tenacity, and the courage to fight for freedom. The fact that all these things I see need to be done, if they were done, I'd stop. But until then, I'm gonna keep on walking and keep on talking and hoping somebody will listen. Oh. We're listening and we are honored, honored to have Miss Opal Lee and her granddaughter, Dion Sims, who's the founding executive director of the National Juneteenth Museum, joining us from Fort, oh. Fort Worth, Texas. Miss Opal, I can't tell you what a thrill it is for you to see you on our air this morning. So many people are, they have this day off and they're maybe watching this show and they're saying, how should I spend this special day? What would your advice be, Miss Opal, for how people should spend this Juneteenth? I think they should spend uh, the special day helping somebody else. Oh. I find that when I help somebody else, all my problems seem to disappear. Now, I don't want you to think that they go into thin air, but when I'm helping somebody else, I get help for myself too. Oh. So I'm going to advise them, help somebody else. Yeah. Ms. Opal, you, you, you've inspired us beyond. Dion, I know that the woman sitting next mm -hmm. to you must mean everything, the world to you. What have you learned from her? Because you, I see that your life is dedicated to service too. And, and that's really what has happened. I've learned from her that, you know, you give of yourself. Um, 
sometimes maybe even to your own hurt, but it's always in betterment of somebody else. to our ongoing series, Changemakers, in honor of Black History Month, there's a new magazine looking to shake up the culinary world. For years, you may have seen some of the same faces on TV and in magazines, but you're about to meet a woman who is looking to add some new perspectives to the food picture. Take a look. It's the first of its kind, For the Culture, a new magazine celebrating black women in food and wine and written, photographed and illustrated all by black women. It's the brainchild of Clancy Miller, a pastry chef turned food writer. I worked in Paris at a bakery in a restaurant and I loved it, but I also realized that I wanted to work outside of the restaurant. So from working in kitchens to writing about food. When it comes to food and wine and beautiful cookbooks, there's certainly no shortage. So what made you decide that it's time for something a little bit different? I've never seen a lot of focus on black people in general, but specifically black women. And I truly believe that black women are the architects of kitchens and cuisines in this country throughout history and in many countries throughout the world. So I wanted to create a publication that would center our experiences, our expertise and our voices in relationship to food and wine. Inspired by a famous writer, she went to work. There's a quote that Toni Morrison has said, which is, if there is a book that you want to read, write it. And so this is a magazine, but I felt like this is something I want to read. And that was just the beginning. Clancy launched a crowdfunding campaign a little over a year ago and sought submissions. That was enough to begin putting pen to paper. 35 women contributed to the first issue. Gracing the cover, culinary historian, cookbook author, and college professor, Jessica B. Harris. I want people to feel inspired to learn something more about a person they didn't know about before. If you have never made a Somalian meal, I hope you'll try one of the recipes. So I want people to feel like their curiosity is being sated. In celebration of the magazine's release, we toasted three women profiled in the issue. Angela Davis, also known as The Kitchenista, is a home cook and an eight-year food blogger of The Kitchenista Diaries. Mashama Bailey is an award-winning executive chef and partner of The Gray Restaurant and The Gray Market in Savannah, Georgia. 
And Krista Scruggs is a Vermont farmer, winemaker, and business owner of Zaffa Wines, who provided a little tasting of it for us. <laughs> Krista, what do you think about this magazine? Because finally having us having space and holding space when everyone else has but us, or that we've got to fight harder to have our voices heard. Mashama, to bring us behind the scenes to be a woman of color um, in the food and wine space. I do think that it's lonely, you know? I don't think that there are many of us. And it's really um, been an eye-opening journey to meet people. Angela, what would you want people to know my daughter's six and to flip through this magazine and it was just picture after picture of black and brown women and food and it's all about us. I'm looking at our boxes. We're all in different places right now. One thing is for sure, food and wine and culture, it all, it connects us, doesn't it? Yeah. Aww. We're here celebrating our stories, celebrating each other. Congratulations and here's too many more. June 19th, 1865 is the day that more than 200,000 black Texans found out they were free yes. two years after the Emancipation of Proclamation. And these recipes are an homage to that. 100%. So what are we starting with first? So we are starting today with the Victory Chicken Burger. Right. This is Ooh. a burger that I made inspired by historically black colleges and universities. You know this is the time of year when everyone is graduating yes. and you see all the photos and mm -hmm. now they have a burger to make. And you went to an HBCU. Clark I did. Atlanta. I graduated from Clark Atlanta. So listen, this Chicken salt mm -hmm. is a must. This mm, celery, okay. cumin, okay. onion powder, okay. you mix it all in if you can mix it in for all me. Those in there. All yeah. Right. And, and you know, in black American culture, mm. so many salts and sauces are passed on oh, from generation yes. to generation. So this is a chicken salt that I'm 100% passing along to okay. my Okay. <laughs> What's the verdict over there? Like oh, incredible. Oh, come on. They're loving Ooh. it. Oh, they're okay. loving it. We like to hear so, that. So, chicken burger. I approach my chicken burger just like meatloaf. Okay. Egg. So we're gonna put some egg, egg right first. in there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, mm, let me tell you, the secret sauce really is the sherry vinegar. You're you're gonna do the sherry, sherry vinegar. Sherry vinegar. Oh, sherry vinegar. All right, we yep. got about two minutes left here. Breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. All right. And then you mix that all together, and then nice firm patty. Okay. In I'll, the refrigerator overnight, if you can. Oh, that's oh, that might be yep. the, that's yep. the secret. Yep. How long on each side, roughly? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need about four minutes on each side. Okay. You bring it to the bun and dress it. Okay. White cheddar cheese is great. Tomato. Mm. And lettuce Pickles. and pickle. I want to yes. make sure we get to this There's corn no, salad. Right. This is the most salad. important thing. This is my right. favorite one. Listen, growing up, I know you're from the South. I am. I remember shucking corn. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh, yes. Rubbing the silk. Oh, yeah. And so I brought some of that corn this magic into job. this corn, corn salad. Magic. I love you that. You like that? Yeah. <laughs> corn, green beans, southern peas, if you can mm. find southern them. Southern peas. We were, we were trying to identify. We're like, quinoa? What is it? No, southern so peas. Um, and you mix it all together. And just mix it all together. All together in the bowl, and you have this beautiful mm. summer corn, green beans. What's the dressing? It tastes delicious. And last but like, not least, 
the showstopper for Juneteenth, yeah. the Devil's Food Ice Box Cake. Ice it Box Cake. Oh my so God. No bacon. No bacon. No bacon. You do not have to turn your oven on. Cream, mm. chocolate wafers, and pecans. Oh my God. It's, it's crazy. crazy. Nicole, oh, thank God. you. Thank you for this. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960. Or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists. And Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dickie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dickey Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dickey Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po' boy shop, becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lange Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Ducky Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china. She wanted linens. She wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace 
But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chases when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Duke. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. In. Chicken and shrimp. This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We are enjoying everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase oh, to, to get, get myself my... some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together.
A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Triness Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner Johnson's Luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's Restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X according to Professor Psyche williams Forson, The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Kalepsi, Ozzie Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events, just four years apart, sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken.
Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, Trinesse, wow. it's, so it's so good, good to see you. See it's been, you. So long. It's been mm. way too long. I missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you and the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, See yeah. How gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Oh, yeah. Wow. Like, I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is so I know what you're person. For. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I can come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, man. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Cooking up a fantastic pasta dish with assistant managing editor of the New York Times and founder of New York Times Cooking, Sam Sifton. And he's gearing up for the New York Times Food Festival. Ooh. It's coming back October the 8th. I'm so excited. Uh, Sam's going to be moderating a special panel with the cast and crew of the FX hit show, The Bear. Mm. Uh, so we decided to make a spin on a family style meal from the show with Sam's Amatriana, Amatriana on, on the, the fly, fly, on the fly, which okay. is from the show. But what I love about your column, you talk about this concept, and this is what we're going to do. It's a no recipe recipe. That's right. What do you mean? What I mean by that is you don't have to follow the rules all the time. Uh -huh. You just have to kind of start with a prompt mm. and get going. Okay. And, and, and I provide the prompt. And then you make it however you like it. Mm. But you add lib. You add lib. Okay, so what so are we starting with? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Especially is, if it's bacon. This is bear adjacent. This okay. is not bear cooking. <laughs> okay. I'm not carmy. <laughs> right. This is bear adjacent. So we've got some slab bacon here uh -huh. that I Yum. chopped up for that little tease. And we're going to get it into a pan with some olive oil. And we're just going to let that get going and render some fat. About how much bacon? I like a lot of bacon. I do too. Is that enough bacon? <laughs> yes, a lot of bacon for is it? good. So yeah. a lot of bacon mm -hmm. going. And we're just going to let that render, render, render. Okay. Mm. And if when you don't use bacon, it's just... Well, traditionally it was made with guanciale, the oh. hog jowl bacon. Right. But I've done it with salami. I've done it with pepperoni. Okay. Any cured meat, right? So we got that going. Next, we're going to get some onions. Okay. That's going to help us with our sauce. What's your tip for cutting onions? I go across. Uh-huh. And then down the middle, okay. right? And always leave that guy right there, that okay. root end. Yeah. Right? That'll leave hold, him there? That'll hold everything together oh. as you're cutting. Pro tip. Got it? Pro tip. Pro, Pro tip. tip. All right, so into that rendered bacon. Ah, uh, oh secret ingredient. Fat is flavor, my friend. Yes, oh my it is. So we got that going. And we'll get mm -hmm. that down pretty low. Uh -huh. Let it go until it's pretty caramel. Mm. Okay. Right? Now we're going to build the sauce out. Mm. We've got some canned chopped tomatoes, right. which are going to go in there. If, if, you, you, and and if you've had some, like, a, a good harvest of garden tomatoes, could you use fresh? You definitely could do that, but I like those garden tomatoes raw, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know, like a bruschetta or yeah. something, okay. Okay. a salad, a tomato watermelon salad. That's always delicious. Mm. So this guy goes and goes and goes and goes and builds up flavor. Mm -hmm. 
We've oh, made some good. pasta. Okay. okay. I've added some butter to that pasta. Okay. Why? 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 Because flavor. Add flavor. I'm like, exactly. that's why this is so good. Because right. you, you didn't you gotta pay attention. The, you know, yeah. you really want to get some nice plushness. And it's really like five ingredients, too. It's nothing. But it tastes so, it's so layered. And, and do you, can you, is there any pasta you could use? Or? Yeah, you could use a bucatini if you can find any, uh -huh. or a spaghetti, or, you know, you could do this with shells and have a pretty good time. Mm -hmm. So we get that going around, right. okay. and then what we're going to do when we're done mm -hmm. and we're happy with it is hit it with some Pecorino Romano. Oh, oh, Pecorino okay. Romano. More flavor. Mm -hmm. More Let's flavor. Some red pepper flakes. Oh. Okay. And some chopped parsley because... It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Did you add the pasta water to that as well? I'll add a little bit of pasta water okay. in there just to loosen things up if it gets tight. It's delicious. Okay. Hey, Sam, talk, talk to us about uh, the festival coming up. Oh, uh, yeah. We're really excited. Um, we started the festival a couple of years ago. We missed a year or two mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, and now we're back in Damrush Park in Lincoln Center. We're going to have a okay, ton so of great chefs coming in. Mm -hmm. We sold out tickets in the first tranche, but wow. we're putting a new set on on September 22nd for sale. And then for those who can't make it to New York, mm -hmm. we're going out on the road with oh, some of our, with oh, Melissa wow. Clark and oh, others, some of our best of our chefs. Faves. And we're going to cook with some of America's greatest chefs on the road. And you That's can awesome. cook at home with cooking kits from the New York Times store. That's awesome. Right. Al always good, raves good about recipes. It's the biggest customer. It's, it's, it's the, the thing that I, I go to all the time, right after uh, Today Food. I, <laughs> 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 but New York Times cooking, we're giving you a run. This there is you go. fantastic. Sam Sifton, always love when you're here. Thanks so, so much. Good. This morning in today's food on a twist, an Italian classic here to make pasta cacio e walnuts. Oh. Chef and cookbook <laughs> author Carla Lali Music. I wish there were smell o vision. I, yeah. it, it smells so amazing. good here. Her new cookbook is called That Sounds So Good and This Sounds So Love Good. Carla, good morning. Thanks for having me. Hey, so girl. start us off here because cacio e pepe you've always heard of, but sure. cacio e walnut, what are we talking about? I know, here? and not like cacio e pepe needed improvement <laughs> as a classic, <laughs> but a couple of things that can go wrong for people. One is is that the cheese doesn't melt yeah. because it's those hard grating cheeses. So mm -hmm. I changed up the cheese. And for me, like, it's great, all those textures. It's like adult mac and cheese, mm -hmm. but I need a little crunch. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. we've got pasta boiling. That's going to come in. Just keep an eye on that. Okay. And I just like to crush the garlic. Mm -hmm. Does it matter what kind of pasta, by the way? I like a big tube for this, okay. and but you can really use anything. Like um, spaghetti would be fine, but I like with a big tube, some of these pieces will get inside oh, the tube. Get, mm, they they get, get, and then, like, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and then you get like a little secret. Um, Wait, you didn't crush them as much. Okay. No, so these are just going to toast kind of like that, and I'll press down on them while they're going or maybe one of you will press down okay. while they're going and then instead of toasting the walnuts in the oven I toast them in the pan with the oil and the garlic so they kind of pick up all those flavors and infuse and that really gives a crunch um, so 
another thing that's classic with Cacio Pepe is that you would use a sheep smoked cheese, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, pecorino or pecorino and parm. Mm -hmm. But what can happen is those cheeses, like, they like to clump up yes, when they're melting. it's so frustrating. Yeah. So I, I have a fettuccine Alfredo it. recipe that is great, but it's very similar. The cheese clumps up on people. Mm -hmm. So for this, that was really in my mind, and I wanted to solve for it. So instead of using pecorino, I switched it to manchego. Oh, we went oh. to Spain. We went okay. to Spain. Oh, so a little okay. bit with the walnut. Mm -hmm. And the Montego goes like, yeah. Now we're on a like a European siesta. Uh -huh. We're just idea. going across. Could yeah. you use another <laughs> nut other than walnut? Totally. Yeah. So my book has spinets for every single recipe. So <laughs> you could use pecans, you could use almonds, you could mm. use cashews, you could really okay. use whatever you want as long as it's got crunched, even pistachios. So importantly here, why don't you grate okay. uh, or crack a lot of pepper in there right. because the pepe is the pepper, uh -huh. and without yeah. that, like it's not cacio pepe, it's okay. not cacio walnut, mm -hmm. and more? also putting yeah more. Yeah. Putting the pepper yeah. in. Did I hear what kind of oil you said yeah. you use? Extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin. Yeah. And, and why is the pasta water so important? So pasta water is really important because the oil and the pasta themselves with the cheese, things will melt, but they're never going to get creamy. So you really need that water. So let's see. How is our pasta? Let's it's give not it, quite done yet. Not but quite done. I don't know if we have time to We're wait for it to finish. Drop one in here. Let's see. All right. So with the pasta water, the kind of brilliant thing that happens is it creates this like available liquid for the cheese to melt into oh. so fat like any emulsion fat and water like they need mm -hmm. they need both to be there in order to make something creamy how much water by the way mm. 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 Like a, pretty good, good? Yeah. Right. if you cool. want to do that calvin's my noodle tester at home <laughs> <Yeah>. so. <laughs> that's kind of scooby doo yeah, yeah mm. totally um, i mean i feel like the water part is all a feel it is yeah i don't know i'm sorry i usually one. scoop out and using the um the measuring cup, You're you right. can take out a cup or a cup and a half, yeah. but something nice about using a strainer is that you don't dump the water first. So yeah, you right. kind of, if you need to go back, you can. But hot tip, if you forget about the pasta water yeah. mm -hmm. and you use tap, oh, it's go. totally okay. fine. Okay, okay. Right, okay. oh, oh yeah. Um, put a cup in there. Let's dump the put pasta the right in here. Okay. I like to build the whole sauce in something deep like this. Okay. Yeah, Ooh, beautiful. Good. Amazing. And the cheeses, that's okay. And then we're going, yeah, because okay. they're all going to end up in the same mm -hmm. place. So using something deep like this mm -hmm. gives oh, you room yeah. to stir oh. and toss and right. go and without. Then you're going to end up with something like this. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that melts side. gradually. Wow. You end up over yeah. here. You guys definitely it's need to get it. in there. It's a pleasure. Dylan loves this. This is her favorite. This is my favorite. I mean, I want to plan a trip to Italy just to eat cacio e pepe. <laughs> and, and it should look good, really creamy and saucy. So a with nice something salad. rich and cheesy like this, I love a simple uh -huh. salad. Mm -hmm. oh my this is my big batch vinaigrette. It's the vinaigrette I grew up eating. We always had a bottle of it on the counter. Really simple. Mustard, olive oil, a couple kinds of vinegar. My mom always put balsamic and oh shallot. God. Put it in the blender or the Cuisinart. Mm -hmm. You end up with this beautiful oh, concoction. Go ahead and swirl. And it's creamy. You can keep it in the you fridge. Make it look so easy. And then it's not a big deal to make a salad because your dressing is already mm. done. How long does this last in the fridge? The Many ma weeks in the fridge. Weeks? For sure, 100%. I yeah. would say, as a fan of Cacio de Pepe, this has definitely taken it up a notch. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah, Thanks, it's Carla. that little bit of crunch. And, and the salt. crunch and the toastiness in the walnuts. Yeah. It's yeah. like what it needed. Well, Plus yeah. gar garlic. We what kind of wine would you recommend with this? Actually, something white and bright, like a Friuli or something like that. Thanks so much for stopping by. Be sure to check out her new cookbook. That sounds so good. Good. Trust me, it is. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. Joining us with budget-friendly meals that you can make for dinner tonight is an expert chef, Frankie Salenza. He's the host of the Taste Maid's hit series, Struggle Meals, where he creates gourmet dishes that will not break the bank. Frankie, you're just what the doctor ordered today. We need you. What are you going to make hey, for Hey, I got us? all five of you. Good morning. Good morning, Hi. Frankie. Super cool. <laughs> what you going to make? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna make a mushroom cavatelli pasta. Mm -hmm. So I can show you that real quick. Obviously, pasta is super affordable, but if you just go buy semolina, which is a high gluten flour, um, you can make pasta with just semolina and water. Ooh. Am I allowed to say gluten on air? Is that sure? Like yeah, no, you're okay. Good. Good. You can okay. do it. So you literally just combine those, and then and then you can roll out sort of a snake here. Wow. Cut these up like this. Bing, 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 and then with your with your knife. You can just kind of windshield wiper. Do you oh, see that? Yeah. yeah. And you get these things called cavatelli because it means little hollows. And if you think of like cavity, for example, oh. the, you know, the Latin root cavity, cavatelli, cavity is a hole in your tooth. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> so what um, makes this whole thing budget friendly? 
So really, there's listen, there's a whole bunch of ways to save money. One of the biggest ones that people overlook because we live in the future and everything is available all the time is cooking in season. If you're cooking in season, it's not being transported long distance to get to you. Like, that's a great point. I don't know. Carson, would you go down to Argentina right now with the price of flights? Yes, I probably would. <laughs> if JetBlue you went, would? I'm there. Okay, well, <laughs> if you want asparagus right now, it's yeah. coming from Argentina and right. you're paying for it to get on a plane flight. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. That's no good. No. So, right. right. Eat, Seasonal eat selections beets, are for close. example. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I've got a, uh, a rag here. You just roast the beet. Mm-hmm. And hopefully this works because I did cook these last night. But essentially, if you just get a rag that you dedicate to this and, and use the friction of the rag, Wait, sort of this is the twist. Here. Yeah, oh. you twist the you twist the beet inside. Oh, is a bird going to come get, out of there? Yeah. Yeah. You see it like oh, what? what? Oh, what? Yeah, that's a cool. Like so, magic. so beets are in season. They're a root vegetable. So is citrus. You can make a gorgeous citrus beet salad. Oh, can I ask a dumb cheese. question, Frankie? Is there like a website beets? or a place you could learn where things are in season? Like, I have no idea. I just go to the grocery yeah. store. Yes, exactly. oh, absolutely. I mean, there's this whole like thing that we have in the palm of our hand with all of mankind's knowledge. And you can just say winter vegetables and you'll oh. find that it's <laughs> so root vegetables. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. Right. Cruciferous right. vegetables, root it. vegetables, right. citrus. Mushrooms. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to be. No, I deserve that. It was dumb. I told you it was dumb. (laughs) Okay. We'll go back. So so that's a beet salad. Go ahead. Where's the mushroom come in on the pasta? Different dish. So we've got our mushroom here. I cooked them naked in the pan. Mm. Got it. And then I added some fat after. It's Mm. sort of counterintuitive. You want to dehydrate a mushroom so that then you can infuse it with fat, which is flavor. Mm. So I cooked it naked in the pan. They naked. shriveled up, water came out, mm. threw the butter and or olive oil in there. Yum. And now we've got, you know, we've got this mushroom. Okay, so there's mushroom. Yum. Cavitelli. Okay, okay. That's the oh, mushrooms you know? going the cavities. And you're saying yeah, making your saying- homemade pasta, that was, I mean, that was a good budget move too, right? It's a good budget move. Pasta is pretty affordable anyway, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. So, like, if you want to use a boxed pasta, mm-hmm. the thing is to just pair mm. it with in-season ingredients. I want to eat that. It's not I a problem at all. I want it. I love hey, Frankie, does, you know, does I, homemade pasta, does it, does it change the cooking time? Yeah, it's a lot faster. So I put these in right at the start of the segment. They've got a self-timer built in. They float to the top when they're done. Oh. If uh, if you see it, it Frankie, takes like, you know, between Frankie, two and three minutes. You're an that A-plus guest. We want to say thank you. Uh, yeah. You're great. You can find uh, res- this recipe at today.com slash food, and you catch Frankie's show. Check it out. It's called Struggle Meals. It's Thursdays on Tastemade. Thank you, Frankie. Struggle Come back meal. at a person next time, Frankie. Come yeah. back, Frankie. <laughs>
We're back with Today Food, and one of our very favorite guests, our pal Bobby Flay. Oh, I'm so excited. He's an award-winning chef, the author of 216 best-selling 216? We At can't least. forget about his hit show, Beat Bobby Flay. By the way, new episode tonight where two chefs go head-to-head in the kitchen for a chance to face off against the master himself. This morning, Bobby is sharing a fantastic pasta dish with us. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Flay. Good to see you guys. Bobby. Bobby. Thanks for waking up uh, yeah. early. What yeah, we- what are we cooking, honey? So we're making uh, we're making a baked pasta. It's one of those dishes that I think is fantastic for like a Sunday night meal. It's very, very comforting. And it's something that uh, can feed the whole family. So let's get started. It's gonna be rigatoni. It's gonna be some hot Italian sausage, some broccoli rabe, and some tomato sauce. A little vodka sauce there as well. So I'm gonna start off by cooking some rigatoni. Uh, and some salt and water. You know, you've seen this a million times in the Today Show. Lots of salt in your water. Make sure it's boiling, abundance of water. We're gonna cook the rigatoni for about eight or nine minutes. Well, while that's cooking, we're gonna get our, get our sauce going. So we have some hot Italian sauces that I've cooked off a little bit. Some tomato sauce. I've made my own, um, but if you have a good, uh, a good quality tomato sauce that you like, you can definitely use that as well. And we're gonna add a little bit of vodka. This is that, uh, you know, one of the one of the most classic Italian American pasta dishes is pasta a la vodka. It's basically a tomato sauce with a little bit of vodka in it and um, a touch of cream. So it, it, it almost becomes like a little bit of a pink sauce. Really delicious. What does the vodka yeah, do to it? Question. What's that? What does the vodka do to it, Bobby? The vodka actually helps emulsify the cream in the tomato sauce, so it doesn't, um, so it doesn't separate. It's uh, it, it's sort of a binder in, in a sense. Yeah. And also, it's like, I mean, who doesn't want to cook with vodka? I mean, there you go. <laughs> oh. so, so, so basically, you're making like a creamy tomato sauce with the, with the hot Italian sausage. And then um, just because we want to make sure that it's nice and healthy, I'm going to put some broccoli rub in there as well. Okay. And, um, and then we're going to take this sauce. I'm going to pour it right over the cooked pasta. This is some rigatoni that I had, you know, cooked ahead of time. Okay. So we're just going to, we're going to cover the, uh, the pasta in the sauce. And I'm going to add some fontina cheese to it. Yum. And this is all going to go into a casserole dish. And I mm. love cooking things, I, you know, I call it oven to table, where, you, where you, you, know, you create something in the kitchen, you put it in an earthenware or some sort of uh, oven-proof dish like mm. this one. So, Bobby, you did, put- did you cook that pasta al dente because it's going to be cooking longer in the oven? Yes. That's actually, hold on, that's a great point. You want to cook it a little bit undercooked. So maybe like three quarters of the way because it's gonna sit in the sauce, it's gonna bake in the oven at about 350 degrees. And on top, we're gonna to put some fresh, some, some grated mozzarella and some Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. And then we're gonna to go to the oven. Hey Bobby, oven, how do you keep it from sticking on the bottom? Oh, it's not gonna stick because we, you know, there's lots of tomato sauce in there, it's gonna to be totally fine. Oh, and actually, if it, um, if it gets a little crusty on top, that's actually a good thing. It's like, you know, like when you have the lasagna, and the, and, and the edges and the crispiness mm-hmm. on the around the side. Mm-hmm. When you always want that part of it. You get you definitely get a little bit of this as well. You want to let this bake in the oven about 350 degrees for, I don't know, about 15 to 20 minutes, because don't forget, the pasta's already cooked, the sauce is already hot. We're just heating it up. And then at the last second, for the last three or four minutes, turn your oven up to mm-hmm. broil. Mm-hmm. Pour yourself and cook the time. This is part of the recipe, by the way. And then take out your... Uh, Take out your, your pasta, and you can see this is what it's going to look like. I see. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yeah. Oh, I hope that's what I'm that's talking about. Oh. Here if you're watching this at home. Make this. Yeah. And there you go. Oh, it's delicious. Man, make, Bob, make it about this weekend. Yum. And then basically, you know, you can just take a, take a little bit and just try to kind of put it in a bowl. Look at that. Nice and chewy, uh, cheesy. Yeah. Just look at that. That's I mean, good. after looking at that, Bobby, it's amazing that anybody beats you on Beat Bobby Flay. Yeah. How's it going over there? B Bobby Flay is great. We've done uh, we've done close to 400 episodes, which is insane. <laughs> but I have to tell you, I'm having more fun than ever. Um, it's so great to be able to welcome you know you know chefs from all over the country to come in and and take me down. It's actually way more fun when I lose because the chefs are so excited. It's great for their community when they win. You, you know, they usually have like all these. They have like viewing parties in their in their local community. It's great. B Bobby Flay has been so much fun for me for the last. I don't know. Does your, does your girlfriend like watching it? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, Carson asked me if my girlfriend was awake. Oh. The only person awake right now in L.A. is me cooking baked pasta for you. It's 5.50 in the morning. How yeah, well, if you would just yeah. pull that sausage out of that dish, then she'd have a dish that she could eat if you were a little more thoughtful. 
Oh, oh. actually, Carson, you know what? You're, you've actually done your research because Christi Christina does not eat meat. I know that. Yes. So, like, Sausage out of here. She's all good. There you go. We just put a, well, we just put up a picture of her there. As well, <laughs> well he, last time Bobby was on, he was very secretive about this whole relationship. Yeah. But then he spilled his guts to People Magazine. Now it's fair game. Oh, so she's yeah. lovely, yeah. lovely, yeah. lovely, yeah. lovely lady. It all. Hey, Bobby, real quick. We, we loved your restaurants in New York yeah. City. So amazing over the years. Anything new on the horizon? Anything we can look forward to? In New York City, um, well, we're, we're sort of in the wait and see kind of thing right now for New York because, you know, I've, I've always had restaurants in New York my entire adult life. And, uh, you know, we're just going to see what happens. You know, I just opened a Malfi in Las Vegas about five or six months ago. That's going really well. And uh, listen, you know, New York has my heart. So at mm -hmm. some point, we'll be back there. All right. We'll all right. To Thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Hey, we can catch an all buddy. new episode of Beat Bobby Flay tonight on Food Network and get Bobby's recipes on our website today.com slash food. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the Missy Robbins is a James Beard award-winning chef and owner of Lilia and Missy Restaurants. She's out with her second book called Pasta, the Spirit and Craft of Italy's Greatest Food. Missy's right here near us in Brooklyn uh -huh. in her kitchen right now. Missy, by the way, you were a home run on the 8 o'clock hour. We're still talking about that breakfast pasta. Oh, we uh -huh. get it. No, we want it. We want you to come make it for us. But for us, you're going to make... I will do that anytime I'm allowed. Yay. I love it. Okay, so you're making a broccoli pesto. This is mm. one of your favorites. Tell us why. Yeah, this one. This one's a little later than the last segment where we did carbonara, and I, I, I bragged about how rich it is. Okay. This one's a little later. Um, there's a few reasons I love this. One, it's it's got broccoli. It's healthy. It's I developed this when when I was trying to eat healthier and wanted to include more vegetables. And okay. how do I do that but still have a little pasta? So it starts with it starts with you can use broccoli. You can use broccoli rabe. In my in my recipe, I have both. Um, you kind of just separate the florets, the mm -hmm. leaves, and then um, blanch it, shock it, chop it. So that's a, a, just a quick cook. Um, and you end up with this. Um, and then the leaves and basil, you also mm. blanch and do a puree. Okay. Um, and then we use pecorino. Mm. We use parmigiano. So it's still so got the all yummy the stuff in there. Traditional, yeah, yeah, all the yummy stuff. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not, it's not like... You Can know, I ask diet. real quick about it, that it, pesto? You was that a pesto you poured in? Is that what the basil was? That that was that was just a puree. Puree. Um, okay. And then this is olive oil, which will mm. kind of bind it all together. Mm. And then the gnocchi. One of the reasons I love them, I think, I think a you can make them ahead of time. You can you can make them. You can cook them ahead of time and hold them overnight. This is a ricotta gnocchi Ooh. that's uh, really foolproof. Yum. Like you, you cannot screw this up. So and, should you just and, not buy the, uh, you know, the frozen okay. ones and 
Do I need you to do the real thing? You should never buy, never. Is that horrible ever. of me? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Ever. I won't buy the frozen ones anymore. <laughs> This is just so easy, and I, I love it also because it's great to make with kids. Mm. Really great to make with kids. It's an easy one. Um, I roll this dough out into ropes, you see, uh -huh. and then I cut them into pieces. Mm. And then if you want a little extra fancy, you go, um, you want to make sure there's enough flour so they don't stick. This dough can uh -huh. get a little sticky. And we have this little paddle, very traditional uh -huh. gnocchi board, um, and you just kind of roll it down uh -huh. like this. Uh, also, like, really fun for kids, like great hand-eye coordination. Ah. Um, oh. And I once, you, once you taste those, you probably can't go back, so I guess I can see that. Exactly. And, <laughs> and they're just easier than potato gnocchi. So I have them cooking in back. It's really hard. Like, with traditional pasta, egg pasta, it's so delicate. It's pretty hard to screw these guys up. <laughs> like, they, you want to cook them till they float to the top, but if they float and they cook another one or two minutes, you're okay. You're going to end up with something very, very light. That's okay. the other thing with these. There's a lot of cheese. Um, I have my broccoli pesto on the Oof. stove here. Um, Yum. And, and, just, and, and it's got a little pasta water to loosen it up. So mm -hmm. pasta water is a really important ingredient when you're making pasta. It adds starch. It adds a little salt. And we just go right in the pan okay. here. Coat it. Right. And then how do you know when it's ready? Well, you're going to marry them together. Okay. So you're going to just toss, 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 mm, toss, mm. toss, toss, until those gnocchi kind of absorb into into the uh, sauce, and the sauce absorbs into the gnocchi, Look and they become flip. one. I was just say, mine would be all over the floor. I'm just mesmerized so, right I now. mean, you should try it at home. We, yeah. You know, when we teach young cooks, we tell them to take beans home and, <laughs> and just flip beans okay. forever and ever. Oh. Um, and then we just go right here. Serve it up. Um, for the, Look at that final plate. Oh my gosh. I just want a fork right um, now. Mm. And these, these gnocchi, you know, in the, in the book, we have um, tons of recipes for different red sauces. The, that's like one of my favorite things in the world to eat. Missy. It's, it's just red sauce gnocchi. Missy, um, that is, a that's a parm. 10 plus. Look at that. Yeah. Um, a little more parm. We thank you so much. Um, and we're so excited thank again. You. You're joining us from your Brooklyn kitchen, but you've got, you're the owner of Lilia and Missy, the Missy. restaurants. In New York. So thanks again. Yeah, uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Us too. For this recipe, go to today.com slash food. And for Missy's book, you can head to today.com slash shop. It's Thank called Pasta. Thank you so much. Okay, if you're tired of coming up with dinner ideas night after night, we're kicking off a new series to help you out. It's called One and, and Done. Done. It's simple, inexpensive, and also healthy one-dish wonders. And today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is starting us off with a menu for you tonight. Hey guys, so everybody has re been requesting hearty, delicious meals that you can whip together in a flash. And that's why I love One and Done. These are one sheet suppers and we are gonna be making roasted chicken and Brussels sprouts. And you'll say, it could not be any simpler. So we're first gonna make the marinade for the chicken and I'm adding in some olive oil. And this is a little bit of a secret ingredient. Two teaspoons of vinegar. What's nice about the vinegar is it acts as a tenderizer for the chicken. Half a teaspoon of garlic powder, because everything's better with garlic. I have one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. And last but not least, smoky paprika. I love smoky paprika, and I'm putting in a heaping tablespoon. And it's gonna give it a nice, vibrant color as well. So now I'm going to cut up my chicken breast. So I have skinless chicken breasts here. If you want to leave the skin on, you can do that as well. But the key is, because we want this to cook really quickly, I'm cutting each breast into three large chunks. And if the breasts are really big, you can certainly do four or even five. And now I'm just going to add the chicken breasts into the marinade that we made. And the vinegar is going to allow the chicken breasts to tenderize. I covered up my chicken and I'm going to marinate it in the fridge for 30 to 60 minutes. Next, 
what I think is the star of the show, our Brussels sprouts. So I love Brussels sprouts so much. I trim the edges and I'm cutting them into quarters. They are packed in vitamin C and they also have cancer fighting properties. And you'll notice as I'm cutting, we're getting all of these stray leaves. It's the best part of the Brussels sprouts. The best part because they brown and crisp up. To me, it tastes like potato chips. And Hoda, I know you're laughing right now. You're saying, Joy, those do not taste like potato chips. They taste like potato chips. I'm gonna take all of my Brussels sprouts and I'm gonna lay them out on the sheet. A little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt, and some ground black pepper. And if you like a little spice, you can add crushed red pepper flakes too. I'm gonna pop this in the oven at 400 for about 15 minutes. Guys, I told you, like potato chips. Can you hear that? That's a crunch. Mmm, so good. And now I'm gonna nestle the chicken. And this also works perfectly with thighs. Now I'm gonna pop this back in the oven one last time on the middle rack, set at 400 for 10 minutes or until the chicken is done. And there you have it, one and done. Now you can enjoy it exactly as is or you could bring it to the next level and add some fresh lemon juice on top and either some crumpled feta or some grated Parmesan cheese. Hoda, Jenna, this is a winter winter chicken dinner. If you need something quick and easy for dinner, we promise this recipe will be a new family favorite. We're making chicken parmesan meatballs, Yummy. courtesy of our friend Gabby Dalkin from What's Gabby Cooking? And she's just released her fourth what? cookbook. It's called Take It Easy. She's got a baby who's 16 months? A year and a half. Months. 20 months. 20 months. 20 months. Oh, very months. complicated. 20 months. Thank Bobby. you. She's got that lot. She's got, oh, very look yummy. Look at that beautiful thing. Her name is Poppy. What? Her yeah. name's Poppy. We I have two know. Poppies in the house. She's a real happy little munchkin. All right. Oh. Let's talk about this fourth cookbook is easy breezy. It's all about taking it yeah. easy, getting dinner on the table, friends mm -hmm. around the table, just like really good food that doesn't take a lot of Honestly, time. Honestly, when you're cooking for your family, you got to keep it easy. 100%. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just show Hoda's foot. All right. We're going to start with the bow. Okay, so these are chicken parmesan meatballs. Why do like you it's, always say that? Because <laughs> they are just, <laughs> would no. you not balls? say this? Balls. It's your favorite What are they? Balls. balls. They're Thank balls. You. Thank you. So this is chicken parm <laughs> in meatball form. So we've got ground chicken. You could do it with ground beef or anything. You're or just turkey. Or turkey. 100%. Okay. All your seasonings in okay. there. Some red pepper flakes. You want to throw that the egg in there? Does that make it too spicy for kids? I no? mean, you might want to tone it down. Poppy, I like give every spice. And she, like, oh, you really? Because you want her to be an eater. Yeah, I want her to be an eater. So like I give her everything. Yeah, parmesan and panko. So instead of like, to do this? Yeah, just go ahead and stir it so all together. So the raw egg is cool to stick in there. Obviously. Yeah, because and you don't want to beat it. Well, you can like get if you're not on live TV, you could get in there with your hands and like really mush it, mush up. it up and get it together. And okay. then once it's done, you're gonna like take a Wait, scoop look, of it. Oh, I see. Look what she did, J she JBH. It. She hollowed out the scoop. Yeah, and, now and you're gonna pop. Uh -huh. I know. And then I know. what? Now and what? And then you're, it with cheese. You would take your hands, your mold hands it all over. around it, and then you're just gonna put it out there. So look at these. So yeah. these have a mozzarella thing well, inside. Well, so this you then put on a little bit of flour, yeah. toss it around, and it goes right into oh, the hot okay, oil. Okay, now if you decide you don't want to fry it could you just like bake, bake it? it air fry it bake it whatever you want and like this you don't you could also skip the flour if you didn't yeah. want like so wait, the are crust. you frying it in literally almost no oil I know, it looks yeah like no you don't oil. need a lot because you're just gonna want to like you brown. want to brown on all the sides and then take it off let the oil kind of come okay. off for a second and then you're gonna nestle it in your Can favorite I ask tomato a question sauce. how do you Please. know that it's cooked all the way through so yeah, good question. you do like four or five minutes on each side flip it and then you can pop the whole thing into pop the oven the if you want to just to like to? finish you don't need to if it's cooked also <laughs> Like I open it and just look sometimes. Okay. The ice machine is going on. <laughs> there's something, yeah, there's some sort of. We weird thought it here. was a raccoon, but no. <laughs> I think it's the ice machine. No. I just open it. Let's right. Stop. Okay. okay. Now you're gonna make some pesto to go so with it. So this is a basil vinaigrette. It's one of my favorite things. It's like a condiment for my website that you put on every basil, basil vinaigrette. vinaigrette. I'm into this. Okay. So like what do you got in there? Shallots. So these are shallots and garlic that are in there. Go ahead and throw my, the basil. May I throw this in? Yes, basil. please. Okay. We're gonna put some olive oil in here, and this is one of those recipes you could mm, make now it, while like basil's basil. at the end of the season. And what's, what's this? Throw salt? some salt and pepper in there. And can I'll you do make the pepper. This for salads and stuff too? This basil? I use this for everything. everything. Salads, chicken, Chickens. this. You pop the so top yummy. on and then you're going to get this insane, beautiful green basil vinaigrette and just 
drizzle it on top, and if you wanted to add some shaved parm, you could. Yeah, add some shaved parm. Yeah, more is more. Okay. But like, Wait, I have a question. Does Poppy ask for this? Yeah, Poppy mm. loves I mean, the ball. I know she can't talk that well, she but loves she loves the ball. See? She loves mm. the ball, too. <laughs> um, by the way, you just like saying the word Poppy. No, I don't. Feel but like, look at that molten cheese in there. It's so yummy. Like, it's so Should the cheese fun. melt, or should Gobby. it just be kind of like... It doesn't matter. Like, it's going to be See, nice and warm, but, like, it's like flexible. Gobby, That's what matter. she says. Just make it. It's yeah. good and eat it. I'm going to make this recipe. You rock. Uh, you. you can check out Gobby's new cookbook. You can go to, to today.com slash books. And to get this recipe, go to today.com slash yeah, this food. is such a great recipe. Mm. Gobby, yeah. send your love yeah. to Poppy. I will. Did I? Love supporting local restaurants and our sponsor City is helping us do just that. When you spend five dollars or more dining out with your enrolled City credit card, one dollar will be donated to a great program, No Kid Hungry, until they reach one million dollars through December first. It's a great way to give local businesses a boost while also helping feed kids across the country. Yeah, and we asked one of our favorite local chefs who works closely with No Kid Hungry to join us this morning, Chef Dan Kluger. He's the chef and owner of three great New York City restaurants, including the recently opened Penny Bridge in Long Island Ooh. City, which is just right across right. the river right here. Right across the river. Beautiful. Super close. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, Good morning. I, know, I know No Kid Hungry is super important to yeah. you. This is a great initiative. I mean, getting kids food, that is important. Well, let's, oh, you're making steak this morning. So we're making morning, steak. Which makes so happy. You might help me. But, we're Chef, make we've a, talked a lot about the sauce. You're going to make yeah, the sauce. Okay. We're going to make the barbecue sauce. She's going to help. It's basically ketchup, Worcestershire, molasses, Tabasco, mustard, mm. and smoked paprika. Isn't there like a stigma about hard. putting a sauce, like the A1 on a steak, sort of is, is not great because if you have a good piece of meat? Yeah. That, that's the old thinking. It, it is. And I think, you know, the, the menu at Penny Bridge is really inspired by classics and comfort food and things that were important in my childhood. And some things are, like, best in class what they are, and then some are a variation. And this was, like, my father made meatloaf when I was young after he had a heart attack, and he put spinach in there to make it healthy, yep. but then covered it in bacon and sauce. <laughs> <laughs> right, I like that. Yeah, I love that. Oh, yeah. so you can we make use... your own sauce, no guilt. Exactly. Right, so we're going to do with the We're flays. doing filet mignon. Season it heavy. The, yeah. the two things I think a lot of home cooks don't do is they don't season well, and then when they put it in, they start moving around. Right. Just let it sit, let Set it develop it. that crust. Look, hold on, my natural. Professional. <laughs> And no. so we had these cooking for a little while. Who said like made the do. sauce? And then what you want to do is Are you cooking this whole meat on the, in the skillet right here? Yeah, but we're going to put it in a broiler. So basically... To, to finish it off because it's so thick? We want, we want to glaze this up. And we want to create a crust of the sauce. So okay. that's, that's like the, the component here. Mm -hmm. This little bit of bitterness, sweet, sour, crunch that you're going to get from the sauce. I made the sauce, Chef. Thank Very you. Nice. Okay. <laughs> Luckily, oh, you I don't need that one. Oh. <laughs> so this is kind of like a searing, saucing pro pro process to get the crust. And, yep. you, and you bake it off for how long? Then you put it in the broiler. I would say probably about eight minutes. I use a well, probe you just check it and then you're, you're not 
number. Leave oh. it at five degrees short. It'll rise a little bit. I go to about 125 to 130. That will take me to my mid-rear medium. After it sits for 10 perfect. minutes. Right. Exactly. What do you Let it rest. Then we have spinach. We're using some lardone, some bacon that we chopped up. Render that out. Oh, and then we're basically lardone. just going to throw all the spinach in. Yep. We want to start wilting that down. How is it, guys? It's yeah, great. It's so good. Mm -hmm. Should I turn yeah. these over or anything? Is sure. Okay. You and taste the sauce? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Carson, I'm like you. I'm a purist. No sauce. This sauce is incredible. Right. Mm. Yeah. It, 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 it makes sense. It helps level. the crust, too. Mm -hmm. So then we've, we've wilted the spinach down. <laughs> and then one of the things that I like to do is add a lot of herbs. So I'm adding oh. mint and dill to it, That's the what's spinach. In there. And so this is going to become the, the herbs are really Thank part you. of our vegetable. You got a fork over there? No one cares about the vegetable. Okay. This, is, this spinach is good. Mm -hmm. You like the spinach? It's great. Can you make this little Jeff, that's amazing. And then we, we finish it with some chips to give some texture mm -hmm. and a little more flavor. All right, I just need a fork. What's wow. your cut, Tom? I go ribeye, rib New York strip, strip, bone and strip. I don't do the filet enough, though. No. Every time I have it, it's, it's good. It's the best of both worlds. It's so good. Yeah. Chef, thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> food. Get the recipe. Wow. We appreciate it. I'm thrilled to say good morning to our next guest, finally, after all of those teases, the pioneer woman <laughs> herself. Reed Drummond has made it all the way from her ranch in Oklahoma. Are you near Blake's Ranch in Oklahoma? Not so much, Not so much but, right? you know, we're in the sta same state, yeah. so, you know, we, we know each other. When I was there marrying him and Gwen, I would have stopped by your ranch Seriously, instead of Seriously, like, next time. Or yes, your 25th wedding right. anniversary, I could have you, you renewed can... your vows. <laughs> oh, well, Reese also out with a brand new cookbook. It's called Super Easy. It features more than 100 mm. shortcut recipes, which we like the sound of that. Actually, lots been going on in the ranch in Oklahoma. You look absolutely stunning. You've got oh, a daughter who just got married, right? Yes. Hard to believe. Yeah, and you're ready to celebrate your 25th anniversary, and Carson's going to do your renew your vows for you. <laughs> that's that's hard be to believe too. I know. I'm only 29. I don't know how I can <laughs> get married. You for look 29. Years. What happened you to you? during COVID? All I did was eat and drink and not work out. Well, and listen, same. I I was wearing pandemic pants this time last year. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but. But, uh, yeah, I just, you know, the wedding was a great inspiration and motivation. But then once I started kind of uh, exercising more and getting healthier, it felt so good yeah. that I just kept going. So I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm over that hump. And now it's about just maintaining and, and yeah. enjoying. Well, I don't so. know if these delicious recipes are going to be uh, on any maintenance, but they are really smell good. Uh, speaking of my wellness journey, yes. let's eat some tots yes. Uh, yes. with cheese let's. all over them. So, yeah. It starts with chicken. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm going to make tachos. Now, do you know what tachos are, Carson? No. No idea. You need to know. So, like to know. tachos are just like nachos, but they're made with tots. Oh, Yum. Gosh. So, mm. I, baked, I baked some tots with a little we cumin and chili We have the gang eating powder, already. Oh, cook right. some chicken, add some celery. So, these are buffalo chicken tachos. Yum. Celery, garlic, and green onions. Did you make then, up tachos or is that a thing? I never heard of tachos. It's kind of a thing, but it hasn't okay. swept the nation yet. Yeah, it's going now to. Will. I'm yeah. kind of hoping. Uh, It'll but be trending by the end of the segment. You can put on nachos, you can put on tots okay. and call them tachos. So Love it. Then, of course, buffalo sauce, and then you just let oh. this simmer. Mm. I started Delicious. with raw no. chicken, but you can do rotisserie chicken to okay. make it easier. Yeah. Mm. So simmer that until it's luscious. Have you and changed saucy. what you cook now because of your sort of wellness journey? Is it? Is it Put you no. on a different path? Or you <laughs> no, and you know the thing is, is I have, I have teenage boys, college students, uh, lad, right. a, mm -hmm. ranchers, you know, yeah, cowboy, and so I have to make food that everybody loves. Right. And yeah. I don't, I'm not good when I deny myself, yeah. you know, whole Butter categories of food. So mm -hmm. I'm just kind of learning to eat. I like to say I eat a Rhode Island-sized piece of cake instead of a Texas-sized piece <laughs> right. of cake. That's the best way you get the flavors in the taste. How does that taste? It's delicious. Really good. So Everything's good. So, yeah. good. so yeah. you, you pull the tots out of the oven. Mm -hmm. They're seasoned, oh, so. so they're a little bit elevated. Mm -hmm. I kind of push them into a pile, yeah. pepper jack cheese yeah. all over. I okay. mean, this this is what life's all spice. about right oh, here. Oh, right here, yeah. And then you spoon the saucy chicken all oh, yeah. over. Mm -hmm. And so you can do ground beef that? and got some hit, you know right? black beans and do sort of. Is a the chicken mix. gonna because it's hot melt that cheese or are you putting this back in the no, oven? No, it's going back in the oven. Okay, yeah. I so because okay. you want to melt the cheese like uh, nachos. So all the cheese you want melt mine. Oh, here we go. That's delicious. Okay, yeah. Cheese. Actually, Pepper jack cheese, the yep. buffalo sauce. Mm. It's, it's hearty. It's, it's got a kick, huh. but oh jeez! Did you know redheads can tolerate uh, spicy food more than anybody really? else? Really? Is that true? Yeah. True? yeah so this is good. Is that true? You love it. That's we'll delve good. into the genealogy Chicken. of that some other time. But, wow. but basically, you garnish with uh, 
blue cheese, mm -hmm. and to make blue cheese dressing, I just take ranch dressing mm -hmm. and add blue cheese to it. Oh, wow. and oh clever. Wow. It's Another very shortcut. easy. You can Brilliant. do bottled ranch or you can make your own, but Brilliant. nice little shortcut. Mm -hmm. So this is what, uh, this is why my teenage boys love me. Oh, I can see I why. Mean, that is delicious. Hey, Carson. Really, yeah. really good. Hey, this is gone. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wham. What happened? What so is eating a whole bunt cake already? Oda, we have wow. not started the cake at, segment yet. Hey, take a breath. No one's missed these eating segments more than hosts. It's so good. Right. Remember, Rhode Island, not Texas. <laughs> She's going state by state. <laughs> All right, well, that does bring us to our chocolate cake. Now, this is your secret recipe, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. So, confession, my, my top secret ingredient in my top secret cake is dark chocolate cake mix. Oh, okay. And what? listen, I had my house full of humans during the pandemic and large six, you know, six foot five humans yeah. and football players. And I had... I was making so much food that I was about to lose my religion. I mean, <laughs> every day I was just like, I can't do it anymore. So I'm not afraid to whip out the chocolate cake. I doctored it with, uh, you know, bittersweet chocolate chips just to make it a little bit more uh, rich. Wow. But the thing is, this is the secret. It's a box cake. Well, it's what, oh. yeah. Okay. But the thing is, I'm topping it with ganache, oh, no. which is Ooh. heavy cream wow. and good oh, well, quality go. chips. Yeah. That's okay. all, two ingredients. Yes. And then it turns into this Here. luscious. Ooh. And are these oh, inside, too, or is this just like a topping this thing becomes, situation? So, well, you can just eat one if you like. So you just made, okay, yeah. So you made the, the we cake. We gotta go. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, I really wanted to understand this. And then drizzle. Drizzle. Uh, I do sprinkles on top, <laughs> but after Halloween, you can take Beautiful leftover cake. candy, chop it, it up, on and top. put it on top. So oh, yeah. Oh, my God. Happy plate. Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. Hoda, show it. Clean Literally. plate club. Clean plate club. Clean plate club. <laughs> you left a hand. She's going to eat out. And also, she's going to move in with you. And she's she's giggling. She's giggling a lot over there. Congratulations on everything. Congrats. Love your show. Thank yes, you great. guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, of course, you can find all these recipes at today.com slash food and pick up a copy of Super Easy at today.com slash shop. to find an air fryer under the tree this Christmas or you still haven't pulled it out of the box from last year. We know who you are. Yeah. Anyway, we've got a recipe just for you. Gina Homoka is the New York Times best-selling author and founder of the award-winning blog Skinny Taste. Mm. And this dish comes straight from her new cookbook. It's called Skinny Taste Air Fryer Dinners. Gina, we need this. Yeah. Uh, by the so, way, I love the idea that you can use an air fryer and it's still, you can make it in a healthy way and it's delicious for exactly. you. Exactly. And we are making chicken saute lettuce wraps. 
So Yum. here's Yum. a dish that my family loves. And and why like why is the air fryer better? Just yeah. it just the basics. So fast. Yeah. You, cook, you don't have to preheat it. It's so convenient. And if you're frying, it's just so much healthier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. So we're making this and chicken. What, what do we kind need? of chicken do you do you like to use? What part of the chicken? Well, today we're going to use chicken breast, but I also like chicken thighs. Yeah. Chicken breast here works great because uh, there's coconut milk in the marinade, so um, we're adding some fat to it. So it's okay. got lots of flavor. Okay. Coconut so, milk. That's great for hot. Yeah. So what should we do? Mm -hmm. So let's start with the marinade. Do you want to give me? You want to help? Sure. I'll pour in the All right. coconut Perfect. milk. Perfect. So we got See, some coconut milk. I'll help with the onions. Great. Some shallots. Okay. Oh, shallots, of course. We have some soy sauce or gluten-free tamari. Okay. Mm -hmm. And this is some fish sauce. Fish sauce. That's good. And mm -hmm. what's this? Turmeric. Curry powder. Oh, curry. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. fresh shallots. Fresh shallots. I'm sorry. Some fresh ginger. Ginger. And we need a little spoon. Yeah. And, what's and some this? kosher salt. The whole thing. The whole thing. Okay. So we're gonna mix this all together. Okay. And then this gets poured right over the chicken. How long do you leave it in the fridge? So we could marinate this for about 30 minutes, okay. or as long as overnight. So the longer it marinates, the lo more flavor it has. But okay. it's honestly really great in 30 minutes. Okay, okay. So half hour later, you take your chicken out, yep. and now it's time to get to work. So. Okay. So then we put our chicken in the air fryer, and whenever you use the air fryer, you always want to keep your food in a single layer because you want to keep the airflow. Ah. That's what makes it brown and crisp. Oh. Okay. Don't pile it up. Exactly. Okay. Okay. And, and you don't need oil, right? Well, you could spritz a little olive oil, but for yeah. this recipe, you don't. Um, sometimes okay. you do it just so it doesn't stick. Okay, so and you, you of course, lay that out. 400 degrees for about nine minutes, and nine you always minutes. want to turn your food halfway because the heating element is at okay. the top. Okay. Okay. And then we make a glaze, right? Okay. So this is the peanut sauce. Okay. Peanut okay. butter. Yep. So we got some creamy peanut butter, some warm water, yeah. enough, enough to make it drizzleable. Oh. And then we got some lime juice. Okay. Yum. Some sriracha. I love peanut sauce, by Me the way. Me too. A little sriracha. I want to eat peanut and sauce egg. with exactly. a spoon. Yeah. And then some fresh ginger and a little more tamari or soy Here sauce. Go. Here's a little baby Thank spoon. Thank you. You so, can tell I couldn't quite get that. <laughs> so we're just going to mix this until it is... You didn't. You weren't supposed to add all the water, oh, but it's oh, okay. It's a drizzle. <laughs> but oh, luckily so it, we oh, have. So it, oh, it comes like this texture. Yeah. Exactly. Just Sorry, enough. Little. I mess up every dish. <laughs> just enough to make it drizzable. Okay. So now we're gonna make oh, our lettuce wraps. Okay. Okay. And these are so easy. And so yeah. much fun okay. actually so for you kids. Want to come in the middle? I'll go in the middle. Yeah. So layer. Start layering your chicken on top. Mm-hmm. And then some more fresh shallots. And what about cilantro? Yeah. Cilantro, love. Mm-hmm. And then. You yeah. got some limes on the side. And then you just put this on some top. shallots. Oh, do you squeeze lime on it or not you really? Could, yep, exactly. I like lime. Um, and you use just like store-bought peanut butter, anything, this right? This is yeah. regular Skippy yeah. or yeah. creamy yeah, peanut butter. Drizzle the peanut sauce on top. And Wrap it up. There you go. Mm. This is also, if you want to turn this into a more substantial dish, you could also have it on rice or... Mm. So good, right? So good. Mm. So much flavor. Oh, my God. Mm. Really good, thank you. It is so delicious. Thank you, Gina, for this My recipe. Pleasure. Mm. Head to day.com slash food and check out Gina's book. It's a good gift. Just head to day.com slash shop. <laughs>
Hey guys, today is National Picnic Day and things are about to get interesting. We are making two vibrant and flavorful sides and we're starting with a roasted sweet potato salad without a drop of mayo. Here, I'm combining three vegetables that go together perfectly. I got four sweet potatoes, one Vidalia onion, and six carrots. Everything is cut up into bite-sized pieces. And when you roast carrots in the oven, they caramelize and become so soft and they have a similar texture and taste to sweet potatoes. So when you're eating your potato salad, all you're gonna taste is creamy deliciousness. I'm tossing my veggies with a little extra virgin olive oil. Now I'm gonna season them up. So I'm adding in smoky paprika, some dried oregano, salt and pepper, and a little bit of cayenne to bump up the heat. I'm gonna lay them out on a baking sheet, give them a mist of oil spray, and I'm gonna pop them in the oven, set at 400 for about 30 minutes. So you can see that the veggies are perfectly for tender. I'm gonna transfer all of the yummy roasted vegetables into my bowl. Add your red wine vinegar and your extra virgin olive oil and gently stir it. Pop it in the fridge for at least an hour to chill and then it's ready to be packed up and taken to an awesome sunny picnic. And one more thing, I garnish it with some scallions for a pop of color and some granola for extra deliciousness. It's creamy, it's crunchy. This is most definitely feel good comfort food. Next up, an out of the box coleslaw made with mango and cashews. In a large mixing bowl, you're gonna combine a 14 to 16 ounce bag of pre-shredded coleslaw mix, some shredded purple cabbage, some thinly sliced red onion, and some shredded carrot. These are two peeled and julienned mangoes. You can also use frozen mango chunks. Just let them thaw and you can chop them up into small little cubes. We're gonna mix this all together and you can see how colorful and nutrient packed this is. And we are ready to dress it. First, I'm adding four tablespoons of lime juice, four tablespoons of low sodium soy sauce, into four tablespoons of rice wine vinegar. And I'm gonna mix it up and pour it right into the bowl. Go ahead and toss it. Right before you're ready to serve, you wanna sprinkle in roughly chopped toasted cashews. This really takes it to the next level. And there you have it, two yummy side dishes loaded with health perks and fit for a picnic. Mm. Now I want a picnic. I know. Can we hey, do boo -boo. this? I'll I do a like third enjoy, hour picnic. And Joy can pack the basket. At a That's picnic right. basket. <laughs> you can find these recipes at today.com slash food. The Today Show's newest fan. What an hour What am I doing here? NBC's Morgan Radford is here with us. Good to have you live in 1A Morgan. Thank Good you. to see you. I'm so excited to be back and to see you all. So Juneteenth has always honored freedom, unity, and history. And part of that is celebrated through tradition, storytelling, and food. That's why one chef from Wisconsin decided that this Juneteenth, she was going to do something special and fulfill a promise made more than a century ago. <laughs> bye. 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 A big idea finally come to light. How does this feel? I mean, just a year ago, this was all just a dream. Yeah, it's very surreal that, you know, th this is mine. <laughs> but, you know, like, I mean, this, this is, is your corn. Yeah. Here on 39 acres of land in St. Helena, South Carolina, Chef Adrian Lipscomb is creating a sanctuary for black farmers. The welcoming center. Yeah. It's over there. Right. Where they can grow okay. their own produce and learn about the history of an industry that currently is less than 2% black. 
We were cooking as slaves, as the cooks in these kitchens. We want to recreate those kitchens. We want to celebrate, but also explain to others and to the public. We want the community to come to this land. We want them to be able to come celebrate on this land. Opening up a new world of possibility that all started with a mystery check in the mail for $100. So you did not know personally no. the person who put this check in the mail to you? No, no. Didn't know this person. Her project is called 40 Acres and a Mule, a reference to the short-lived attempt at reparations that gave former slaves land after the Civil War, only to be rescinded after Lincoln's assassination. It started with the special field order number 15 by General Sherman to give 40 acres and a mule to the slaves that were released from the Civil War that were following him. And the question he asked is, what do you want? And one of them stood up and said, land. How does Juneteenth and the significance of Juneteenth for you connect to this project? Juneteenth has always been celebrated with me and my family. 1865 is just a, a significant year. You already have freed slaves in January of 1865, but you still don't have the free slaves of Texas, not until June 18th of 1865. By the next day, they're celebrating and they're saying, we are free, we can celebrate. And what is so interesting is that slaves weren't allowed to be in big groups. So a lot of those leaders came together and they bought land where they would go and celebrate Juneteenth. And food was a huge portion of this. The celebration um, of freedom. The celebration of freedom, you're right. Which is why Lipscomb, a mother of four who owns Uptown Cafe and Bakery in La Crosse, Wisconsin, decided to start her project here in South Carolina. A lot of history right there a land. Uh, slaves were here. Slaves were here. With deep roots and African ancestry. Land is huge. Land brings identity. Land brings community. Land brings freedom. It allows us to navigate in this world, to create our history, to respect our history, but also bring forth our future. Lipscomb was able to raise more than $150,000 in less than a year through a GoFundMe page and with the support of celebrity chefs like Mashama Bailey and David Thomas. As an African-American chef, I am really interested in reclaiming the narrative where, where the food of this country started. Together, they're fixing up something special ahead of this Juneteenth, celebrating on their land in the best way they know how. Some of the best chefs in America yeah. are around this table helping one entrepreneur fulfill a promise from generations ago. Left the hands and made this food. <laughs> for generations to come. Amen. And this is just the beginning. Adrian hopes that by next year, the land will actually host an archive of black farming traditions, three kitchens that represent the African ancestral contributions to cooking, and produce farms for black farmers. So her hope is really to create a safe space for them to grow, to cook, and sustain their own produce, while also learning about its history and where those food and food ways yeah. come from. The craft beer industry has exploded in recent years, becoming a nearly $30 billion industry. And now, emerging from the pandemic, many specialty breweries are flourishing, with Black-owned establishments in particular gaining a lot of momentum. While they make up less than 1% of the more than 8,000 in the United States, more Black brewers are now starting to open sites. In fact, I recently stopped by the only one here in New York that brews on-site for some beer and the side of... South Carolina home cooking and some conversation. If somebody's putting their true passion and their true love into it, that's a good beer. By that definition, Chris Gansey has been making good beer for a yes, decade. Gansey is the owner of Daleview Biscuits and Beer, the only black-owned brewery that brews on site in all of New York State. And that happens in these tanks below a kitchen that's very busy serving up biscuits and fried chicken by way of somewhere very special to both of us our mutual hometown of Columbia, South Carolina. Where'd you go to middle school? Um, Gibbs. Oh yeah, we used to play you guys in basketball. We used to beat Gibbs all the time. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> Gansey says he didn't even drink beer until his wife gave him a small home brewing kit 10 years ago for Father's Day. Being from Columbia, South Carolina as well, I know, especially in the summertime, cookouts are big. Yes. You mean to tell me back then you weren't like drinking tall boy beers? 
No. <laughs> I was not drinking beer at all. But three years ago, that hobby evolved into a business. How did you get from those home brewing kits to the owner of quite the establishment? People that believed in me. I had my wife and some close friends who believed in the, in the vision and kind of pushed me forward. It's like, you, you can do this. Why not spread the joy? Now he's turning out craft beer and Carolina biscuits in the heart of Lefferts Garden, Brooklyn. Intentionally choosing a historically black neighborhood to help integrate an industry with little diversity. I wanted a place where I could be part of the community and also do a place to educate people around craft beer. Like, I feel a cold beer is something that can bring people together. Out of the roughly 8,500 breweries in America, just about 60 are black owned. My hope is we can help change mindsets in the neighborhood because the neighborhood is changing and in creating and unity and, and um, equity. So that's my goal to help create equity in this community. Gansey is striving for more than exposure and equity, but for a few teaching moments as well. Dale View's beers are named after lesser known civil rights leaders like Jamaican activist Paul Bogle and freedom rider Diane Nash. These are the last three in existence. We sold out of the sold out of yes. Diane Nash. It's a beautiful label. And I love that on the back you actually explain for folks who might be unfamiliar. Even better than the label is what's inside them. I'm not used to learning and drinking at the same time. <laughs> this is a novel concept. Oh, it's not just beer? No, it's also biscuits. Wow. And let me tell you, a lot of folks won't recognize this, but that's pimento cheese. What, what you know about pimento cheese? That's yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. I grew up. I had pimento cheese three times a day. My grandma would say, y'all put your foot in that. That is fantastic. Chicken thigh. Of course. Yeah. Now I said, oh boy. <laughs> Al oh, Roker's gonna love this. A taste of South Carolina, now educating Brooklyn beer drinkers, all thanks to a thoughtful present. Had your wife decided to give you a tie for Father's Day. That'd probably be a tie maker. <laughs> <laughs>you met a chef here in New York who's breaking barriers in the restaurant world. Yeah, his name's Charlie Mitchell. He became the first black chef in this city's history to earn a prestigious Michelin star. And he's only the second black chef nationwide to earn the accolade. I stopped by Clover Hill, his restaurant in Brooklyn, to talk about that achievement. And also, of course, to try some of that gourmet food that's made him a groundbreaker. The chef behind this popular Brooklyn restaurant is now being celebrated for more than fine dining. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City to be awarded a Michelin star and just the second black executive chef in the country to achieve that honor. I wanted to always, you know, plant my feet here and be a serious New York City chef, so that was always a goal of mine. And look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> Dreams come true. Yeah. Mitchell was born and raised in Detroit and developed a passion for food and cooking from his grandmother. I think the thing that stuck with me the most is like she used to like this like whole fry fish, like whole fry bass all the time when I was younger, and I think that stood out the most. Head on? 
Always. Oh. <laughs> he attended culinary school for a few months, but preferred on-the-job training instead. I ended up like Googling restaurants in the metro area, got my first real job, and in that kitchen is where I was like, wow, like I love the way they work. I love how professional it is. Like I'm using ingredients I've never had, never learned about. Years of experience in world-class restaurants like 11 Madison Park eventually led him to this quiet street in Brooklyn Heights. When Clover Hill opened one year ago, he became its executive chef in charge of creating the menu. Mitchell's team plates an eight-course tasting menu that regularly changes with the best seasonal foods available. I guess it's challenging, but we're always changing something or we're always trying to make the dish the best version of itself, right? So we may tweak it every day for two weeks straight if we have to, to get it to be like a perfect dish. That quest for perfection did not go unnoticed. When Michelin announced it starred restaurants in October, not only did Clover Hill earn a star in its first year, but Chef Mitchell picked up the award for best young chef. That was a complete surprise when they announced that, and I was just humbled, you know? Were you aware at the time of the historic implications? I was not, not at the time. You always think so many people have come before you, you just assume that someone has already done this, you know? You just, this doesn't cross your mind that you may be the first or second to do really anything. Especially here in New York City. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there aren't more people who look like us as executive chefs in fine dining restaurants like this? You don't make a lot of money as a young cook, you know? So I think a lot of times we're like chasing a very different American dream than to kind of put up with these aggressive environments that are often led by people who don't look like us. I tasted some of the iconic dishes that earned this unique place in the food world. I'm gonna come around and try this here, although it's almost too pretty pretty to touch, <laughs> including a shark fin flounder and a spicy tapioca. Yeah, but this is nice, and it's subtle. And it's a Japanese mackerel. We dry age it, we hang it a little bit, and then we finish it in a little bit of beeswax so that it retains moisture. When people leave your restaurant, what, what do you want them to, to take away? I want them to kind of be you know excited or inspired about food. You know, like that's something that is very important to us. Her name is Opal Lee. She is the grandmother of Juneteenth. Opal, she's an activist and community leader, and at 95 years old, it's proof it's never too late to create change. I refer to myself as a little lady in tennis shoes who gets in everybody else's business and has a damn good time doing it. That's Opal Lee, better known around Fort Worth, Texas, as Miss Opal. I'll see you. Okay. But around the nation, she's recognized as a Nobel Peace Prize nominated activist and leader. If you want something, you just have to go after it. Born in 1926 in Marshall, Texas, some of Ms. Opal's fondest early memories are celebrating Juneteenth, the emancipation of enslaved people in the United States. I had beautiful Juneteenth experiences when I was small. We'd go to the fairground and we'd have music and speeches and food and ball games and food and food and food. Juneteenth combines the words June and 19th and marks the anniversary of the 1865 date, the last of the enslaved received the word they were free. Freedom is for everybody. And we're not free until we are all free. At age 89, Ms. Opal took on freedom as her cause, fighting for Juneteenth to become a federal holiday. She began Opal's walk to D.C., culminating in a 1,400-mile trek to the nation's capital. Do you know we took a million 500,000 signatures to Congress when we got the call to go to the White House? We could turn this country around. And on June 16th of 2021, Ms. Opal stood next to President Biden as he signed a bill establishing a federal holiday for Juneteenth. I still pinch myself. It was fabulous. I wanted to do a holy dance, but my kids say when I do that, I'm twerking. So. 
While that legislation is what Ms. Opal is most widely known for, she's been quietly creating change in Texas for years, starting with her time as a teacher. It was my responsibility to see that kids were in school. So if he needed some shoes, I bought shoes, or clothes, or food. And when I retired, that followed me. People still needed a place to live. They still needed food. And so I joined a, a food bank. What started in Ms. Opal's kitchen grew into a community food bank, which now resides in a 39,000 square foot warehouse. Each day, it provides 600 members of the community with access to fresh food, household products, and pet supplies. We get chicken, ground beef, a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits that's much needed. This have impacted the community for many, many years, and without it, I just don't know what we would do. Ms. Opal's impact goes beyond the food bank. Opal's farm is a five-acre urban farm in Fort Worth, Texas. We expect to feed about 25,000 people this season. Ms. Opal's work on behalf of her community and her nation continues to inspire those around her, including her own family. Well, I'll put it to you this way. I am the granddaughter of the grandmother of Juneteenth. I would even venture to say that she's the grandmother to the nation. When you think about having lived 95 and seen the depression and seen um, the civil rights movement and, and then to, to see the Black Lives Matter movement now, to see the first African American president, when you've got that kind of span, you develop some perspective that's unique and I think that She's really good at expressing it. Creating a legacy of activism, tenacity, and the courage to fight for freedom. The fact that all these things I see need to be done, if they were done, I'd stop. But until then, I'm gonna keep on walking and keep on talking and hoping somebody will listen. Oh. We're listening and we are honored, honored to have Miss Opal Lee and her granddaughter, Dion Sims, who's the founding executive director of the National Juneteenth Museum, joining us from Fort, oh. Fort Worth, Texas. Miss Opal, I can't tell you what a thrill it is for you to see you on our air this morning. So many people are, they have this day off and they're maybe watching this show and they're saying, how should I spend this special day? What would your advice be, Miss Opal, for how people should spend this Juneteenth? I think they should spend uh, the special day helping somebody else. Oh. I find that when I help somebody else, all my problems seem to disappear. Now, I don't want you to think that they go into thin air, but when I'm helping somebody else, I get help for myself too. Oh. So I'm going to advise them, help somebody else. Yeah. Ms. Opal, you, you've inspired us beyond. Dion, I know that the woman sitting next mm -hmm. to you must mean everything, the world to you. What have you learned from her? Because you, I see that your life is dedicated to service too. And, and that's really what has happened. I've learned from her that, you know, you give of yourself, um, sometimes maybe even to your own hurt, but it's always in betterment of somebody else.
Now to our ongoing series, Changemakers, in honor of Black History Month. There's a new magazine looking to shake up the culinary world. For years, you may have seen some of the same faces on TV and in magazines, but you're about to meet a woman who is looking to add some new perspectives to the food picture. Take a look. It's the first of its kind, For the Culture, a new magazine celebrating black women in food and wine and written, photographed, and illustrated all by black women. It's yeah, the brainchild of Clancy Miller, a pastry okay. chef turned food writer. I worked in Paris at a bakery and a restaurant and I loved it, but I also realized that I wanted to work outside of the restaurant. So from working in kitchens to writing about food, when it comes to food and wine and beautiful cookbooks, there's certainly no shortage. So what made you decide that it's time for something a little bit different? I've never seen a lot of focus on black people in general, but specifically black women. And I truly believe that black women are the architects of kitchens and cuisines in this country throughout history and in many countries throughout the world. So I wanted to create a publication that would center our experiences, our expertise, and our voices in relationship to food and wine. Inspired by a famous writer, she went to work. There's a quote that Toni Morrison has said, which is, if there is a book that you want to read, write it. Ooh. And so this is a magazine, but I felt like this is something I want to read. And that was just the beginning. Clancy launched a crowdfunding campaign a little over a year ago and sought submissions. That was enough to begin putting pen to paper. 35 women contributed to the first issue. Gracing the cover, culinary historian, cookbook author, and college professor, Jessica B. Harris. I want people to feel inspired to learn something more about a person they didn't know about before. If you have never made a Somalian meal, I hope you'll try one of the recipes. So I want people to feel like their curiosity is being sated. In celebration of the magazine's release, we toasted three women profiled in the issue. Angela Davis, also known as The Kitchenista, is a home cook and an eight-year food blogger of The Kitchenista Diaries. Mashama Bailey is an award-winning executive chef and partner of The Gray Restaurant and The Gray Market in Savannah, Georgia. And Krista Scruggs is a Vermont farmer, winemaker, and business owner of Zaffa Wines, who provided a little tasting event for us. <laughs> Krista, what do you think about this magazine? It is finally having, a, having space and holding space when everyone else has but us, or that we've got to fight harder to have our voices heard. Mashama, to bring us behind the scenes to be a woman of color um, in the food and wine space. I do think that it's lonely. You know, I don't think that there are many of us. And it's really um, been an eye-opening journey to meet people. Angela, what would you want people to know? My daughter's six and to flip through this magazine and it was just picture after picture of black and brown women and food and it's all about us. I'm looking at our boxes. We're all in different places right now. One thing is for sure, food and wine and culture, it all, it connects us, doesn't it? Yeah. We're here Aww. celebrating our stories, celebrating each other. Congratulations, and here's too many more.
June 19th, 1865 is the day that more than 200,000 black Texans found out they were free yes. two years after the Emancipation of Proclamation. And these recipes are an homage to that. 100%. So what are we starting with first? So we are starting today with the Victory Chicken Burger. Right. This is Ooh. a burger that I made inspired by historically black colleges and universities. You know this is the time of year when everyone is graduating yes. and you see all the photos and mm -hmm. now they have a burger to make. And you went to an HBCU. Clark I did. Atlanta. I graduated from Clark Atlanta. So listen, this Chicken salt mm -hmm. is a must. This mm, celery, okay. cumin, okay. onion powder, okay. you mix it all in if you can mix it in for all me. Those in there. All yeah. Right. And, and you know, in black American culture, mm. so many salts and sauces are passed on oh, from generation yes. to generation. So this is a chicken salt that I'm 100% passing along to okay. my Okay. <laughs> What's the verdict over there? Look at incredible. Oh, yeah. Come on. They're loving it. Okay. Oh, they're loving it. We like to hear so, that. So, chicken burger. I approach my chicken burger just like meatloaf. Okay. Egg. So we're gonna put some egg, egg right first. in there. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Um, mm, let me tell you, the secret sauce really is the sherry vinegar. You're you're gonna do the sherry, sherry vinegar. Sherry vinegar. Oh, sherry vinegar. Right, we yep. got about two minutes left here. Breadcrumbs. Breadcrumbs. All right. And then you mix that all together, and then nice firm patty. Okay. In how, the refrigerator overnight, if you can. Oh, that's oh, that might be yep. the, that's yep. the secret. Yep. How long on each side, roughly? Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you need about four minutes on each side. Okay. You bring it to the bun and dress it. Okay. White cheddar cheese is great. Tomato. Mm. And lettuce Pickles. and pickle. I want to yes. make sure we get to this There's corn no, salad. Right. This is the most salad. important thing. This is my right. favorite one. Listen, growing up, I know you're from the South. I am. I remember shucking corn oh yeah oh my gosh yes rubbing the silk oh yeah and so i brought some of that corn this magic into job. this corn, corn salad magic. i love you that. like that yeah <laughs> corn green beans southern peas if you can find them. We, were, we were trying to identify we're like quinoa what is it? no so southern good. peas um, and you mix it all together. And just mix it all together. All together in the bowl, and you have this beautiful mm. summer corn, green beans. What's the dressing? Salad. It tastes delicious. And last but like not least, the showstopper for Juneteenth, yeah. the Devil's Food Ice Box Cake. Ice it box is cake. Oh my so God. No bacon. No bacon. No bacon. You do not have to turn your oven on. Cream, mm. chocolate wafers, and pecans. Oh my God. Nicole. It's so, crazy. Nicole, oh thank God. you. Thank you for this. In the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, black-owned restaurants weren't just places to get a meal, several becoming crucial meeting spots for activists at the forefront of the civil rights movement. And the families still operating these restaurants today are committed to honoring their historic legacies. It's time to head out of Studio 1A and hit the road for a new kind of culinary adventure. Follow me as I taste some of the most iconic foods around the country and meet the families behind them. Together, we're gonna learn how a good meal has the power to connect us to our past, our future, and each other. We're in Harlem, the epicenter of black culture in the United States. Now, many historians agree the Harlem Renaissance paved the way for the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. So in this episode, we're traveling across the country to explore three legendary black-owned restaurants. For generations, these beloved eateries have been serving up dishes to historic figures and those fighting for change. First up, we're heading south to visit an iconic establishment that defied segregation laws. New Orleans, a city that celebrates food, music, nightlife, and history. In the Big Easy, you'll find many historic sites that played a vital role in the civil rights movement, like William Franz Elementary School, where six-year-old Ruby Bridges broke barriers in 1960, or New Zion Baptist Church, a hub for activists, and Treme, one of the oldest black neighborhoods in America. Here, you'll find the only restaurant on the U.S. Civil Rights Trail. Dickie Chase Restaurant definitely is a historical landmark institution here in New Orleans. This popular eatery is a living testament to a woman who changed the face of fine dining in America, Chef Leah Chase. I'm Stella Chase Reese, and I am the president of the corporation here at Dickie Chase's. And I'm Edgar Duke Chase IV, and I'm the executive chef here at Dickie Chase Restaurant. Stella's grandparents first opened Dookie Chase's as a po'boy shop. 
becoming a full-service restaurant in 1941. African Americans didn't have that place to celebrate, to celebrate birthdays, to celebrate promotions, to celebrate good grades, weddings, proms. So they opened up a place where that could happen. But the next generation had a new vision for the eatery. It was my father, Edgar Chase Jr., and his wife, Leah Lane's Chase, that continued the legacy that my grandparents started. Dookie Chase Jr. was an avid jazz musician who promoted some of America's first integrated concerts. His friendship with all the musicians, Ray Charles and Duke Ellington and Sarah Vaughan, we would hear stories of them after their performance coming here to dine at Dookie Chase. And Leah was determined to bring an elevated dining experience for her black patrons. She wanted the best china, she wanted linens, she wanted them to be served the best they could be served because she didn't want our community to be deprived of anything else than any other community had. That community was on the brink of a revolution years in the making. Post-1865 and the Emancipation Proclamation, with the masses of African American people now free, the country was overwhelmed. Hierarchies needed to be reestablished. It was important from a white supremacist point of view that black folks knew their place. By the late 19th century, Jim Crow laws legalizing racial segregation in the former Confederate states. Those laws were further cemented by the Supreme Court case Plessy versus Ferguson, which upheld the separate but equal doctrine. But Dookie Chases defied those laws, welcoming patrons of all races to dine and discuss political issues facing the black community. Their willingness and, and openness to everyone in the community made them a hub of safety, made them a hub of belonging. But that openness also made the Chase family a target. There were times that we had people throw things in and try to, you know, destroy the peace. But that didn't frighten my parents. They continued because they know what they were doing was the correct thing to do. By the 1960s, Dookie Chases had become a go-to spot where activists could connect and strategize. We had the opportunity to serve many of our civil rights leaders, Martin Luther King, Jesse Jackson, Rosa Parks, Thurgood Marshall. The list goes on and on. And then Freedom Bus Riders, they came here. My parents realized that until we all learn to enjoy life together and get to that part where social justice would be for everyone, that this community or any other community in our country would not grow and will not be better. In the 1970s, Leah becoming passionate about promoting black artists. Her love of art was also celebrated here at Dookie Chase's when she gave African-American artists the opportunity to actually display their art on her wall because at the time they had no place to display their art. Her extraordinary life even becoming the inspiration for Disney's first black princess, Tiana. It meant a lot for her because she did have some of the kids dress up and come here. Leah Chase, the queen of Creole cuisine, passing away on June 1st, 2019. But her spirit and her culinary traditions are in vigilant and capable hands. This is Leah Chase's kitchen. It's set up the same way and we love it like that because as you know, she's still with us. She's still watching us. Chef Duke continues to serve Creole cuisine that's been on the menu for decades. From red beans and rice to shrimp clemenceau and the famous chicken a la Duke. But the restaurant's most popular dish, gumbo. You think back to the civil rights era when we had leaders strategizing in our upstairs dining room. We fed them gumbo. You think about presidents today, President Barack Obama, President George Bush came here. We always started them with gumbo because my grandmother always believed that her gumbo will solve any problems. And we like to say her gumbo changed the course of America. Gumbo, an official state food of Louisiana. Dookie Chase's version has a little something for everyone. Not one, but two types of sausage. Some Louisiana blue crab. What we do here is we take the top shell off, we clean it up, and we just crack it in half, release some of those flavors. Chicken and shrimp, 
This is really coming out to be a beautiful gumbo. The gumbo simmering until it's ready to serve. I mean, if you just smell this, the neighborhood smelling this, everybody knows when Dookie Chase is cooking gumbo. Today, the Chase empire is expanding. Chef Duke just opened the family's newest restaurant, Chapter 4. Being a fourth generation African-American restaurant tour is huge. Many generations now working side by side. Being around my family, all day, that's the biggest blessing. I'm so grateful that I get to work with all my family and it's such a joy. And that joy, best expressed over great food. Hello, family. Hey, yes. Enjoying everything. We it's are enjoying everything. everything. What's the song that Rachel? I'm going down to Dookie Chase to, to get, get myself my some gumbo. When, when the service is right, they treat, treat you nice. nice. The whole restaurant, Dookie Chase's, is a, is a gift to the family that was given by my great grandparents. And so we want to make sure that, you know, the restaurant sustains that legacy and all the traditions. Leah Chase said, Food bills, big bridges. If you can eat with someone, you can learn from them. And when you learn from someone, you can make big changes. We can change the course of America in this restaurant over a bowl of gumbo. We can talk to each other and relate to each other. When we eat together. A trip to Harlem just wouldn't be complete without a meal here at Sylvia's Restaurant. This neighborhood institution has been serving up soul food since 1962. And what started as a small luncheonette has now become a family empire, beloved by tourists, locals, and plenty of famous faces. The cornbread was sweet, it was warm, and it just reminded me of home. It took me back to my grandmother's cooking, so I really enjoyed it. What brought me here today was that I was hungry and wanted some good soul food. So where do you go in Harlem? Sylvia's. Soul food is the cultural identity marker that really surmises our journey as a people living in America. Trinesse Woods Black is the granddaughter of the legendary queen of soul food, Sylvia Woods. Sylvia grew up in Hemingway, South Carolina, where she met her love, Herbert Woods, when they were 11 and 12. They fell in love picking beans after school. But this entrepreneur-to-be wasn't content with life on the farm. My grandmother, um, she came to New York when she was 16. She knew that this was a place that was more palatable for African Americans to like really live. Sylvia and Herbert were among the estimated six million African Americans who left the Jim Crow South during the Great Migration. They had came, you know, north to escape all of the atrocities that were happening and to really be in control of their lives. If you were black, you know, Harlem was the place to be. Sylvia finding work at a diner 
Johnson's luncheonette, which she eventually purchased from the owner with a loan from her mom. Mr. Johnson knew that my grandmother would make it. And on August 1st, 1962, Sylvia's restaurant was born. As the cultural center of black America, Harlem became a crucial site for demonstrations and organizing by leaders like Martin Luther King Jr. and Malcolm X, according to Professor Psyche Williams Forson. The heart of civil rights is America because it wasn't limited to one, one area. Though folks were in the North, they still experienced poverty and inequality and voter suppression and homelessness. Sylvia made the restaurant a welcoming place for activists. She played her role as ensuring that the community leaders had a place to, to meet and to commune and to strategize. Everyone dined at Sylvia's, Dizzy Gillespie, Ozzy Davis, Ruby Dee. You know, these are actors and actresses that were on the front line. By the 1960s, the movement had achieved major gains, like the historic Brown versus Board of Education and successful boycotts. But racial discrimination and police brutality against black Americans persisted, resulting in deadly riots throughout the decade. Two devastating events just four years apart sparked destructive riots throughout Harlem. But Sylvia's was always spared. Harlem was on fire, and my grandmother kept the restaurant open because the grocery stores were not open. Nothing was open. You know, people couldn't feed their kids. And she was in that kitchen making food so that this community would have something to eat. This strong connection with Harlemites has continued for decades. We have guests that eat with us every single day. And sometimes we have people that eat with us multiple times a day. Coming up, I learned the secret to Sylvia's famous fried chicken. Sylvia's in Harlem has been serving up soul food since 1962. And this native New Yorker couldn't wait to get back into their historic dining room. <laughs> oh, wow. it's, it's so, so good, good to, to see, see you. It's been, you. So long. It's been mm. way too long. I've missed you. I've missed you too. But you know what? The good thing about Sylvia's is it's like I saw you yesterday. It's coming home. It's coming it's home. It's coming home. The dining room walls showcasing famous faces and political figures along with treasured memories. This picture 
is one of my grandmother's favorites. This was when Winnie and Nelson Mandela came to New York when he was freed. Eating here has become a rite of passage for many candidates. And there's a young man, I don't know whatever happened to this guy. You know, I think he might have turned out okay. I, I think, think so. He, yeah. After a meal here, After yeah. This is what sent him on his path. That's right. It's the, it was the chicken. It was the chicken. <laughs> but the heart of Sylvia's is Harlem. Triness and her family have worked hard to stay active in the neighborhood, from funding college scholarships for local teens to supporting Black Lives Matter events. What is it about this restaurant that keeps people coming back? Authenticity. Authenticity times love. Sylvia's, when you come to Sylvia's, you know what you're going to get. You're going to get some good food that's going to make you feel warm. Today, over a dozen family members help run Sylvia's empire, which includes a catering business and a successful food product line. What's it like working with family? Because I know your brother Marcus, yes. your baby brother Marcus, my baby brother. is there in the kitchen. What's that like? Watching my brother throw down in the kitchen is something that we always knew was going to happen. Executive chef Marcus Woods has been at the helm for five years. Sylvia's grandson, it is so good to see you. Yeah. And you're back here, you're running the kitchen. What, what's that like for you? I mean, knowing that this legacy your grandmother's had. I'm honored, I'm honored. I still get to cook for people like you in the, the community of Harlem. So as long as I can do that, I'm happy and always honored and blessed. You know, the amazing thing is food brings people together. You look in that, that, that dining room, everybody's there. Yes. Well, so, so we used to always say that the first time you come to Sylvia's, you're a guest, the second time you're family. According to Marcus, fried chicken, the most beloved menu item. So did your grandmother teach you how to do this? Yes, she taught me how to fry chicken, everything down to the seasoning. She would always say, you know, moisturize chicken and marinate it like you're putting lotion on a baby. Now, now I can't get that image out of my head exactly. now. One secret, Chef Marcus first applied a dry rub to marinate the chicken. Now is that just plain, plain flour? Yeah, this is plain flour. Uh -huh. We add a little coarse black pepper to it. Uh huh. Drop them all in there. You just want to give it a little mix. Again, the baby metaphor. The baby metaphor. Like you're tossing the baby. After the chicken's coated, it gets a gentle shake. Then it's into the deep fryer. That looks like tender love and care right there. Oh, See yeah. How gently he's putting it in there. Putting the baby to bed. Yep, they'll let you know when they're ready to wake up. What's the best part of working here? That every day when I walk in, I get to feel like my grandmother's still with me. Ah, yeah. Wow. Like, I feel her, I, I can really feel her presence in this place. And it reminds me, every time you're feeling a little lazy, it's like, all right, she's watching. <laughs> you gotta pick up, your, pick up the pace. And she treated everybody the same. Uh -huh. Celebrity, normal person, Worker, dishwasher, cook, chef. Yeah. I don't know if I could ever live up to who she was, but I'm going to. I'm gonna try. She was an amazing person. After about 15 minutes, golden perfection. Wow, that looks perfect. Now this now is you're what, a thigh person. This is, so I, I know what you're person. For. Oh, I remember how good this is. That's perfect. Perfect. Wow, the seasoning, it's moist, crisp. Oh, your grandmother's smiling right now. That's Sylvia's fried chicken right there. You treated the baby well. Mm -hmm. Marcus, this is fantastic. It's so great to see you. Yeah. If, if you don't mind, I'm going to take this piece to go. Oh, I'm going to pack up a whole bunch for you. Thank you.
Welcome back. In Oakland, California, Lois the Pie Queen has been serving up Southern specialties, hospitality, and of course, fabulous pies since the 1950s. But it's more than just a space for delectable food. It's a well-known hub for political activists, artists, musicians, and everyday folks to meet, mix, and collaborate. Come on down to Lois the Pie Queen. Get your breakfast on and the mean green. Lois the Pie Queen is serving up much more than brunch staples. It's just a great place for locals to come, great place for people to connect. And it's just awesome that I could come to a place like this and have some soul food. My name is Chris Davis, and I'm owner of Lois the Pie Queen. We serve food that warms the soul. This family's roots run deep in Northern California. Lois Davis, Chris's mom, began selling homemade pies at her church in the 1940s. They were an instant hit. Her husband, Roland, dubbed her the Pie Queen and saw a new business opportunity. My dad was a chef at B&G Foods in San Francisco, and they combined both of their efforts to open up the restaurant and serve breakfast, lunch, and dinner. In 1953, the duo opening their Oakland restaurant. So my mother ran the restaurant for 40 years, and um, it started at 4.30 in the morning for her and ended at 11 at night, and uh, she was a pure perfectionist. Lois perfecting recipes she enjoyed growing up. The recipes were my grandmother's recipes. My grandmother was from Texas, and they have maintained the test of time. All of the items that are on the menu were pretty much on the menu when my mom started the restaurant. From key lime pie topped with raspberry jam to banana cheesecake, sweet treats are always popular here. But there are plenty of savory staples that keep customers coming back every morning. And there's one dish with a special place in many folks' hearts. You might not find salmon croquettes on the menu anywhere in the Bay Area. The salmon croquettes are part salmon, part mackerel, yellow onions, salt and pepper, Italian breadcrumbs. These croquettes, which originated in the South, were a meal staple for many black families. Most black folks couldn't afford crab, you know, once it became popularized. But in the absence of that, canned fish, salmon croquettes became a major filler. With a couple of cans, families could make an affordable yet delicious meal. Lois's dishes have brought in celebrities from Sammy Davis Jr. to Zendaya. And sports icons like Reggie Jackson ain't here so often, they actually named a pork chop special after him. So here's my wall of fame and some of the special people that are up here. This is Black Panther Party Minister Eldridge Cleaver. All power to the people! In the 1960s and 70s, Lois welcomed members of the newly formed Black Panther Party. The restaurant is a short drive from Merritt Community College, where activist UEP Newton and Bobby Seale first met, founding the party in 1966. Chris attended Merritt with both of them. I had Eldridge Cleaver, Angela Davis, Bobby Seale, and Huey P. Newton come through the restaurant. Civil rights leaders and organizers and community leaders would come and meet and organize and strategize. There was a lot of uh, electricity in the restaurant uh, when they visited. The Black Panthers have a controversial legacy. The story we tend to hear is one of violence. What we don't hear about as much are the various lunch programs and, and free breakfast, of course. They saw black communities as in and of themselves resilient, capable of being self-sufficient. Lois and Chris were not members of the party, but it was during this era the restaurant became an important gathering space in the Oakland community for different walks of life. When people come and are needy and ask for food, we always do what my mom did, which was we always take care of them. We always give them a meal. The restaurant expanding this mission amid the pandemic, providing 16,000 meals to locals in need. It is a place for people to come and, uh, and get together and try and figure out how to make uh, our community and our world a better place. Today, that mission to help others has evolved. 
Chris uses his platform to support local musicians and keep the restaurant buzzy by bringing in younger generations. I believe that that aspect of music and musicianship is something that is in the ethos of the restaurant. Hey, Mr. Jackson, how are you? Good, I'm doing good, babe. Good to see you, man. Good. He recently started a music management company for Wise Men Entertainment that he unofficially runs from the tables at Lois. It's not an accident or a coincidence that you look around and see a lot of photographs of, you know, famous folks. There's a lot of people that he supports. And I don't mean support just by putting up pictures up. He'll cultivate young artists that are looking to get an opportunity to get a platform where they can be seen and heard. Would you like hash browns, grits, or rice? Grits, of course, grits. Chris is determined to keep the restaurant in the family. His son, Corey Jackson, has been overseeing the day-to-day -day at Lois for nearly five years. Working with my dad gave me an understanding of not only the hard work my grandmother put forward and how much my dad is trying to fill those shoes, and now I'm trying to fill his. Corey hoping his sons will share the passion for the family business. They can't stay away. They have a job right now. They fold silverware. It's great to see my kids and their Papa Chris bond in those times. Chris thinks Lois would be incredibly proud to see her restaurant continuing to thrive. We are the oldest black restaurant in the Bay Area. It is a tribute to my mom's efforts to support her community and to create a place that was a home away from home and a place that served food that warmed the soul. <laughs> As you might imagine, keeping a restaurant running for decades is no easy feat, especially in the face of adversity. But with delicious dishes and unwavering hospitality, these historic hotspots have nourished generations fighting for social change. These places now stand as symbols of resilience, inspiring and feeding a new generation of community leaders. Cooking up a fantastic pasta dish with assistant managing editor of the New York Times and founder of New York Times Cooking, Sam Sifton. And he's gearing up for the New York Times Food Festival. Oh. It's coming back October the 8th. I'm so excited. Uh, Sam's going to be moderating a special panel with the cast and crew of the FX hit show, The Bear. Mm. Uh, so we decided to make a spin on a family style meal from the show with Sam's Amatriana. Uh, Amatriana on, on the, the fly, fly, on the fly, which okay. is from the show. But what I love about your column, you talk about this concept, and this is what we're going to do. It's a no recipe recipe. That's right. What do you mean? What I mean by that is you don't have to follow the rules all the time. Uh -huh. You just have to kind of start with a prompt mm. and get going. Okay. And, and, and I provide the prompt. And then you make it however you like it. Mm. But you add lib. You add lib. Okay, so what so are we starting with? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Especially is, if it's bacon. This is bear adjacent. This okay. is not bear cooking. <laughs> okay. I'm not carmy. <laughs> right. This is bear adjacent. So we've got some slab bacon here uh -huh. that I Yum. chopped up for that little tease. And we're going to get it into a pan with some olive oil. And we're just going to let that get going and render some fat. About how much bacon? I like a lot of bacon. I do is too. Is that enough bacon? <laughs> yes, a lot of bacon for is it? good. So yeah. a lot of bacon mm -hmm. going. And we're just going to let that render, render, render. Okay. Mm. And if when you don't use bacon, it's just... Mm. Well, traditionally it was made with guanciale, the oh. hog jowl bacon. Right. But I've done it with salami. I've done it with pepperoni. Okay. Any cured meat, right? So we got that going. Next, we're going to get some onions. Okay. That's going to help us with our sauce. What's your tip for cutting onions? I go across. Uh-huh. And then down the middle, okay. right? And always leave that guy right there, that okay. root end. Yeah. Right? That'll leave hold, him there? That'll hold everything together oh. as you're cutting. Pro tip. Got it? Pro tip. Pro, Pro tip. tip. All right, so into that rendered bacon. Ah, uh, oh secret ingredient. Fat is flavor, my friend. Yes, oh my it God. is. So we got that going. And we'll get mm -hmm. that down pretty low. Uh -huh. Let it go until it's pretty caramel. Mm. Okay. Right? Now we're going to build the sauce out. Mm. We've got some canned chopped tomatoes, right. which are going to go in there. If, if, you, you, and and if you've had some, like, a, a good harvest of garden tomatoes, could you use fresh? You definitely could do that, but I like those garden tomatoes raw, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. You know, like a bruschetta or yeah. something, okay. Okay. a salad, a tomato watermelon salad. That's always delicious. Mm. So this guy goes and goes and goes and goes and builds up flavor. Mm -hmm. 
We've oh, made some good. pasta. Okay. Hey, I've added some butter to that pasta. Okay. Why? Why? Yeah. Because flavor. Add flavor. Mike, exactly. that's why this is so good. Because right. you, you didn't Maybe you gotta pay attention. The, you know, yeah. you really want to get some nice plushness. And it's really like five ingredients too. It's nothing. But it tastes so, it's so layered. And and do you, can you? Is there any pasta you could use? Or yeah, you could use a bucatini if you can find any, uh -huh. or a spaghetti, or you know, you could do this with shells and have a pretty good time. Mm -hmm. So we get that going around, right? Okay. And then what we're gonna do when we're done mm -hmm. and we're happy with it is hit it with some pecorino romano. Oh, oh, pecorino okay. romano. More flavor. Mm -hmm. More Let's flavor. Try this. Some red pepper flakes. Oh. Okay. And some chopped parsley I because. It's beautiful. Mm -hmm. Did you add the pasta water to that as well? I'll add a little bit of pasta water okay. in there just to loosen things up if it gets tight. It's delicious. Okay. Hey, Sam, talk, talk to us about uh, the festival coming up. Oh, uh, yeah. We're really excited. Um, we started the festival a couple of years ago. We missed a year or two mm -hmm. because of the pandemic, and now we're back in Damrush Park in Lincoln Center. We're going to have a okay, ton so of great chefs coming in. Mm -hmm. We sold out tickets in the first tranche, but wow. we're putting a new set on on September 22nd for sale. And then for those who can't make it to New York, mm -hmm. we're going out on the road with oh, some of our, with oh, Melissa wow. Clark and oh, others, some of our best of our chefs. Faves. And we're going to cook with some of America's greatest chefs on the road. And you That's can awesome. cook at home with cooking kits from the New York Times store. That's awesome. Right. Al always good, raves good about recipes He's from New York Times. It's, it's, it's the, the thing that I, I go to all the time, right after uh, Today Food. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair enough. But New York Times cooking, we're giving you a run. Yeah, it is fantastic. Sam Sifton, always love when you're here. Thanks so, so much. Good. This morning in today's food on a twist, an Italian classic here to make pasta cacio e walnuts. Ooh. Chef and cookbook <laughs> author Carla Lali Music. I wish there were smell o vision. I, it's, yeah. It, it yeah. smells so amazing. good here. Her yes. new cookbook is called That Sounds So Good and This Sounds So Love Good. Carla, good morning. Thanks for having me. Hey, so girl. start us off here because cacio e pepe you've always heard of, but sure. cacio e walnut, what are we talking about? I know, here? and not like cacio e pepe needed improvement <laughs> as a classic, <laughs> but a couple of things that can go wrong for people. One is is that the cheese doesn't melt yeah. because it's those it hard grating cheeses. So mm -hmm. I changed up the cheese. And for me, like, it's great, all those textures. It's like adult mac and cheese, mm -hmm. but I need a little crunch. Okay. Yeah. So we've got pasta boiling. That's going to come in. Just keep an eye on that. Okay. And I just like to crush the garlic. Mm -hmm. Doesn't matter what kind of pasta, by the way. I like a big tube for this, okay. and but you can really use anything. Like um, spaghetti would be fine, but I like with a big tube, some of these pieces will get inside oh, the tube. Get, and the like tree. <laughs> exactly. The and then bite. you get like a little secret. Um, Wait, you didn't so crush them as much. Okay. No. So these are just going to toast kind of like that, and I'll press down on them while they're they're going or maybe mm -hmm. one of you will press down okay. while they're going and then instead of toasting the walnuts in the oven I 
toast them in the pan with the oil and the garlic. Oh, so they kind of pick up all those flavors mm -hmm. and infuse. And that really gives a crunch. Um, so another thing that's classic with Cacio Pepe is that you would use a sheep's milk cheese, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, pecorino or pecorino and parm. Mm -hmm. But what can happen is those cheeses, like, they like to clump up yes, when they're melting. it's melted. so frustrating. Yeah. So I, I have a fettuccine Alfredo it. recipe that is great, but it's very similar. The cheese clumps up on people. Mm -hmm. So for this, that was really in my mind. And I wanted to solve for it. So instead of using pecorino, I switched it to manchego. Oh, we went oh. to Spain. Oh. We went okay. to Spain. Oh, so a little okay. bit with the walnuts mm -hmm. and the manchego goes like, yeah, now we're on a like a European siesta. Oh, I love we're that just idea. going across. Could yeah. you use another nut done. other than walnut? Totally. So yeah. my book has spinets for every single recipe. So <laughs> you could use pecans, you could use almonds, you could mm -hmm. use cashews, you could really okay. use whatever you want as long as it's got crunch, even pistachios. So importantly here, why don't you grate okay. uh, or crack a lot of pepper in there right. because the pepe is the pepper uh, and without yep. that like it's not cacio e pepe it's okay. not cacio e walnut and more? also putting yeah more, more. Oh, the pe putting yeah. the pepper oh. in yeah. oil you said yeah. you use extra virgin olive oil extra virgin. yeah and, and why is the pasta water so important so pasta water is really important because the oil and the pasta themselves with the cheese things will melt but they're never going to get creamy so you really mm -hmm. need that water so let's see how is our pasta let's it's give not it, quite done yet not but quite done i don't know if we have time to wait Drop for one in here, let's see. All right. So with the pasta water, the kind of brilliant thing that happens is it creates this like available liquid for the cheese to melt into. Oh. So fat, like any emulsion, fat and water, like they need mm -hmm. they need both to be there in order to make something creamy. How much water, by the way? Mm. 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 Like pretty good. good? Yeah. Right, if cool. you want to do that. Calvin's my noodle tester at home. Yeah. So. <laughs> That's kind of scooby noodle. Yeah, yeah mm. totally. Um, I mean, I feel like the water part is all a feel. It is. Yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I usually scoop out and using the um, the measuring cup, You're you right. can take out a cup or a cup and a half, yeah. but something nice about using a strainer is that you don't dump the water first. So yeah, you right. kind of, if you need to go back, you can. But hot tip, if you forget about the pasta water yeah. and you use tap, oh, it's go. totally yeah. okay. fine. Okay. okay. Oh, oh yeah. Um, put a cup in there. Let's dump the put pasta the right in here. Okay. I like to build the whole sauce in something deep like this. Yeah. Ooh, Beautiful. Good. Amazing. And the cheese, is that okay? And then we're going, yeah, because okay. they're all going to end up in the same mm. place. So using something deep like this okay. gives... Oh, you room yeah. to stir uh -huh. and toss and right. go without. And then you're end up and with it makes something it like exactly. Serious so serious. so that melts side. gradually. Wow. You end up there over you here. Go. You guys definitely need to get it in there. With pleasure. Dylan, Dylan loves this. Okay. This is her favorite. This is my favorite. Nice. I mean, I want to plan a trip to Italy just to eat <laughs> cacio e pepe. And, and really it should look really good. creamy and saucy. So a with nice something salad. rich and cheesy like this, I love a simple salad. Oh my This is my big batch vinaigrette. It's the vinaigrette I grew up eating. We always had a bottle of it on the counter. Really simple: mustard, olive oil, a couple kinds of vinegar. My mom always put balsamic and oh shallot. God. Put it in the blender or the Cuisinart. You end up with this beautiful oh, concoction. Go ahead and swirl. And it's creamy. You can keep it in the you fridge. Make it look so easy. And then it's not a big deal to make a salad because your dressing is already mm. done. How long will this stuff? last in the fridge? The Many ma weeks in the fridge. Weeks? For right. sure, yeah. 100%. I was yeah. a, a fan of yeah. Cacio yeah. Pepe. This has definitely taken it up a notch. Uh -huh. I mean, Amazing. Thanks, yeah, it's Carla. that little bit of crunch. And, and the salt. crunch and the toastiness in the walnuts. Yeah. It's yeah. like what it needed. Good. Plus what gar it? garlic. We what kind of wine would you recommend with this? Actually, something white and bright, like a Friuli or something like that. Thanks so much for stopping by. Be sure to check out her new cookbook. That sounds so good. Good. Trust me, it is. For these recipes and more, head to today.com slash food. Joining us with budget-friendly meals that you can make for dinner tonight is an expert chef, Frankie Salenza. He's the host of the Taste Maid's hit series, Struggle Meals, where he creates gourmet dishes that will not break the bank. Frankie, you're just what the doctor ordered today. We need you. What are you going to make Hey, for I got us? all five of you. Good morning. Good morning, morning Frankie. Frankie. Super cool. <laughs> what you going to make? Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna make a mushroom cavatelli pasta. Mm -hmm. So I can show you that real quick. Obviously, pasta is super affordable, but if you just go buy semolina, which is a high gluten flour, um, you can make pasta with just semolina and water. Ooh. Am I allowed to say gluten on air? Is that sure. like yeah, no, you're okay. okay? You can okay. do it. How so you literally just combine those, and then and then you can roll out sort of a snake here. Wow. Cut these up like this. Bing, 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 and then with your with your knife. You can just kind of windshield wiper. You oh, see that? Yeah. yeah. Oh. And you get these things called cavatelli, 
because it means little hollows. And if you think of like cavity, for example, oh. the, you know, the Latin root cavity, cavitelli, cavity is a hole in your tooth. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so what um, makes this whole thing budget friendly? So really, there's, listen, there's a whole bunch of ways to save money. One of the biggest ones that people overlook because we live in the future and everything is available all the time is cooking in season. If you're cooking in season, it's not being transported long distance to get to you. Like, that's a great point. I don't know. Carson, would you go down to Argentina right now with the price of flights? Yes, I probably would. <laughs> if Jeff Blue went, would? I'm there. Okay. Well, if you want your point. asparagus right now, it's yeah. coming from Argentina and right. you're paying for it to get on a plane flight. Right. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. That's no good. No. So, right. right. Eat, Seasonal eat beets, selections for are example. close. For example. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so I've got a, uh, a rag here. You just roast the beet, mm-hmm. and hopefully this works because I did cook these last night. But essentially, if you just get a rag that you dedicate to this and, and use the friction of the rag, Wait, sort of this is the twist. Here. Yeah, oh. you twist the you twist the beet inside. Is a bird going to come get, out of there? You see it like oh, what? Oh, what? Oh, what? Yeah, that's a cool. pretty so, magic. So beets are in season. They're a root vegetable. So is citrus. You can make a gorgeous citrus beet salad. Oh, can I ask a dumb cheese. question, Frankie? Is there like a website beets? or a place you could learn where things are in season? Like, I have no idea. I just go to the grocery yeah. store. Yes, exactly. oh, absolutely. I mean, there's this whole like thing that we have in the palm of our hand with all of mankind's knowledge. And you can just say winter vegetables and you'll oh. find that it's <laughs> so root <the> vegetables. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. Cruciferous vegetables, root it. vegetables, right. citrus. Mushrooms. I'm That's sorry, cool. I didn't mean to be. No, I deserve it. Sure. It was dumb. I told you it was dumb. <laughs> okay. We'll go back. Frank, so, where, where, so where's that's the mushroom a, a beet salad. Real... Go ahead. Where's the mushroom come in on the pasta? Different dish. So we've got our mushroom here. I cooked them naked in the pan. Mm. Got it. And then I added some fat after. It's mm. sort of counterintuitive. You want to dehydrate a mushroom so that then you can infuse it with fat, which is flavor. Mm. So I cooked it naked in the pan. They naked. shriveled up. Water came out. Mm. Threw the butter and or olive oil in there. Yum. And now we've got, you know, we've got this mushroom. Okay, so there's mushroom. Yum. Okay. That's the oh, the hey. mushrooms you go know? the cavities. And you're saying yeah, making your homemade pasta, that was, I mean, that was a good budget move too, right? It's a good budget move. Pasta's pretty affordable anyway, to be honest with mm-hmm. you. So like, if you want to use a boxed pasta, mm-hmm. the thing is to just pair mm-hmm. it with in-season ingredients. I want to eat that. It's not I a problem at all. I love hey, Frankie, does, you know, does homemade pasta, does it, does it change the cooking time? Yeah, it's a lot faster. So I put these in right at the start of the segment. They've got a self timer built in. They float to the top when they're done. Oh. If uh, if you see, it takes like you know between Frankie, two and three minutes. You're an A plus guest. We want to say thank you. Uh, yeah. you're great. You can find uh, rest- this recipe at today.com/food, and you catch Frankie's show. Check it out. It's called Struggle Meals. It's Thursdays on Taste Made. Thank you, Frankie. Come back in person next time, Frankie. Come yeah. back, Frankie. <laughs>
We're back with Today Food, and one of our very favorite guests, our pal Bobby Flay. Oh, I'm so excited. He's an award-winning chef, the author of 216 best-selling 216? And we At can't least. forget about his hit show, Beat Bobby Flay. By the way, new episode tonight where two chefs go head-to-head in the kitchen for a chance to face off against the master himself. This morning, Bobby is sharing a fantastic pasta dish with us. Uh, good to see you, Mr. Flay. Good to see you guys. Bobby. Bobby. Thanks for waking up uh, yeah. early. What yeah, we- what are we cooking, honey? So we're making uh, we're making a baked pasta. It's one of those dishes that I think is fantastic for like a Sunday night meal. It's very, very comforting. And it's something that uh, can feed the whole family. So let's get started. It's gonna be rigatoni. It's gonna be some hot Italian sausage, some broccoli rob and some tomato sauce. A little vodka sauce there as well. So I'm gonna start off by cooking some rigatoni. Uh, and some salt and water. You know, you've seen this a million times in the Today Show. Lots of salt in your water. Make sure it's boiling, abundance of water. We're gonna cook the rigatoni for about eight or nine minutes. Well, while that's cooking, we're gonna get our, get our sauce going. So we have some hot Italian sauces that I've cooked off a little bit. Some tomato sauce. I've made my own, um, but if you have a good, uh, a good quality tomato sauce that you like, you can definitely use that as well. And we're gonna add a little bit of vodka. This is that, uh, you know, one of the one of the most classic Italian American pasta dishes is pasta a la vodka. It's basically a tomato sauce with a little bit of vodka in it and um, a touch of cream. So it, it, it almost becomes like a little bit of a pink sauce. Really delicious. What does the vodka yeah, do to it? Question. What's that? What does the vodka do to it, Bobby? The vodka actually helps emulsify the cream in the tomato sauce, so it doesn't, um, so it doesn't separate. It's uh, it, it's sort of a binder in, in, in a sense. And also, it's like, I mean, who doesn't want to cook with vodka? I mean, there you go. <laughs> so, so, so basically, you're making like a creamy tomato sauce with the, with the hot Italian sausage. And then um, just because we want to make sure that it's nice and healthy, I'm going to put some broccoli rub in there as well. Okay. And, um, and then we're going to take this sauce. I'm going to pour it right over the cooked pasta. This is some rigatoni that I had, you know, cooked ahead of time. Okay. So we're just going to, we're going to cover the, uh, the pasta in the sauce. And I'm going to add some fontina cheese to it. Yum. And this is all going to go into a casserole dish. And I mm. love cooking things, I, you know, I call it oven to table, where, you, where you, you, know, you create something in the kitchen, you put it in an earthenware or some sort of uh, oven-proof dish like mm. this one. So, Bobby, did, put- did you cook that pasta al dente because it's going to be cooking longer in the oven? Yes. That's actually, Hoda, that's a great point. You want to cook it a little bit undercooked. So maybe like three quarters of the way because it's gonna sit in the sauce, it's gonna bake in the oven at about 350 degrees. And on top, we're gonna to put some fresh, some, some grated mozzarella and some Parmigiano Reggiano cheese. And then we're gonna to go to the oven. Hey Bobby, oven, how do you keep it from sticking on the bottom? Oh, it's not gonna stick because we, you know, there's lots of tomato sauce in there, it's gonna to be totally fine. Oh, and actually, if it, um, if it gets a little crusty on top, that's actually a good thing. It's like, you know, like when you have the lasagna, and the, and, the, and the edges and the crispiness mm-hmm. on the around the side. Mm-hmm. What do you always want that part of it? You get, you definitely get a little bit of this as well. You want to let this bake in the oven about 350 degrees for, I don't know, about 15 to 20 minutes, because don't forget, the pasta's already cooked, the sauce is already hot. We're just heating it up. And then at the last second, for the last three or four minutes, turn your oven up to mm-hmm. broil. Mm-hmm. Pour yourself and cook the time. This is part of the recipe, by the way. And then take out your, um, Take out your, your pasta, and you can see this is what it's going to look like. I see. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, I hope that's, that's what I'm that's talking about. Over here if you're watching this at home. Make this. Yeah. And there you go. Oh, it's delicious. Make, Man, make it about this weekend. Yum. And then basically, you know, you can just take a, take a little bit and just try to kind of put it in a bowl. Look at that. Nice and chewy, uh, cheesy. Yeah. Just look at that. That's I mean, good. after looking at that, Bobby, it's amazing that anybody beats you on Beat Bobby Flay. Yeah. How's it going over there? B Bobby Flay is great. We've done uh, we've done close to 400 episodes, which is insane. <laughs> but I have to tell you, I'm having more fun than ever. Um, it's so great to be able to welcome you know you know chefs from all over the country to come in and and take me down. It's actually way more fun when I lose because the chefs are so excited. It's great for their community when they win. You, you know, they usually have like all these. They have like viewing parties in their in their local community. It's great. B Bobby Flay has been so much fun for me for the last yeah. I don't know. Does your, does your girlfriend like watching it? <laughs> <laughs> you guys, Carson asked me if my girlfriend was awake. Oh. The only person awake right now in L.A. is me cooking baked pasta for you. It's 5.50 in the morning. How yeah, well, if you would just yeah. pull that sausage out of that dish, then she'd have a dish that she could eat if you were a little more thoughtful. 
Oh, oh. actually, Carson, you know what? You're, you've actually done your research because Christi Christina does not eat meat. I know that. Yes. So, but Sausage out of here, she's all good. There you go. We just put a, well, we just put up a picture of her there. As well, <laughs> well he, last time Bobby was on, he was very secretive about this whole relationship. Yeah. And then he spilled his guts to People Magazine. Now it's fair game. Oh, so she's yeah. lovely, yeah. lovely, yeah. lovely, yeah. lovely lady. It all. Hey, Bobby, real quick, we, we loved your restaurants in New York yeah. City. So amazing over the years. Anything new on the horizon? Anything we can look forward to? In New York City, um, well, we're, we're sort of in the wait and see kind of thing right now for New York because, you know, I've, I've always had restaurants in New York my entire adult life. And, uh, you know, we're just going to see what happens. You know, I just opened a Malfi in Las Vegas about five or six months ago. That's going really well. And uh, listen, you know, New York has my heart. So at mm -hmm. some point, we'll be back there. All right. We'll all right. Well, thanks, Bobby. Thank you, Bobby. Hey, we can catch thanks, an all buddy. new episode of Beat Bobby Flay tonight on Food Network and get Bobby's recipes on our website today.com slash food. Oh, the answer's gone when you need them most. Ooh, let it go. The Today Show's newest fan. This is the Little Al Roker. Missy Robbins is a James Beard award-winning chef and owner of Lilia and Missy Restaurants. She's out with her second book called Pasta, the Spirit and Craft of Italy's Greatest Food. Missy's right here near us in Brooklyn uh -huh. in her kitchen right now. Missy, by the way, you were a home run on the 8 o'clock hour. We're still talking about that breakfast pasta. Oh, we get uh -huh. it. No, we want it. We want you to come make it for us. But for us, you're going to make... I, I will do that anytime I'm allowed. Yay. I love it. Okay, so you're making a broccoli pesto. This is mm. one of your favorites. Tell us why. Yeah, this one. This one's a little later than the last segment where we did carbonara, and I, I, I bragged about how rich it is. Okay. This one's a little later. Um, there's a few reasons I love this. One, it's it's got broccoli. It's healthy. It's I developed this when when I was trying to eat healthier and wanted to include more vegetables. And okay. how do I do that but still have a little pasta? So it starts with it starts with you can use broccoli. You can use broccoli rabe. In my in my recipe, I have both. Um, you kind of just separate the florets, the mm -hmm. leaves, and then um, blanch it, shock it, chop it. So that's a, a, just a quick cook. Um, and you end up with this. Um, and then the leaves and basil, you also mm. blanch and do a puree. Okay. Um, and then we use pecorino. Mm. We use parmigiano. So it's still so got the all yummy the stuff in there. Traditional, yeah, yeah, all the yummy stuff. Yeah. It's, not, it's, not, it's not like... You Can know, I ask diet. real quick about it's, that it's, pesto? You was that a pesto you poured in? Is that what the basil was? That that was that was just a puree. Puree. Um, okay. And then this is olive oil, which will mm. kind of bind it all together. Mm. And then the gnocchi. One of the reasons I love them, I think, I think a you can make them ahead of time. You can you can make them. You can cook them ahead of time and hold them overnight. This is a ricotta gnocchi Ooh. that's uh, really foolproof. Yum. Like you, you cannot screw this up. So and, should you just and, not buy the, uh, you know, the frozen like a, ones and 
Do I need you to do the real thing? You should never buy, never. Is that horrible ever. of me? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry. Never. I won't buy the frozen ones anymore. <laughs> This is just so easy, and I, I love it also because it's great to make with kids. Mm. Really great to make with kids. It's an easy one. Um, I roll this dough out into ropes, you see, uh -huh. and then I cut them into pieces. Mm. And then if you want a little extra fancy, you go, um, you want to make sure there's enough flour so they don't stick. This dough can uh -huh. get a little sticky. And we have this little paddle, very traditional uh -huh. gnocchi board, um, and you just kind of roll it down uh -huh. like this. Uh, also, like, really fun for kids, like great hand-eye coordination. Ah. Um, oh. And, I, and once, you, uh, once you taste those, you probably can't go back, so I guess I can see that. Exactly. And, then, <laughs> and they're just yeah. easier than potato gnocchi. So I have them cooking in back. It's really hard. Like, with traditional pasta, egg pasta, it's so delicate. It's pretty hard to screw these guys up. <laughs> like, they, you want to cook them till they float to the top, but if they float and they cook another one or two minutes, you're okay. You're going to end up with something very, very light. That's okay. the other thing with these. There's a lot of cheese. Um, I have my broccoli pesto on the Oof. stove here. Um, Yum. And, and, just, and, and it's got a little pasta water to loosen it up. So mm -hmm. pasta water is a really important ingredient when you're making pasta. It adds starch. It adds a little salt. And we just go right in the pan okay. here. Coat it. Right. And then how do you know when it's ready? Well, you're going to marry them together. Okay. So you're going to just toss, 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 mm, toss, mm. toss, toss, until those gnocchi kind of absorb into into the uh, sauce, and the sauce absorbs into the gnocchi, Look and they become flip. one. I was just going to say, mine would be all over the floor. I'm just mesmerized so, right I now. mean, you should try it at home. We, yeah. You know, when we teach young cooks, we tell them to take beans home and, <laughs> and just flip beans okay. forever and ever. Oh. Um, and then we just go right here. Serve it up. Um, Look at that final plate. Oh my gosh. I just want a fork right um, now. Mm. And these, these gnocchi, you know, in the, in the book, we have um, tons of recipes for different red sauces. The, that's like one of my favorite things in the world to eat. Missy. It's, it's just red sauce gnocchi. Missy, um, that is, a that's a parm. 10 plus. Look at that. Yeah. Um, a little more parm. We thank you so much. Um, and we're so excited thank again. You. You're joining us from your Brooklyn kitchen, but you've got, you're the owner of Lilia and Missy, the Missy. restaurants. In New York. So thanks again. Yeah, uh, I hope to see you guys soon. Us too. For this recipe, go to today.com slash food. And for Missy's book, you can head to today.com slash shop. It's Thank called Pasta. Thank you so much. Okay, if you're tired of coming up with dinner ideas night after night, we're kicking off a new series to help you out. It's called One and, and Done. Done. It's simple, inexpensive, and also healthy one-dish wonders. And today, nutritionist Joy Bauer is starting us off with a menu for you tonight. Hey guys, so everybody has re been requesting hearty, delicious meals that you can whip together in a flash. And that's why I love One and Done. These are one sheet suppers and we are gonna be making roasted chicken and Brussels sprouts. And you'll see, it could not be any simpler. So we're first gonna make the marinade for the chicken and I'm adding in some olive oil. And this is a little bit of a secret ingredient. Two teaspoons of vinegar. What's nice about the vinegar is it acts as a tenderizer for the chicken. Half a teaspoon of garlic powder, because everything's better with garlic. I have one and a half teaspoons of kosher salt. And last but not least, smoky paprika. I love smoky paprika, and I'm putting in a heaping tablespoon. And it's gonna give it a nice, vibrant color as well. So now I'm going to cut up my chicken breast. So I have skinless chicken breasts here. If you wanna leave the skin on, you can do that as well. But the key is, because we want this to cook really quickly, I'm cutting each breast into three large chunks. And if the breasts are really big, you can certainly do four or even five. And now I'm just gonna add the chicken breasts into the marinade that we made. And the vinegar is gonna allow the chicken breasts to tenderize. I covered up my chicken and I'm gonna marinate it in the fridge for 30 to 60 minutes. Next, 
what I think is the star of the show, our Brussels sprouts. So I love Brussels sprouts so much. I trim the edges and I'm cutting them into quarters. They are packed in vitamin C and they also have cancer fighting properties. And you'll notice as I'm cutting, we're getting all of these stray leaves. It's the best part of the Brussels sprouts. The best part because they brown and crisp up. To me, it tastes like potato chips. And Hoda, I know you're laughing right now. You're saying, Joy, those do not taste like potato chips. They taste like potato chips. I'm gonna take all of my Brussels sprouts and I'm gonna lay them out on the sheet. A little bit of olive oil, a little bit of salt, and some ground black pepper. And if you like a little spice, you can add crushed red pepper flakes too. I'm gonna pop this in the oven at 400 for about 15 minutes. Guys, I told you, like potato chips. Can you hear that? That's a crunch. Mmm, so good. And now I'm gonna nestle the chicken. And this also works perfectly with thighs. Now I'm gonna pop this back in the oven one last time on the middle rack, set at 400 for 10 minutes or until the chicken is done. And there you have it, one and done. Now you can enjoy it exactly as is or you could bring it to the next level and add some fresh lemon juice on top and either some crumpled feta or some grated Parmesan cheese. Hoda, Jenna, this is a winter winter chicken dinner. If you need something quick and easy for dinner, we promise this recipe will be a new family favorite. We're making chicken parmesan meatballs. Yummy. Courtesy of our friend Gabby Dalkin from What's Gabby Cooking? And she's just released her fourth what? cookbook. It's called Take It Easy. She's got a baby who's 16 months? A year and a half. Months. 20 months. 20 months. 20 months. Oh, very months. complicated. 20 months. Thank Bobby. you. She's got that lots. sounds very oh, yummy. That beautiful thing. Her name is Poppy. What? Yeah. Her name's Poppy. We I have know. two poppies in the house. She's a real happy little munchkin. All right. Aww. Let's talk about this fourth cookbook is easy breezy. It's all about taking it yeah. easy, getting dinner on the table, friends mm -hmm. around the table, just like really good food that doesn't take a lot of Honestly, time. Honestly, when you're cooking for your family, you got to keep it easy. 100%. Stop. Let me just show this foot. All right. We're going to start with the ball. Okay, so these are chicken parmesan meatballs. Why do like you it's, always say that? Because <laughs> they are just, what no. do you not balls? say this balls. is your favorite What are they? Balls. balls. They're Thank balls. You. Thank you. So this is chicken parm <laughs> in meatball form. So we've got ground chicken. You could do it with ground beef or anything. You're or just turkey. Or turkey. 100%. Everything. All your seasonings in okay. there. Some red pepper flakes. You want to throw that the egg in there? Does that make it too spicy for kids? I no? mean, you might want to tone it down. Poppy, I like give every spice. And she, like, oh, you really? Because you want her to be an eater. Yeah, I want her to be an eater. So like I give her everything. Yeah, parmesan and panko. So instead of like to do this? Yeah, just go ahead and stir it so all together. So the raw egg is cool to stick in there. Obviously. Yeah, because you don't want to beat it. Well, you can like get if you're not on live TV, you could get in there with your hands and like really mush it, mush up. it up and get it together. And okay. then once it's done, you're gonna like take a Wait, scoop look, of it. Oh, I see. Look what she did, J she JBH. It. She hollowed out the scoop. Yeah, and, now and you're gonna pop. Uh -huh. I know. And then I know. what? Now and what? And then it with cheese. You would take your hands, your mold hands it all over. around it, and then you're just gonna put it out there. So look at these. So yeah. these have a mozzarella thing well, inside. Well, so this you then put on a little bit of flour, yeah. toss it around, and it goes right into oh, the hot okay, oil. Okay, now if you decide you don't want to fry it could you just like bake, bake it? it air fry it bake it whatever you want and like this you don't you could also skip the flour if you didn't yeah. want like so wait, the are crust. you frying it in literally almost no oil I know, it looks yeah like no you don't oil. need a lot because you're just gonna want to like you brown. want it brown on all the sides and then take it off let the oil kind of come okay. off for a second and then you're gonna nestle it in your Can favorite I ask tomato a question sauce. how do you Please. know that it's cooked all the way through so yeah, good question. you do like four or five minutes on each side flip it and then you can pop the whole thing into pop the oven the if you want to just to like to? finish you don't need to if it's cooked also like I open it and just look sometimes. Okay. Ice machine is going on. <laughs> there's something yeah, there's some sort of. We weird thought it here. was a raccoon, but no. <laughs> I think it's the ice machine. No. I just open it. Let's right. stop. Okay. okay. Now you're gonna make some pesto to go so with it. So this is a basil vinaigrette. It's one of my favorite things. It's like a condiment for my website that you put on every basil, basil vinaigrette. vinaigrette. I'm into this. Okay. So like what do you got in there? Shallots. So these are shallots and garlic that are in there. Go ahead and throw my, the basil. May I throw this in? Yes, basil. please. Okay. We're gonna put some olive oil in here, and this is one of those recipes. You could mm, make now it, while like basil's basil. at the Ridiculous. end of the season. And what's, what's this? Throw salt? some salt and pepper in there. And can I'll you do make the pepper. This for salads and stuff too. This basil. I use this for everything. everything. Salads, chicken, chicken. This you pop the so top yummy. on, and then you're gonna get this insane, beautiful green basil vinaigrette, and just. 
drizzle it on top, and if you wanted to add some shaved parm, you could. Yeah, add some shaved parm. Yeah, more is more. Okay. But like, Wait, I have a question. Does Poppy ask for this? Yeah, Poppy mm. loves I mean, the ball. I know she can't talk that well, she but loves she asks. Ball. See, she loves mm. the ball too. <laughs> um, by the way, you just like saying the word Poppy. No, I don't. Feel but like, look at that molten cheese in there. It's so yummy. Like, it's so Should the cheese fun. melt, or should Gobby. it just be kind of like? It doesn't matter. Like, it's going to be See, nice and warm, but, like, it's like flexible. Gobby. That's what she says. Just make it. It's yeah. good and eat it. I'm going to make this recipe. You rock. Uh, you, you can check out Gobby's new cookbook. You can go to, to today.com slash books. And to get this recipe, go to today.com slash yeah, this food. is such a great recipe. Mm. Gobby, yeah. send your yeah. love to Poppy. I will. Ditto. Love supporting local restaurants and our sponsor City is helping us do just that. When you spend five dollars or more dining out with your enrolled City credit card, one dollar will be donated to a great program, No Kid Hungry, until they reach one million dollars through December first. It's a great way to give local businesses a boost while also helping feed kids across the country. Yeah, and we asked one of our favorite local chefs who works closely with No Kid Hungry to join us this morning, Chef Dan Kluger. He's the chef and owner of three great New York City restaurants, including the recently opened Penny Bridge in Long Island City, Ooh. which is just right across okay. the river right here. Right across the river. Beautiful. Super close. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, Good morning. I, know, I know No Kid Hungry is super important to you. Yeah. This is a great initiative. I mean, getting kids food, that is important. Well, let's. Oh, you're making steak. This so we're making morning, steak. Which makes you Carson so happy. You mind helping me? But we're chef, make we've a, talked a lot about the sauce. You're gonna make yeah, the sauce. Okay. We're gonna make the barbecue sauce. She's gonna help. It's basically mm. ketchup, Worcestershire, molasses, Tabasco, mustard, mm. and smoked paprika. Isn't there like a stigma hard. about putting a sauce, like the A1 on a steak, sort of is, is not great because if you have a good piece of meat? Yeah. That, that's the old thinking. It, it is, and I think you know the the menu at Penny Bridge is really inspired by classics and comfort food and things that were important in my childhood. And some things are like best in class what they are and then some are a variation and this was like my father made meatloaf when I was young after he had a heart attack and he put spinach in there to make it healthy yep. but then covered it in bacon and sauce mm. <laughs> All right. like that. yeah I love that oh. so you we make using... your own sauce no guilt exactly right. so we're we gonna do with the we're doing filet mignon season it have any the, yeah. two, the two things I think a lot of home cooks don't do is they don't season well and then when they put it in they start moving around right just let it sit let Set it develop it. that crust look hold on I'm a natural <laughs> <laughs> And so we had these cooking for a little while. <laughs> like made I made the do. sauce. And then what you want to do is Are you cooking this whole meat on the, in the skillet right here? Yeah, but we're going to put it in a broiler. So basically... To finish it off because it's so thick? We want, we want to glaze this up and we want to create a crust of the sauce. So okay. that's, that's like the, the component here. Mm. This little bit of bitterness, sweet, sour, crunch that you're going to get from the sauce. I made the sauce, Chef. Thank Very you. Nice. Okay. Nice Luckily, oh, you I don't need had that your own. Oh. <laughs> so this is kind of like a searing saucing pro process to get the crust. And, yep. you, and you bake it off for how long? Then you put it in the broiler. I would say probably about eight minutes. I use a probe. But you just check it and then you're, you're not 
number. Leave it five degrees short. It'll rise a little bit. I go to about 125 to 130. That will take me to my mid rare medium. After it sits for 10 perfect. minutes. Right. Exactly. What do you Let it rest. Then we have spinach. We're using some lardone, some bacon that we chopped up. Render that out. Yeah. And then we're basically lardone. just going to throw all the spinach in. Yeah. We want to start wilting that down. How is it, guys? It, it's yeah. great. So good. Mm -hmm. Should I turn yeah. these over or anything? Is sure. Okay. You and taste the sauce? Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Carson. I'm like you. I'm a purist. No sauce. This sauce is incredible. Right. Mm. Yeah. It, 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 it makes it, sense. It helps level. the crust, too. Mm -hmm. So then we've, we've wilted the spinach down. <laughs> and then one of the things that I like to do is add a lot of herbs. So I'm adding oh. mint and dill to it, That's the what's spinach. In there. And so this is going to become the, the herbs oh, are really thank you. part of our vegetable. You got a fork over there? No one cares about the vegetable. Okay. <laughs> this, is, this spinach is good. Mm -hmm. You like the spinach? It's great. Right. Can you make these little yeah, That's amazing. And then we, we finish it with some chips to give some texture mm -hmm. and a little more flavor. All right, I just need a fork. What's wow. your cut, Tom? I go ribeye, rib New York strip, strip bone-in strip. I don't do the filet enough, though. No. Every time I have it, it's the good. House. It's Best of both worlds. It's so good. Yeah. Chef, thank you so much. Thank you. Com slash food. Get the recipe. Wow. We appreciate it. I'm thrilled to say good morning to our next guest. Finally, after all of those teases, the pioneer <laughs> woman herself, Reed Drummond, has made it all the way from her ranch in Oklahoma. Are you near Blake's Ranch in Oklahoma? Not so much, Not so much but, you know, we're in the sta same state, yeah. so, you know, we, we know each other. When I was there marrying him and Gwen, I would have stopped by your ranch Seriously, and said a little Seriously, next time. Or yes. your 25th it's wedding anniversary, I could have you, you, renewed your vows. <laughs> oh, well, we're also out with a brand new cookbook. It's called Super Easy. It features more than 100 mm. shortcut recipes, which we like the sound of that. Actually, lots been going on in the ranch in Oklahoma. You look absolutely stunning. You've got oh, a daughter who just got married, right? Yes. Hard to believe. Yeah, and you're about to celebrate your 25th anniversary, and Carson's going to do your renew your vows for you. <laughs> that's that's be hard lovely. to believe too. I know I'm only 29. I don't know how I can oh, wow. get married. For you look 29. Years. What happened you to you? during COVID? All I did was eat and drink and not work out. And well, listen, same. I I was wearing pandemic pants this time last year. <laughs> I don't know if you remember, but. But uh, yeah, I just, you know, the wedding was a great inspiration and motivation. But then once I started kind of uh, exercising more and getting healthier, it felt so good yeah. that I just kept going. So I'm, I'm kind of glad I'm over that hump. And now it's about just maintaining and, and yeah. enjoying. Well, I don't so. know if these delicious recipes are going to be uh, on any maintenance, but they are really smell good. Uh, speaking of my wellness journey, yes. let's eat some tots yes. Yes. Uh, with cheese let's. all over them. So, yeah. It starts with chicken. Yep. Yes. Yeah, so, I'm going to make tachos. Now, do you know what tachos are, Carson? No. No idea. You need to know. So, <laughs> tachos are just like nachos, but they're made with tots. Oh. Yum. So, oh. I, baked, I baked some tots with a little we cumin and We have the gang eating powder, already. Oh, cook right. some chicken, add some celery. So, these are buffalo chicken tachos. Yum. Celery, garlic, and green onions. Did you make up tachos or is that a thing? I never it's heard of tachos. It's kind of a thing, but it hasn't okay. swept the nation yet. Yeah, it's going now to. Will. I'm yeah. kind of hoping. Uh, It'll but be trending by the end of the segment. You can put on nachos, you can put on tots okay. and call them tachos. So Love it. Then, of course, buffalo sauce, and then you just let oh. this simmer. Mm, I started with raw smell. chicken, but you can do rotisserie chicken to okay. make it easier. Mm. Yeah. So simmer that until it's luscious Have you and changed saucy. what you cook now because of your sort of wellness journey? Is it? Is it Put no. you on a different path? You <laughs> <laughs> no, and you know the thing is, is I have, I have teenage boys, college students, uh, lad, right. a, mm -hmm. ranchers, you know, yeah, cowboy, and so I have to make food that everybody loves. Right. And yeah. I don't, I'm not good when I deny myself, yeah. you know, whole Butter categories of food. And, so mm -hmm. I'm just kind of learning to eat. I like to say I eat a Rhode Island-sized piece of cake instead of a Texas-sized piece <laughs> right. of cake. That's the best way you get the flavors and the taste. It's How does that just taste? It's delicious. Really good. Everything's good. So, yeah. good. so yeah. you, you pull the tots out of the oven. Mm -hmm. They're seasoned, so they're a little bit elevated. Mm -hmm. I kind of push them into a pile. Yeah. Pepper jack cheese yeah. all over. I okay. mean, this this is what life's all spice. about right oh, here. Oh, right here, yeah. And then you spoon the saucy chicken all oh, over. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so you can do ground beef that. and Ooh, that's a hit, you know right? black beans and do sort of. Is a the chicken mix. gonna because it's hot melt that cheese? Or are you putting this back in the no, oven? No, it's going back in the oven. Okay, yeah. Because so, okay. you want to melt the cheese like uh, nachos. So all the cheese you want, melt it. Mine? Oh, here we go. That's okay, all yeah. the cheese. Actually, Jack cheese, the buffalo yeah. sauce. Mm. It's, it's hearty. It's, it's got a kick, huh. but oh jeez! Did you know redheads can tolerate uh, spicy food more than anybody really? else? Really? Is that true? Yeah. So yeah. Ooh, this is good. Is that true? You love it? That's we'll delve good. into the genealogy Chicken. of that some other time. But, wow. but basically, you garnish with uh, 
blue cheese mm -hmm. and to make blue cheese dressing, I just take ranch dressing mm -hmm. and add blue cheese to it. Oh, wow. and oh clever. Yeah. it's Another very shortcut. easy. Well, you can do knew? bottled ranch or you can make your own, but Brilliant. nice little shortcut. Mm -hmm. So this is what, uh, this is why my teenage boys love me. Oh, I can see why. That is delicious. Hey, Carson. Really, yeah. really good. Hey, this is gone. I mean, just, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wham. What happened? Oda? So Oda's eaten a whole bunt cake already. Oda, we have wow. not started the cake at, segment <laughs> yet. Hey, take a breath. No one's missed these eating segments more than Hodes. <laughs> so good. <laughs> Remember, Rhode Island, not Texas. <laughs> She's going state by state. <laughs> All right, well, that does bring us to our chocolate cake. Now, this is your secret recipe, right? Okay, yes. Yeah. So, confession, my, my top secret ingredient in my top secret cake is dark chocolate cake mix. Oh, okay. And what? listen, I had my house full of humans during the pandemic yeah. and large six, you know, six foot five humans yeah. and football players. And I had... I was making so much food that I was about to lose my religion. I mean, <laughs> every day I was just like, I can't do it anymore. So I'm not afraid to whip out the chocolate cake. I doctored it with, uh, you know, bittersweet chocolate chips just to make it a little bit more uh, rich. Wow. But the thing is, this is the secret. It's a box cake. Well, it's what, oh. yeah. Okay. But the thing is, I'm topping it with ganache, oh, which is Ooh. heavy cream wow. and good oh, well, quality go. chips. Yeah. That's okay. all two ingredients. Yes. And then it turns into this Here. luscious. Ooh. And are these oh, inside the or is this like a topping this thing becomes, situation? So, well, you can just eat one if you like. So you just make, okay, yeah. So you made the, the we cake. We gotta go. Oh, we're out of time. Okay, yeah. I really want to understand this. And then drizzle. Drizzle. Uh, I do sprinkles on top, <laughs> but <laughs> after Halloween, you can take Beautiful leftover cake. candy, chop it, it up, and top. put it on top. So Hold up. Oh, my God. Happy plate. She's Wait a minute. The plate. Oh, yeah. Show it. Clean Literally. plate club. Clean plate club. Clean plate Done. club. There's, you left a oh. And she's going to eat out. And also, she's going to move in with you. <laughs> and she's she's giggling. She's giggling a lot over there. Congratulations <laughs> on everything. Love your show. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you. All right, of course, you can find all these recipes at today.com slash food and Pick up a copy of Super Easy at today.com slash shop. to find an air fryer under the tree this Christmas or you still haven't pulled it out of the box from last year, we know who you are. Yeah. Anyway, we've got a recipe just for you. Gina Hamoka is the New York Times best-selling author and founder of the award-winning blog Skinny Taste. Mm. And this dish comes straight from her new cookbook. It's called Skinny Taste Air Fryer Dinners. Gina, we need this. Yeah. By the so way, I love the idea that you can use an air fryer and it's still, you can make it in a healthy way and it's delicious for exactly. you. Exactly. And we are making chicken saute lettuce wraps. 
So Yum. here's Yum. a dish that my family loves and And why like why is the air fryer better? Just yeah. it's just the basics. It's so fast. Yeah. You, cook, you don't have to preheat it. It's so convenient. And if you're frying, it's just so much healthier. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay, so we're making this and chicken. And what what do we kind need? of chicken do you do you like to use? What part of the chicken? Well today we're gonna use chicken breast, but I also like chicken thighs. Yeah. Chicken breast here works great because uh, there's some coconut milk in the marinade, so um, we're adding some fat to it, so it's okay. got lots of flavor. Okay. Coconut so, milk, that's great for hoda. Yeah. So what should mm -hmm. we do? So let's start with the marinade. Do you wanna give me you wanna help? Sure. Sure. I'll pour in the right, coconut perfect. milk. So we got See, some coconut milk. I'll help with the onions. Great. Some shallots. Okay. Oh, shallots, of course. We have some soy sauce or gluten-free tamari. Okay. And this is some fish sauce. Fish sauce, that's good. And mm -hmm. what's this? Turmeric? Curry powder. Oh, curry. Yeah. Some mm -hmm. fresh shallots. Fresh shallots. I'm sorry. Some fresh ginger. Ginger. And we need a little spoon. And some this? kosher salt. The whole thing? The whole thing. Okay. So we're going to mix this all together. Okay. And then this gets poured right over the chicken. How long do you leave it in the fridge? So we could marinate this for about 30 minutes okay. or as long as overnight. So the longer it marinates, the lo more flavor it has. But okay. it's honestly really great in 30 minutes. Okay. okay. So half hour later, you take your chicken out yep. and now it's time to get to work. So. Okay. So then we put our chicken in the air fryer. And whenever you use the air fryer, you always want to keep your food in a single layer because you want to keep the airflow ah. that's what makes it brown and crisp oh okay don't pile it up exactly okay and, and you don't need oil right well you could spritz a little olive oil but for yeah. this recipe you don't um, sometimes okay. you do it just so it doesn't stick okay so and you, you of lay course that out. 400 degrees for about nine minutes and nine you always minutes. want to turn your food halfway because the heating element is at okay. the top okay and then we make a glaze right okay so this is the peanut sauce okay, okay. peanut butter want, yep so we got some creamy peanut butter some warm water yeah. enough, enough to make it drizzleable oh and then we got some lime juice okay yeah. Some sriracha. I love peanut sauce, by Me the way. Me too. A little sriracha. I want to eat peanut sauce with exactly. a spoon. Exactly. Yeah. And then some fresh ginger and a little more tamari or soy there sauce. There's a little baby Thank spoon. Thank you. You so, can tell I couldn't quite get that. <laughs> so we're just going to mix this until it is... You didn't. Well, you weren't supposed to add all the water, oh, but it's okay. It's a drizzle. <laughs> but oh, luckily so it, we oh, have. So it, oh, so it's like this texture. Yeah. Exactly. Just Sorry, enough. Little. I just mess up every dish. <laughs> just enough to make it drizzable. Okay. So now we're gonna make I'll our lunch wraps. Okay. And Great. These are so easy. And so much fun okay. actually so, for you kids. Come to in the middle. I'll go in Yeah. So layer. Start layering your chicken on top. Mm-hmm. And then some more fresh shallots. And what about cilantro? Yeah. Cilantro, love. Mm-hmm. And then. Yeah. You got some limes on the side. And then you just put this on some top. shallots. Oh, do you squeeze lime on it or not you really? Could, yeah, exactly. I like, I like lime. Um, and you use just like store-bought peanut butter, anything, this right? This is yeah. regular Skippy yeah. or creamy yeah, peanut butter. Drizzle the peanut sauce on top. And Wrap it up. There you mm. go. This is also, if you want to turn this into a more substantial dish, you could also have it on rice or... Mm. So good, right? So good. Mm. So much flavor. Oh, my God. Mm. Really good, thank you. It is so delicious. Thank you, Gina, for this My recipe. Pleasure. Mm. Head to today.com slash food and check out Gina's book. It's a good gift. Just head to today.com slash shop. <laughs>
Hey guys, today is National Picnic Day and things are about to get interesting. We are making two vibrant and flavorful sides and we're starting with a roasted sweet potato salad without a drop of mayo. Here, I'm combining three vegetables that go together perfectly. I got four sweet potatoes, one Vidalia onion, and six carrots. Everything is cut up into bite-sized pieces. And when you roast carrots in the oven, they caramelize and become so soft and they have a similar texture and taste to sweet potatoes. So when you're eating your potato salad, all you're gonna taste is creamy deliciousness. I'm tossing my veggies with a little extra virgin olive oil. Now I'm gonna season them up. So I'm adding in smoky paprika, some dried oregano, salt and pepper, and a little bit of cayenne to bump up the heat. Gonna lay them out on a baking sheet, give them a mist of oil spray, and I'm gonna pop them in the oven, set at 400 for about 30 minutes. So you can see that the veggies are perfectly for tender. I'm gonna transfer all of the yummy roasted vegetables into my bowl. Add your red wine vinegar and your extra virgin olive oil and gently stir it. Pop it in the fridge for at least an hour to chill and then it's ready to be packed up and taken to an awesome sunny picnic. And one more thing, I garnish it with some scallions for a pop of color and some granola for extra deliciousness. It's creamy, it's crunchy. This is most definitely feel good comfort food. Next up, an out of the box coleslaw made with mango and cashews. In a large mixing bowl, you're gonna combine a 14 to 16 ounce bag of pre-shredded coleslaw mix, some shredded purple cabbage, some thinly sliced red onion, and some shredded carrot. These are two peeled and julienned mangoes. You can also use frozen mango chunks. Just let them thaw and you can chop them up into small little cubes. We're gonna mix this all together and you can see how colorful and nutrient packed this is. And we are ready to dress it. First, I'm adding four tablespoons of lime juice, four tablespoons of low sodium soy sauce, into four tablespoons of rice wine vinegar. And I'm gonna mix it up and pour it right into the bowl. Go ahead and toss it. Right before you're ready to serve, you wanna sprinkle in roughly chopped toasted cashews. This really takes it to the next level. And there you have it, two yummy side dishes loaded with health perks and fit for a picnic. Mm. Now I want a picnic. I know. Can we hey, do boo -boo. this? I'll I do a like third enjoy, hour picnic. Enjoy compact the basket. At a That's picnic right. basket. <laughs> you can find these recipes at today.com slash food. The Today Show's newest fan. Order Al Roker. NBC's Morgan Radford is here with us. Good to have you live in 1A Morgan. Thank Good you. to see you. I'm so excited to be back and to see you all. So Juneteenth has always honored freedom, unity, and history. And part of that is celebrated through tradition, storytelling, and food. That's why one chef from Wisconsin decided that this Juneteenth, she was going to do something special and fulfill a promise made more than a century ago. <laughs> bye. 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 A big idea finally come to light. How does this feel? I mean, just a year ago, this was all just a dream. Yeah, it's very surreal that, you know, th this is mine. <laughs> you, <laughs> you know, like, I mean, this, this is, is your corn. Yeah. Here on 39 acres of land in St. Helena, South Carolina, Chef Adrian Lipscomb is creating a sanctuary for black farmers. The welcoming center. Yeah. It's over there. Right. Where they can grow okay. their own produce and learn about the history of an industry that currently is less than 2% black. 
We were cooking as slaves, as the cooks in these kitchens. We want to recreate those kitchens. We want to celebrate, but also explain to others and to the public. We want the community to come to this land. We want them to be able to come celebrate on this land. Opening up a new world of possibility that all started with a mystery check in the mail for $100. So you did not know personally no. the person who put this check in the mail to you? No, no. Didn't know this person. Her project is called 40 Acres and a Mule, a reference to the short-lived attempt at reparations that gave former slaves land after the Civil War, only to be rescinded after Lincoln's assassination. It started with the special field order number 15 by General Sherman to give 40 acres and a mule to the slaves that were released from the Civil War that were following him. And the question he asked is, what do you want? And one of them stood up and said, land. How does Juneteenth and the significance of Juneteenth for you connect to this project? Juneteenth has always been celebrated with me and my family. 1865 is just a, a significant year. You already have freed slaves in January of 1865, but you still don't have the free slaves of Texas, not until June 18th of 1865. By the next day, they're celebrating and they're saying, we are free, we can celebrate. And what is so interesting is that slaves weren't allowed to be in big groups. So a lot of those leaders came together and they bought land where they would go and celebrate Juneteenth. And food was a huge portion of this. The celebration um, of freedom. The celebration of freedom, you're right. Which is why Lipscomb, a mother of four who owns Uptown Cafe and Bakery in La Crosse, Wisconsin, decided to start her project here in South Carolina. A lot of history right there. A land. Uh, slaves were here. Slaves were here. With deep roots and African ancestry. Land is huge. Land brings identity, land brings community, land brings freedom. It allows us to navigate in this world, to create our history, to respect our history, but also bring forth our future. Lipscomb was able to raise more than $150,000 in less than a year through a GoFundMe page and with the support of celebrity chefs like Mashama Bailey and David Thomas. As an African-American chef, I am really interested in reclaiming the narrative where, where the food of this country started. Together, they're fixing up something special ahead of this Juneteenth, celebrating on their land in the best way they know how. Some of the best chefs in America yeah. are around this table. Helping one entrepreneur fulfill a promise from generations ago. Left the hands and made this food <laughs> for generations to come. Amen. And this is just the beginning. Adrian hopes that by next year, the land will actually host an archive of black farming traditions, three kitchens that represent the African ancestral contributions to cooking, and produce farms for black farmers. So her hope is really to create a safe space for them to grow, to cook, and sustain their own produce, while also learning about its history and where those food and food ways yeah. come from. The craft beer industry has exploded in recent years, becoming a nearly $30 billion industry. And now, emerging from the pandemic, many specialty breweries are flourishing, with black-owned establishments in particular gaining a lot of momentum. While they make up less than 1% of the more than 8,000 in the United States, more black brewers are now starting to open sites. In fact, I recently stopped by the only one here in New York that brews on-site for some beer and the side of... South Carolina home cooking and some conversation. If somebody's putting their true passion and their true love into it, that's a good beer. By that definition, Chris Gansey has been making good beer for a yes, decade. Gansey is the owner of Daleview Biscuits and Beer, the only black-owned brewery that brews on site in all of New York State. And that happens in these tanks below a kitchen that's very busy serving up biscuits and fried chicken by way of somewhere very special to both of us our mutual hometown of Columbia, South Carolina. Where'd you go to middle school? Um, Gibbs. Oh yeah, we used to play you guys in basketball. We used to beat Gibbs all the time. You sure about that? <laughs> <laughs> Gansey says he didn't even drink beer until his wife gave him a small home brewing kit 10 years ago for Father's Day. Being from Columbia, South Carolina as well, I know, especially in the summertime, cookouts are big. Yes. You mean to tell me back then you weren't like drinking tall boy beers? 
No. <laughs> I was not drinking beer at all. But three years ago, that hobby evolved into a business. How did you get from those home brewing kits to the owner of quite the establishment? People that believed in me. I had my wife and some close friends who believed in the, in the vision and kind of pushed me forward. It's like, you, you can do this. Why not spread the joy? Now he's turning out craft beer and Carolina biscuits in the heart of Lefferts Garden, Brooklyn. Intentionally choosing a historically black neighborhood to help integrate an industry with little diversity. I wanted a place where I could be part of the community and also do a place to educate people around craft beer. Like, I feel a cold beer is something that can bring people together. Out of the roughly 8,500 breweries in America, just about 60 are black owned. My hope is we can help change mindsets in the neighborhood because the neighborhood is changing and in creating and unity and, and um, equity. So that's my goal to help create equity in this community. Gansey is striving for more than exposure and equity, but for a few teaching moments as well. Dale View's beers are named after lesser known civil rights leaders like Jamaican activist Paul Bogle and freedom rider Diane Nash. These are the last three in existence. We sold out of the sold out of yes. Diane Nash. It's a beautiful label. And I love that on the back you actually explain for folks who might be unfamiliar. Even better than the label is what's inside them. I'm not used to learning and drinking at the same time. <laughs> this is a novel concept. Oh, it's not just beer? No, it's also biscuits. Wow. And let me tell you, a lot of folks won't recognize this, but that's pimento cheese. What, what you know about pimento cheese? That's, yeah, Columbia, South Carolina. I grew up. I had pimento cheese three times a day. My grandma would say, y'all put your foot in that. That is fantastic. Chicken thigh. Of course. Yeah. Now I said, oh boy. <laughs> Al oh, Roker's gonna love this. A taste of South Carolina, now educating Brooklyn beer drinkers, all thanks to a thoughtful present. Had your wife decided to give you a tie for Father's Day. I'd probably be a tie maker. <laughs> <laughs>you met a chef here in New York who's breaking barriers in the restaurant world. Yeah, his name's Charlie Mitchell. He became the first black chef in this city's history to earn a prestigious Michelin star. And he's only the second black chef nationwide to earn the accolade. I stopped by Clover Hill, his restaurant in Brooklyn, to talk about that achievement. And also, of course, to try some of that gourmet food that's made him a groundbreaker. The chef behind this popular Brooklyn restaurant is now being celebrated for more than fine dining. Charlie Mitchell is the first black chef in New York City to be awarded a Michelin star and just the second black executive chef in the country to achieve that honor. I wanted to always, you know, plant my feet here and be a serious New York City chef, so that was always a goal of mine. And look at you now. Yeah. <laughs> Dreams come true. Yeah. Mitchell was born and raised in Detroit and developed a passion for food and cooking from his grandmother. I think the thing that stuck with me the most is like she used to like this like whole fry fish, like whole fry bass all the time when I was younger. And I think that stood out the most. Head on? 
Always. Oh. <laughs> he attended culinary school for a few months, but preferred on-the-job training instead. I ended up like Googling restaurants in the metro area, got my first real job, and in that kitchen is where I was like, wow, like I love the way they work. I love how professional it is. Like I'm using ingredients I've never had, never learned about. Years of experience in world-class restaurants like 11 Madison Park eventually led him to this quiet street in Brooklyn Heights. When Clover Hill opened one year ago, he became its executive chef in charge of creating the menu. Mitchell's team pleats an eight-course tasting menu that regularly changes with the best seasonal foods available. I guess it's challenging, but we're always changing something or we're always trying to make the dish the best version of itself, right? So we may tweak it every day for two weeks straight if we have to, to get it to be like a perfect dish. That quest for perfection did not go unnoticed. When Michelin announced it starred restaurants in October, not only did Clover Hill earn a start, but Chef Mitchell picked up the award for best young chef. That was a complete surprise when they announced that, and I was just, Humble, you know. Were you aware at the time of the historic implications? I was not, not at the time. You always think so many people have come before you, you just assume that someone has already done this, you know? You just, this doesn't cross your mind that you may be the first or second to do really anything. Especially here in New York City. Why do you think that's the case? Why do you think there aren't more people who look like us as executive chefs in fine dining restaurants like this? You don't make a lot of money as a young cook, you know? So I think a lot of times we're like chasing a very different American dream than to kind of put up with these aggressive environments that are often led by people who don't look like us. I tasted some of the iconic dishes that earned this unique place in the food world. I'm gonna come around and try this here, although it's almost too pretty pretty to touch, <laughs> including a shark fin flounder and a spicy tapioca. But this is nice, and it's subtle. And a Japanese mackerel. We dry age it, we hang it a little bit, and then we finish it in a little bit of beeswax so that it retains moisture. When people leave your restaurant, what, what do you want them to, to take away? I want them to kind of be you know excited or inspired about food. You know, like that's something that is very important to us. Is Opal Lee. She is the grandmother of Juneteenth. Opal, she's an activist and community leader, and at 95 years old, it's proof it's never too late to create change. I refer to myself as a little lady in tennis shoes who gets in everybody else's business and has a damn good time doing it. That's Opal Lee, better known around Fort Worth, Texas, as Miss Opal. I'll see you. But around the nation, she's recognized as a Nobel Peace Prize nominated activist and leader. If you want something, you just have to go after it. Born in 1926 in Marshall, Texas, some of Ms. Opal's fondest early memories are celebrating Juneteenth, the emancipation of enslaved people in the United States. I had beautiful Juneteenth experiences when I was small. We'd go to the fairground and we'd have music and speeches and food and ball games and food and food and food. Juneteenth combines the words June and 19th and marks the anniversary of the 1865 date, the last of the enslaved received the word they were free. Freedom is for everybody. And we're not free until we are all free. At age 89, Ms. Opal took on freedom as her cause, fighting for Juneteenth to become a federal holiday. She began Opal's walk to DC, culminating in a 1,400 mile trek to the nation's capital. Do you know we took a million 500,000 signatures to Congress when we got the call to go to the White House? We could turn this country around. And on June 16th of 2021, Ms. Opal stood next to President Biden as he signed a bill establishing a federal holiday for Juneteenth. I still pinch myself. It was fabulous. I wanted to do a holy dance, but my kids say when I do that, I'm twerking. So. While that legislation is what Ms. Opal is most widely known for, 
She's been quietly creating change in Texas for years, starting with her time as a teacher. It was my responsibility to see that kids were in school. So if he needed some shoes, I bought shoes, or clothes, or food. And when I retired, that followed me. People still needed a place to live. They still needed food. And so I joined a, a food bank. What started in Ms. Opal's kitchen grew into a community food bank, which now resides in a 39,000 square foot warehouse. Each day, it provides 600 members of the community with access to fresh food, household products, and pet supplies. We get chicken, ground beef, a lot of fresh vegetables and fruits as much needed. This have impacted the community for many, many years, and without it, I just don't know what we would do. Ms. Opal's impact goes beyond the food bank. Opal's farm is a five-acre urban farm in Fort Worth, Texas. We expect to feed about 25,000 people this season. Ms. Opal's work on behalf of her community and her nation continues to inspire those around her, including her own family. Well, I'll put it to you this way. I am the granddaughter of the grandmother of Juneteenth. I would even venture to say that she's the grandmother to the nation. When you think about having lived 95 and seen the depression and seen um, the civil rights movement and, and then to, to see the Black Lives Matter movement now, to see the first African American president, when you've got that kind of span, you develop some perspective that's unique and I think that She's really good at expressing it. Creating a legacy of activism, tenacity, and the courage to fight for freedom. The fact that all these things I see need to be done, if they were done, I'd stop. But until then, I'm gonna keep on walking and keep on talking and hoping somebody will listen. Oh. We're listening and we are honored, honored to have Miss Opal Lee and her grandson.